Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurji and Alspensky, Maurice Nicole, Volume 5, Amwell 20.10.51, The Reception of New Ideas About Oneself and the World, Why Is It That People Find New Ideas So Difficult to Receive? The mind closes early on a few conventional ideas. The mind was once likened to a birdcage and ideas to birds. Some quite beautiful birds may come and go. If you value them they may stay. But if in a vision you were to see your own mind represented as a birdcage, what kind of birds would you perceive in it? A few parrots might be there and some decaying or dead birds. The bottom of a cage would be filthy. What does this filth represent psychologically? What is its psychological meaning? Wrong ideas, ideas that check the development of the mind, traditional ideas that have become lifeless, or conventional ideas obsequiously imitated are so much filth in the mind. In short, the obsequious mind stinks as much, as does the mind swarming with little nasty petty schemes, like mice. Now to receive new ideas and think from them begins to cleanse the mind and also the countenance. The work is packed with new and powerful ideas and if we can bestir and humiliate ourselves just enough to receive them and think from them, our minds will begin to smell less badly in the nostrils of heaven and our faces will become more distinct seeing that the mind and the face are connected. One would certainly expect the face to alter after a time as an outward sign of an alteration in the mind, but if it does not, one knows that the new and powerful ideas have not been received. Now to receive, the mind must be like a bowl or cup. I mean simply that a bowl or cup could represent the receptive mind. Something can be poured in and retained. The bowl or cup upside down that is, pointing downwards, would then represent the non-receptive mind. Again, the bowl or cup might be filled with dirt, so that, until it was cleaned out, nothing could be put in, or put in without contamination. The new and powerful ideas of the work, therefore, could not be received if the bowl or cup were upside down or filled with filth, and we have already seen what filth can represent psychologically. These matters can only be represented by ordinary visual images because no one can draw a mind or a wrong idea. But using the seen objects of the senses as representing things not seen, it is possible to express the invisible in terms of the visible. This is possible provided it is realized that the visible things made use of represent invisible things and so are not to be taken literally but psychologically. So a bowl can mean the mind. Empty and turned up it can mean the mind receptive to ideas full of filth it can represent the mind as full of false and wrong or dead ideas and full of clean water, full of true and living ideas. It is, however, Quite true to say that this transforming of the literal sense into the psychological sense is repugnant to many and strongly resented by them to their very great loss. A bowl is a bowl, sir, and can only mean a bowl. A man should say what he means, sir. How in heaven's name can a bowl mean the mind? Well, that is exactly its meaning in heaven. And if you say that it only represents the mind the retort will no doubt be then why the devil don't they say, mind? straight out instead of messing with bulls and filth and bird cages and parrots. Or you may encounter the polite and slightly amused person who murmurs that it is interesting but rather far-fetched and so on. So let me hasten on to something else and avoid this valuable but despised little crossing bridge that leads to that level called psychological thinking and introduces us to a new world of meaning. Let us keep to what is sensible and logical and stand with our feet firmly planted on the solid earth of sensory facts. Unfortunately, if we only do this we may well remain at too low a level of understanding for the work. We will, indeed, remain mechanical or natural, and have nothing of the conscious or spiritual. Also, the bowl will be upside down. If we cannot transform the literal into the psychological, if we cannot transform the sense of the letter into the sense of the spirit, and we are told somewhere that the letter killeth, then we cannot give ourselves the first conscious shock. And unless the first conscious shock is given a man remains a natural or mechanical man, to whom the world is, as it appears. Everything is what it seems to him. Such a matter of fact man crystallizes out early. His world soon fixes him. He cannot develop. Yes, he soon becomes a fixture in that because he takes the world like that has fixed facts. Do you understand? Can you see that what you are depends on what the world is for you? Now, if you have always had a certain feeling of unreality about the world, or if you have felt it, 
as a mystery, or yourself, as a mystery. You will not crystallize out like the matter-of-fact people, who seem to get on better than you and have no difficulties. However, I would far rather be you, for probably you will be able to receive ideas of a certain quality, that the matter-of-fact folk take as nonsense. But certain ideas may be nonsense in one mind, and not nonsense in another's mind. To change the metaphor you may have a landing ground for certain ideas which can only crash in others. Now the reception of new ideas is necessary for change of being. I can only think in a new way by means of new ideas, and I must really think for myself from these ideas to change my mind. You cannot in the work leave your thinking to others, you must crave for new ideas which transmit new truth, as for water in the desert. No one is going to help you if you do nothing yourself. This seems to surprise some, and offend others. I can never understand why. Now if I think in a new way I can see things in a new way. If I change, my view of the world will change. If my view of the world changes, I will change. That is why the work has two sides to its teaching, one psychological, and one cosmological. Unless I change, my world will not change. I cannot undergo change in myself, and remain in the same world. If I begin to have a new feeling of myself I will also begin to have a new feeling of the world, and I and the world will change together. A new feeling of the world will give again a new feeling of myself. The two feelings will help each other to grow, for the world is my feeling of it and my feeling of the world is me. If I feel there is something higher than myself and myself, I will feel there is something higher than the world behind it. But all this and many other things beyond expression, can only begin with the reception of new ideas, and thinking from them for yourself. Amwell, 27.10.51 Brief Note on Work, on oneself there are three lines of work. The first line is work on oneself. Although one may have heard this many times, and, although it may be firmly rooted in the memory, it will not be of any use, unless it is done. As you know, the work must not be only in the memory, but in the life. A few lines along which everyone must observe himself to begin with are laid down. Later on you must observe what particular hindrance prevents you from getting on. Now in answer to the question, in what way are you working on yourself now? What can you reply? It can happen sometimes that people have no idea what they are working on, nor indeed what work on oneself can possibly mean. This is a grave handicap. They may help others in a hearty way, conceiving this to be the second line of work, and do their best to speak enthusiastically to strangers of the system so, as to help it along, conceiving this to be the third line, but the difficulty will remain that they do not understand the work at all, owing to this initial handicap. However, you may tell me that if a person does the second and third lines of the work in a sincere way, he or she may be useful to it, and I will not disagree. But if by any chance you instance the opposite, namely, a person who only attempts the first line, and says the other two lines are not necessary, and do not concern him, and if you add that he may all the same be useful I will not agree with you at all. Such a man serves his own interests only, and so can never get beyond himself. He is a will worshipper, a worshipper of his own will, a worshipper of self, as Paul said of such people which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship, and humility, and severity to the body. Kali.23 The more he works, the more will he inevitably imprison himself in himself that is, in his self-love, and his self-worship. Now, to return, let us suppose, that you have reached that stage of work in which you can clearly observe that you are negative. This is just where you can work on yourself. By doing so you may also, without knowing it, work on the second line. The point is that you are now observing a definite thing. You have, so to speak, caught it in the very act, and this is due to your discipline and self-observation, without which work on oneself is impossible. For if you do not observe what is going on in you, if you do not let a ray of light into your inner darkness by the practice of self-observing, you will never have anything real on which to work. Only through the discipline of uncritical self-observation will you catch sight of something definite to work upon. Everything else will be so much pseudo-work, invented work, imaginary work. But this question of uncritical self-observation requires long self-observation. Only gradually will you notice how instantaneously the demon of self-justifying does everything in its power to prevent it. In this case it will do all it can to protect not you, but the definite negative emotion that you have caught sight of. 
but this will be no longer good enough for you that is, if your desire to work on yourself has at last become a felt aim. In all three lines of work, each has an aim which eventually can be felt in the emotional center since they correspond with its right development, and greatly assist one in the battles that have to take place in it at intervals over the years. What, then, are you going to do next with this definite clearly observed negative emotion if you are no longer eager to fly into self-justifying, such as, of course, I'm not to blame. It's always been like this. I don't deserve to be treated in that way. Am I nothing? Don't I count? Wouldn't you under the circumstances feel just as I do? You don't understand all I've had to put up with. Of course, you have everything you want. You wouldn't understand. No one ever does and so on. What, I say, are you going to do if you refuse these aids of self-justifying? If you do nothing, the negative emotion will call to itself other negative emotions. The energies they steal will then begin to regress and to form symptoms. That is, they will go backwards in you, and, because you cannot unmask their lying eyes for all negative emotions lead the energies they have felched from you will not be available for ordinary life. They will animate a new sickness or reanimate old typical illnesses just as a river when obstructed will not only flood back waters behind it but will stop the water wheels from working in front of it. If you understand me, this represents very well the wrong distribution of energy that takes place in a person who is negative. Psychic energy in the wrong place acts as a poison. When we are negative we poison ourselves and we poison our bodies and indeed we poison other people. But of course through self-justifying we cannot see that this is so nothing is ever one's own fault. To return, what can be done when we clearly see a negative emotion and will not yield weakly to self-justification? I will mention only one thing, among many others, that can be done. Realizing that to permit a negative state to exist unchecked and unarrested is to give it tacit permission to do its worst and realizing also as one Eastern system says, that negative emotion, identified with, is similar to a wound in the body, and as serious, one can resolve to hold a court, and find out what it is all about. I advise you to hold this court in your mind not in public. Let the various sides of you take part. Let the work, as deputies to heard, listen to each speaker. Let each speaker speak clearly. All this requires an atmosphere of inner attention. You will find that indignant, Furious, bitter, or blaming eyes begin to leave the courtroom one by one, like the accusers of the woman taken in adultery, beginning with the oldest. But there is one important point. In this court there is no judge. In the temple scene there was no judge. The figure who was expected to judge did not. He merely said, Neither do I judge thee. After a time you will notice that the whole affair has cleared up and vanished. Then it may happen that the other person connected with your negative state sends you a message, or seems released. I mentioned earlier that if you really do the first line of work, you also do something of the second. Why is the other person released? Because you in your negative state bound that person in prison then, later, you released the person by your change of state. I will add one more significant thing. This court held in the mind with its various speakers is to be conducted with a certain grace and seasoned with a little salt. If undertaken heavily, gloomily, and literally, it will probably make you more negative. If so, all I can say is that I am glad to hear it and that it serves you right. For nothing useful in this work can be done without grace and a daily seasoning of salt. Amwell 3.11.51 Outer and Inner Stop in the exercises connected with the work is one called the stop exercise. At the moment that the command stop is shouted one has to remain motionless in the position one is in not only must the body and the limbs become as it were frozen but the expression of the face and the direction of the eyes must not change. The whole attention must center on maintaining the same motionless position until a second command releases you. It was said to us that in some eastern schools if you were stopped Say, in a stream rapidly rising in flood, the position had to be kept even when the waters threatened to submerge you. Not until the order to release was given were you allowed to move. This indicated that the body had to be under full control and the teacher fully to be trusted. For some reason this story has become connected with two others in my mind. One is the story of the teacher who plunged the head of a newcomer seeking instruction into a bucket of water. When the astonished man 
almost suffocated, was released, he was asked what he had wanted most. He replied that he had wanted above all things to breathe. He was told that when he wanted the teacher's instruction as much as he had wanted air, he would be given it. I imagine he was offended and took himself off. The other story is of a political prisoner who was exercised daily by marching round a courtyard. The barred windows of a room high up opened on this courtyard, and the prisoner knew that another prisoner, to whom he urgently desired to send a message, lived in it. He wrapped the message round a stone, and every day, while exercising, visualized the movement necessary to throw it up right, just as a cat does before leaping up a high wall. He also had concealed about him a razor blade for he determined increasingly to cut his throat if he failed. When the opportunity came the stone went straight through the window. These stories seem to me to be connected because they come into my mind together, but I do not quite see the reason. Perhaps you may see. Now, apart from the exercise, where the body is made motionless, which can be called out or stop, there is another exercise similar but different, where the mind is made motionless. This is called inner stop. Both have to do with bringing about a state of motionlessness. But the two exercises are not performed in the same sphere. In the case of the first, the body in space is stopped. People may pass you, speak to you, tell you how silly you look, and so on. But your body and your eyes remain motionless in space. In the case of the second, the practice of inner stop, you stand motionless in your mind. Thoughts pass you, speak to you, ask you what you are up to and so on, but you pay no attention to them. You will see at once that inner stop is connected with the form of self-remembering. Now you must note that the inner stop exercise is not the same as trying to stop your thoughts. Try to stop your thoughts, and if you are sincere about your experiences of yourself and you cannot work unless you are you will admit it cannot be done. But to stand motionless in your mind is another matter. You can stand internally motionless in the mind, just as your body can externally stand motionless in the world. Now what does motionlessness do? What virtue does it possess? In nature motionlessness is widely made use of for a definite purpose. Movement is the first thing noticed. The eye perceives movement before it sees color or shape. The stopping of all movement is a common device in the animal world to escape notice. The object is not to feign death, but to become invisible. Slowing down of movement also makes detection more difficult, as when a cat is stalking a bird. To practice inner stop in the mind is like making oneself motionless in space. You are not noticed. Yes, but not noticed by whom? In your mind you are surrounded by different ties. Each wants you to believe that you are eight. Each wants to speak in your name. Suddenly they cannot find where you are. They look everywhere for you. I assure you that you can experience their searching for you and not finding you. Then you remember that you have not rung up the doctor. The effect is similar to a sudden movement in the jungle. All the animals and birds and reptiles instantly see where you are. The customary worries, irritations, unpleasant thoughts, conceits, and anxieties seize upon you once more. The animals and birds roar and scream, and the eyes shout, We've got him. And that is the end of what is really you for the time being. You are dismembered again. Another person watching you from outside will be aware of a sudden look of anxiety, a quick movement, hurried steps, and an urgent voice at the telephone. He may perhaps guess that you will be out for the rest of the day. You will be out of yourself. I am not exaggerating when I say that it is like throwing oneself to the lions, or casting oneself under the juggernaut, or drowning in the sea. I mean that it is suicide, and that we all commit suicide over and over again and no one in the life of the world points this out. Only the work which comes from sources outside the life of the world points this out. It not only points out that we are daily and continually committing suicide, but it shows us with great patience how not to. Does it not sound strange when put in that way? The trouble is that we prefer to commit spiritual suicide at every moment rather than give ourselves the first conscious shock. We find it easier than to remember ourselves. And in connection with this we are told that we are like people who prefer to live in the basements of their houses, although all the rooms belong to them, and they can live on what floor they like. Can you conceive anything more weird than a city of fine houses whose inhabitants insist on living only in their basements? 
the psychological interpretation of basement is the lowest parts of centers where the most mechanical eyes live. No man can remember himself at that level. To remember himself he must distinguish himself from the inhabitants of the basement in him. To do so he must feel concerning these inhabitants that they are not him. He must say with a conviction that grows over the years, this is not I to these inhabitants one by one, especially to some. N. I. approaches you by means of thoughts. You can practice inner stop towards those thoughts, once you have observed them enough to know for certain that they herald the approach of an evil. I. This is practicing inner stop specifically towards one thing. But inner stop in its full sense is to make yourself motionless in your mind so that you take no notice of any thoughts, and thereby become unnoticed. You are then remembering yourself. Amwell, 10.11.51 Increasing Consciousness of Oneself The work teaches us that we are not properly conscious and that our general aim is to increase consciousness. With regard to the side of increasing consciousness, that belongs to increase of consciousness of oneself, when you go back in your mind into your past, do not try to see others in your life, but yourself. Try to see what kind of a person you were at different stages. It is easier to see other people in our memories, because our senses record them. Our senses do not record ourselves, save perhaps that we had a velvet suit in childhood, and a woolly lamb and hated clean stockings which scratched so all that is sensational, and is stored in the sensory memory. But it does not show you that you are a very bad-tempered little child, who used to lay on the floor, and scream if you could not have your own way. You may remember screaming, and lying on the floor, for these are sensations, but you will not remember that you were bad-tempered, because that is not a matter of the senses, but of self-observation. And if you have never observed yourself, you are possibly still bad-tempered, and have not realized it. And similarly if you were once smacked for putting out your tongue at your elders, you may not notice you still do so mentally. So these naughty children continue to live in us, and we are not aware of it. Now you will say, how can we see what we were like in the past, if we never observed it? How can we remember what is not in the memory? It comes about in the following way. If I observe something in myself now, and remember what I observe, I will become slowly aware of its having existed, before I observed it. The observation begins as a travel backwards in time, usually very gradually. But it may happen that one experiences a flash of consciousness extending far back into the past of what one has just begun to be conscious of now in the present. One sees one has always been like that. I do not think that a sudden revelation of this kind will ever come without considerable preparation. It is prevented from coming unless one is able to accept it without justifying or criticizing or being negative. It is not pleasant, but how can anybody expect to gain an increase of consciousness without being prepared to stand it? We resent every sort of reproof. We are so easily hurt that we are offended at the least thing that touches our self-love. Of course, we do not see all this we imagine quite otherwise. But can you not see that this is the crux of the whole business of change of being? As we cannot bear being told anything adverse to our imagination of ourselves, we are called upon to observe ourselves uncritically and sincerely and, leaving aside imagination, to begin to assimilate what we notice about ourselves. This is indeed to begin to work on oneself. But please notice that I said assimilate we must assimilate what we observe about ourselves to ourselves. Let us take the question of an increase of consciousness of oneself from another angle. We have spoken before of what was called the intractable thing in ourselves. However we try to define it, it is due to a limited consciousness. This intractable thing blocks the fuller and deeper entry of the work. It admits it only up to a point, but enough to start on. Something will not give way further. Something will not do what is required, something will not look where it should look. Something sulks, or something smiles coldly, and says nothing. Or something shouts, I won't, I won't. What can modify this intractable thing, that blocks the entry of the work? Now the more a man works with what he has of the work, and becomes more conscious of what he is and what he has been like, the more can the work enter him. But if one is beginning to become more conscious of what one is and has been like, something must be beginning to give way to permit it. I ask you all, if you have followed me up to now, to tell me what is beginning to give way. Is it pride and its resulting hardness of heart? 
or love of power that will not yield? Or is it obstinacy? Is it contrariness? Is it pigheadedness, or sulkiness, or downright naughtiness, or mere stupidity, or ignorance, or what? Since increasing knowledge of oneself modifies it, its existence must be connected with ignorance, that is, with lack of consciousness, and therefore with lack of knowledge of the nature of oneself. It must, in short, belong to an unredeemed psychology, that is, to a man asleep to himself, and the meaning of life, a man, who simply takes himself for granted, a mechanical man, who imagines that he is fully conscious, and possesses a real unchanging eye, and has all the rest of the illusions that prevent him from seeing his danger, and struggling to wake up. But to look at the question from another angle, as I mentioned, there is another way, of increasing consciousness of oneself, that seems especially to weaken the intractable thing in ourselves that we so grandly call strong will, individuality, determination, the power of knowing our own mind, and so on. To begin this way, try sometimes to see the opposite point of view to that which you hold. I do not mean that you are to discard your point of view, but to include the opposite as well. This exercise demands first that you can clearly observe your own point of view, and second, that you quite sincerely build up its opposite. Energy blocked up by the one-sidedness of our habitual consciousness is not allowed to flow into the opposite which is kept out of consciousness. The sphere of our usual consciousness is thereby limited. It is narrowed, often ridiculously, and with this narrowness of consciousness I would specially connect the intractable thing in ourselves. If the opposite is genuinely and with effort included in consciousness the sphere of consciousness is greatly increased and a number of unpleasant features in us disappear. Our one-sidedness, which causes our oversensitive reactions and also our totally wrong ways of self-valuation, is replaced by a broader, fuller consciousness. We can no longer insist we are right nor be cast down when proved to be wrong. We find it more difficult to be petty. In fact, we begin to escape from the prison of ourselves, whose bars and gates result from our one-sidedness. Amwell, 17.11.51 Further note, on increasing consciousness of oneself, we have in recent papers made some commentaries on the fundamental teaching of this work that it is necessary to increase consciousness. We are not yet properly conscious. We talk, and behave, think, feel, and judge on the assumption that not only we but others are fully conscious beings. In assembling the different parts of the work to form an instrument in the mind for the reception of the finer vibrations continually coming from the two higher centers that are present in man, the idea that we are not properly conscious is one of the main supporting parts of the framework of this instrument. In other words, it has to be more and more realized by experience that one is not by any means properly conscious and that other people are not. This changes one considerably. But unless it becomes a truth of experience it cannot take its necessary place in the instrument. It will merely be unused in the memory. The truth of every part of the teaching must be experienced before it can take its place in the construction of this instrument, in the inner world of oneself. Fortunately for us, the ideas of this teaching have an affinity for one another, and once the preliminary underlying barriers of the Nile give way and reform at a deeper level, they tend to begin to fit themselves where they belong as best they can in the small space thus made vacant. This seems a long process according to a slow standard of time in which a day can seem a lifetime, and a short one according to another standard of time that sees one's lifetime as a day. Now there are three directions in which an increase of consciousness can be made by means of untensed, unhurried efforts. The first leads to an increase of consciousness of oneself, the second leads to an increase of consciousness of others, the third leads to an increase of consciousness of life. In the recent commentaries we have spoken chiefly about an increase of consciousness of oneself, through which another sense of oneself is imperceptibly brought about, with great relief, for no one can gain any in her peace and escape from incessant nervous agitations as long as his feeling of himself, or her feeling of herself, remains what it is. Now an increase of consciousness of oneself means more room in the inner world of oneself. But this broadening, this expansion of consciousness, can take place only at the expense of the usual feeling of oneself, which is connected with personality, and this usual feeling of oneself will fight to retain its power, just as any tyrant fights to retain his power. The trouble is that one does not see it in this way. 
we think that myself is I and even say I myself so we cling to the source of our discomforts and distress and resent being separated from it. Yes, we even cling to all the bitterness, anger and hate in ourselves, never becoming conscious enough to see that we must work on ourselves while we are in the way or else, whether in recurrence or whatever other afterlife one comes into, things will become worse. Now, increasing the consciousness of oneself is, I believe, the only form of work on oneself that can eventually take away this bitterness, anger or hate, and many other things. Why? Because it will change the feeling of oneself. But why should that take away bitterness, anger or hate? Because they are caused and kept alive exactly by your present feeling of yourself. In the last paper we touched on one method of increasing consciousness of oneself by trying to see the kind of person one was at different periods of the past and so all through one's life instead of merely trying to remember distant scenes or people. We spoke of using a present observation of oneself as a peephole into the past which sometimes leads to seeing how one has always been like what one has just observed now. This gives great depth to self-observation. It need not be depressing as some seem to think. I would rather say it is liberating. Everything that one makes conscious results in a sense of freedom. It is actually freeing one in part from the tyranny of oneself. It seems a paradox to say that to become conscious of an unattractive feature operating all through one's life of which one was formerly ignorant gives a sense of liberation, but you can find the reason for yourself. And, of course, we come up here against those tedious self-hypnotists and fatheads who say that they know themselves inside out. Let us leave them to their fond illusions and the heavy odors of their airless minds. Now the other method that was mentioned was becoming conscious in the opposite. We are one-sided. We admit into consciousness one side of things and not the opposite. One-sidedness can make us, for example, hypersensitive, easily upset, overreactive, and so on, or it makes us the reverse too insensitive, too complacent, too thick-skinned, and so on. Our opinions and ingrained habits of mind and feeling are one-sided. As was said, to see the opposite side genuinely demands and constitutes an expansion of consciousness. But such an expansion causes amazement or horror to the fixed mind. Do you not see it would mean losing the customary feeling of oneself? Why, one would feel the ground was being knocked away from under one's feet, wouldn't one? Yes, sir, one would, and that would be a jolly good thing. You would not get in such rages, or be so bigoted and humorless, or repeat the same things every day, and you, madam, would also benefit greatly. A widening of consciousness would be a blessing to us all. It can be obtained provided one sees intelligently what prevents it. Now what do we do with the other sides the opposite sides that our consciousness does not embrace? We see them in other people. We do not see them in ourselves, but project them onto others. Other people are at fault, other people are mean, other people are intolerable, other people are unjust, other people have unpleasant minds, other people are bad-tempered, but not as the result of this non-acceptance causes a most extraordinary world. Only by living in it can you believe how extraordinary. But we prefer to live in imagination, and the various hells it creates. Now where you are very identified, there projection is at work, and where projection is at work, there is a one-sided consciousness at work, and no one can become balanced man, if he remains one-sided. The table of the seven degrees of man shows clearly that in the movement towards consciousness one must gain the state of balanced man, that is, number four man. We can now see that this necessitates for one thing a greatly increased consciousness of oneself. One way. And the most important way to this is being more and more conscious of and than in the opposites in oneself, so that eventually one projects nothing onto others. Thus one liberates oneself from bitterness, anger, suspicion, hate, and much else characteristic of the customary feeling of oneself which is derived from one-sidedness, and is destroyed by two-sidedness. In short, number four man or balanced man, cannot be one-sided. He must be conscious of everything in himself, and so will project nothing. If he projects nothing onto others, he will not become identified with others. He will thus attain a great freedom. He will be on the way to number five, six, and seven man, that is, he will be on the way to fully conscious man.
reflect, then, all of you, on the fact that conscious man is built on balanced man not on mechanical man, and on the necessity of becoming conscious in the opposites, before one can reach the state of balanced man. Amwell 24.11.51 What is consciousness? In this paper let us consider what consciousness is. We are studying increase of consciousness upon which the work lays such great stress, and in which some cannot see any meaning. Let us first remind ourselves that nothing is learned to write without affection. One manifestation of affection is interest. Anyone can see that no one will learn anything of a subject unless he is interested in it. We cannot therefore expect to see any meaning in all that is taught about increase of consciousness in the work if we are not interested in the subject. In this case we probably believe in secret that we are fully conscious already. If so, I can only say it constitutes an admirable example of the adoration of oneself and demands a private chapel and an altar with a large colored photograph of oneself on it. However, the trouble may not lie in self-adoration. It may be that a person simply does not understand what an increase of consciousness can possibly be like. I mean, that a person may not smugly or blindly assume he is fully conscious, and may be willing to admit that he is not, but cannot see what it means to increase his consciousness, and feels quite helpless through sheer ignorance. We all know this state. Now to get out of this state we must fall back on valuation of the work, and the reasons why we are seeking the work. I will say merely that unless we do this we will stick. All efforts will cease, so it is necessary to return inwardly to valuation, and revalue the work. This releases energy. In terms of the work octave we have to return to the note do, and sound it more strongly. Many eyes attack this note and seek to drain its energy of vibration mocking eyes, clownish eyes, ugly eyes, cruel eyes, hard eyes, arguing eyes, denying eyes, mob eyes. All unpleasant things in you seek to attack this opening note of the work. They do so, because they know, although you do not, that their power over you is eventually threatened by the work which brings strange and new values. For valuation of the work, which is due, is a valuing of new values, and a constant renewal of them by revaluing as needed, and not a constant revaluing of old values. The inward man must be renewed day by day, as Street Paul says. You will be startled to find how faint, how weak, this dew can become. This is because you do not renew it day by day, and have let the uproar of life drown it. Circumstances can make a life do easy, a work do is not easy it is against life. Along with making the note do sound more strongly in one's being, one has to reflect deeply that is, in the inner man upon why one is seeking the work for the two go together, or should do. If you have neither valuation nor aim, how can the strength of the work ever be received? There is nothing to receive it with. If there is nothing in you to receive the work, it cannot help you. If it does not begin to influence the way you think, or feel, or act, it is a sign that you have neither valuation nor aim. Now, as I said, it may be that a person simply cannot understand what it means to increase his consciousness, and feels helpless. This will be the case when he has never thought about consciousness. He has no doubt taken it for granted, and so has never thought about what it is. The teaching that he is not properly conscious therefore puzzles him. He will agree that if a man is knocked out he loses consciousness, and that after a time he regains consciousness. From this he might agree that consciousness is something that a man can either have or not have and yet remain alive. Consciousness, then, is not identical with life. The energy of consciousness is different from the energy of life, and in regard to this the work says that no amount of life energy will produce consciousness just as no amount of physical energy such as heat will produce life. The diagram used in this connection is as follows, greater mind energy of consciousness psychic energy life energy mechanical energy. No amount of one will produce the other. This means they do not merge into one another, but are on different levels, in different degrees. For example, a baby has vital energy, before it has a psychic life, and it has a psychic life, before it has consciousness, but they are on different planes. They are as different, as is the sight of the eyes from the sight of the mind. No amount of the one will produce the other. This diagram assists one to reflect upon the energy of consciousness, and its high place in the scale of energies. 
it helps to make one realize that it is something distinct and definite, and that, like other energies, it presumably can be decreased or increased. The next thing we have to grasp is that consciousness is not memory, nor is it thought, nor is it feeling, nor is it sensation, or movement. It is not a psychic process. Very complex psychic processes can take place without consciousness. The mind of the moving center, for instance, makes very complex estimations, in skating or piano playing, etc., without consciousness, or practically so all sorts of intelligent transformations and adjustments in the body continually take place without consciousness. Now it is especially important not to say that memory is consciousness. Memory and consciousness are not the same. This requires to be thought about. They are as different as the beam from your electric torches from the path that illuminates. You do not think them the same. Similarly, consciousness is not the same as your thought, feeling, or sensation. Through consciousness you become aware of them as contents, but it is not one and the same thing. In fact, consciousness can exist without any content. The next point is that consciousness cannot be increased mechanically. No mechanical process will lead to an increase of consciousness. Since the object of the work is to increase consciousness, it is as well to remember that nothing mechanical will bring this increase about. Something interesting lies here which you must find out for yourselves, so it is no use asking what it is. But one thing clearly follows namely, that consciousness can only be increased by the use of consciousness. We are given, naturally, a little consciousness to start with. This can be increased, but only by conscious efforts. The mechanical efforts which belong to the routine of the day's work will not increase it. But going against mechanicalness consciously will increase it. Consciousness, then, is a very strange thing. It seems to be, like yeast, which under right conditions can multiply itself indefinitely. But this comparison does not give us a right idea of what consciousness is. Consciousness is not like yeast, nor is it something that gradually evolves from vital or from psychic energy. It is something unique. It is something we come in contact with. It is a group of vibrations of high frequency and like light it exists apart from our contact with it. Like physical light it is still and always there though we shut our eyes or though we are blind. Of this light of consciousness we receive a very little. We are nearly blind. Now it is not the light that is to be increased but our contact with it. The receptive point of consciousness has to be changed. Then more consciousness is received. We have to begin work with the small consciousness we have. We seek not to squander it in identifying. But people throw away even the small consciousness they have. To awaken is to become more and more conscious by letting in consciousness into dark places. So it is said that self-observation lets light into the darkness within us and also it is said in John that the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not. So it is with every one who is given the work, which is esoteric Christianity, that is, its inner meaning, and does not open the door to it. He does not let it in he sees the light, but, not turning it innards upon his own darkness, remains without comprehending it. Amwell 1.12.51 The idea of balance man part I. The ideas of the work penetrate us slowly. By now we may have realized that the way to conscious man lies through balanced man. Now, reflecting on the diagram of the seven categories of man, we can see, if we want to, that number four man, or balanced man actually is the bridge between mechanical mankind and conscious mankind, and is therefore of the greatest importance. Formerly we may have chiefly regarded the diagram as referring to conscious and mechanical man, and ignored the significance of balanced man. Now, however, we should find it necessary to concentrate often on the meaning of this link that connects the lower and upper parts of the diagram and is significant to each of us. We can say at the outset that all the teaching of the work converges onto this figure. The balanced man sums up the teaching and explains its existence and, standing above the mechanical living of this life, is open to respond to another life, the living of which is our right or right neither inborn nor acquired but pre-existent in the essence by creation. For we were created to become conscious, and to attain to a degree of consciousness sufficient to reach even the farthest outskirts of the conscious circle of humanity is something incommensurable with anything that life offers. It makes indeed all the affairs and situations of life seem as nothing, or near to it. 
and if we could remember ourselves, and did remember ourselves, and did touch the third state of consciousness we would know this quite well already, and, knowing it, also know that our life lay above us and not behind us or ahead of us knowledge, that shifts the usual feeling of oneself which is horizontal and not vertical. By horizontal I mean what is based, as on a horizontal line of past, present and future, and so on our idea of time, and by vertical I mean based on scale, and on above and below, on higher levels and lower levels, and so on values which are not connected with time, but with states. Of this latter we have little or no coherent sense. We think of yesterday and the day, before in terms of time, not in terms of our inner states on those days. We do not think that the day before yesterday we were in a state of abysmal sleep, but that yesterday we had a small moment of awakening. Because we think in terms of time, we have so little memory of states. We seem to worship time. We say time is money and talk of never wasting time. We value it highly, but we do not seem to value states. Everything valuable gets swept away by time. Yet that small amount of awakening you had yesterday should have been put into the room of your inner memory which is outside time, and is in shelves, arranged vertically in scale of value. Such moments eventually begin to lift us they enable us to remember ourselves out of time, and its cares. Whether I make myself clear, or not, let us consider what kind of consciousness the balanced man has. We understand his consciousness cannot be one-sided. We can therefore think of him as two-sided or other-sided as regards consciousness. He must have undergone, by work on himself, an increase of consciousness. His self-consciousness, his awareness of himself, must have widened. Or shall we rather say altered, changed? That would mean that a usual feeling of oneself in his case would have shifted its central position, and a new feeling of himself would have taken its place, and this because he had increased his awareness of himself. He has become more conscious of what is in him, of what he had not quite admitted, or perhaps had even denied hotly. When you deny hotly you should take an observation, and if you notice you often do it, take it time exposure. Now the phrases used in describing the third state of consciousness are self-awareness, self-consciousness and self-remembering. We can see that balanced man must become far more conscious of himself to balance his one-sided consciousness of himself that is, his self-awareness must increase, and with it his self-consciousness. When the shift in the usual feeling of oneself in his case has taken place, and one-sidedness has been replaced by two-sidedness, or other-sidedness, then he will have reached a balance. Such a balance must certainly characterize number four man. He will no longer remember the feelings connected with his former one-sided or unbalanced state. By an extension of consciousness he will no longer derive his feelings of himself from what is false or imaginary, in himself that is, from false personality or imaginary, I, and by seeing in himself many of the faults he imputes to others, as well, as some peculiarities of his own, his feelings towards others will completely change. While all this is taking place gradually, he may feel at times that he is losing something valuable. Life will not have the same taste. But if a man or woman changes, life cannot possibly have the same taste. If it does, then the man or woman has not changed. That is quite certain. Change of being means change in everything. You cannot change and remain the same. A man reaching the level of balanced man cannot remain what he was. As regards his being, he cannot be what he has been. To regret what one has been, in view of this work, may only feed the self-pity. I believe that all regret about the past which is just regret is regressive, or becomes so very easily. When in change in your tastes change, you will discover new tastes, finer and subtler. Identifying becomes less and less. That means a purification of the emotional center, and so quite different feelings. Thus the balanced man will not be tormented by the same feelings and emotions that infest the life of number one, two, and three men. Through self-observation, through increasing self-awareness, through increasing the consciousness of himself, through attributing to himself in place of mechanically imputing to others, he becomes a different kind of man designated in the system number four man. Now if we concentrate on these thoughts, giving our interest to them, we shall be able to reflect on the nature of balanced man and on our own situation in comparison to him. By this comparison we may perceive more clearly what it is necessary to ask for, and estimate where to work on ourselves. 
for if we ask for nothing we get nothing. This is in the nature of the universe, which can be thought of as response to request. Amwell, 8.12.51 the idea of balanced man partite the feeling of oneself. We have seen how, in order to attain to number four or balanced man, consciousness of oneself must be increased as well, as a development of centers. We have seen how with an increasing consciousness of oneself the feeling of oneself is bound to alter. It is the usual feeling of oneself that contributes to our unbalance. These are very important points. With the feeling of oneself that one has now there can be no transformation of oneself, because, as I said, it is the feeling of oneself that keeps one just where one is, psychologically speaking. It is difficult to realize that this is so one is not quite aware of the existence of this feeling of oneself and how one is limited by it. Now a balanced man cannot possibly have the same feeling of himself as he had formerly because consciousness of himself has widened. He will have lost his soul at one level, and found it at another level of his being. However, we cling to our feeling of ourselves and indeed are blind to it. I advise you to try to notice it as often, as you can. It helps one to connect so much of the work together. Let us take an example, step by step. Someone speaks, and behaves in a way I resent violently. I make bitter retorts. I open a number of store cupboards filled with carefully preserved bitter memories. I go oh, and on blaming the person, I cannot sleep, and so on. This is the life way. The work way is different. First step, I observe I am violent and bitter. This is quite different from just being violent and bitter. It lets a ray of light in that is, whereas I was unconscious, being identified with my state, I now am slightly conscious of it. I also notice and remember a little what I am saying and usually say. Second step, I recall that no matter who is to blame I am to blame for being negative. If I value the work this helps me to turn around and look for the cause in myself and not in the person. Third step, I must ask what is it connected with in the customary feeling of myself that is behind the outburst. I reflect in that quietness and strainlessness that comes when one is paying directed attention sincerely to oneself. For the cause lies either in something that I include in the habitual feeling of myself, or it lies in something that I do not include in this feeling of myself. Let us take the first case namely, I have been aroused so violently, because something I include in the feeling of myself has been injured. I reflect on what was said and done. I decide that it seems to be a criticism of my efficiency. Have I then a picture of being efficient, and is this a component part of my customary feeling of myself? I did not quite realize it. As time goes on I become more and more conscious that it is so to this extent I increase my consciousness of the sources of my usual feeling of myself. My task is then clear. I must notice where I am not at all efficient, and slowly include this in my feeling of myself. Now this will change my feeling of myself a little. Why? because my consciousness of myself is increased. Also I will be freed from being so touchy in this direction by including the opposite. Let us take the other possibility, namely that the cause lies in something I do not include in the habitual feeling of myself. It will lay therefore in the dark, that is, the unconscious side of myself. Now if this is so it will tend to be projected onto others. On reflection I find, that this person always irritates me, quite apart from whether he criticizes me or not. There is something in him I cannot stand. Even when not present, he vexes me, why cannot I throw him off? I begin to suspect what the reason is. I cannot throw him off because in some way he is me, but how can this be, when I love him so little, and love myself so much? Well, certainly it sounds strange, but the reason is that self-love simply will not admit this part of me into my consciousness. I will not include it in my feeling of myself. The solution is easy. I simply project this unpleasing side of me outwards and see it as being in another person who is very like it. So it comes about that the faults we dislike most in others are usually those that we display ourselves without being conscious of them. It would indeed seem that every precaution is taken to prevent us from awakening to what we are like. The first stage in regeneration or being born again not in the flesh, but in the spirit, is precisely awakening to what we are like, and this is only possible through increasing consciousness of oneself. 
but the approach to the first stage seems to be deliberately made extremely difficult. Pits and traps and barriers and many signposts and lanes ending in nothing are everywhere. And on the top of all this, the most extraordinary illusions about ourselves are pumped into us daily from early childhood, in addition to many stupid persuasions that almost submerge our perception of truth. In this respect would you not say, that the power of self-justifying, so vigilant and inexhaustible, is not designed to help our awakening. By the way, why are the devils so inexhaustible? To return, I have got as far as thinking that the cause of my outburst is connected with deeper things, and an affront to my picture of being efficient, because this person arouses my ire in so many other ways. In fact, I am now willing to say that I must be projecting onto him some unpleasant side of me that I have not admitted into my consciousness. Others may have noticed it, but not me, and it certainly has never been included in my feeling of myself. Once more my task is clear. I must study this person in the light of being someone in me that I am unaware of. In general, he will be the opposite to what is included in my usual feeling of myself, and understand here that he may have qualities I need badly myself. As I admit to him gradually into my consciousness I will become whole, instead of one-sided. This is something very marvelous. And, of course, the feeling of myself will entirely change. We must by every means, method, trick and invention, increase the consciousness of ourselves in order to approach the level of balanced man. I say trick and invention deliberately. One can sometimes catch oneself out and one can also spy on oneself. This is not quite the same as observing oneself, or rather, it is a form of noticing oneself, as also is overhearing oneself. By the way, noticing oneself can be quite uncritical like casually noticing a passerby in the street. But in every case the aim is to increase consciousness of oneself because when this begins the feeling of oneself begins to alter, and one knows it, and thanks God. Now, remember, the reason why it alters is that you begin to include in your consciousness of yourself things you did not include before and so your former feeling of yourself has to change. Do get that clear in your minds. We live in a house with the blinds down. A little light gets in this we call full consciousness. And so we, a parcel of little imbeciles, existing almost in total darkness, make a horrible mess of living and misuse, or do not use our centers that can tune into centers always working. As Ouspensky put it once, we live in a house full of the most delicate and wonderful machines. By the light of a solitary candle we attempt to run them without knowing anything about them. If anything goes wrong, it is always somebody else's fault. Do not think that these words of his are an exaggeration. If you are acquire proof, look around if you are incapable of looking at yourself. Now, pulling up the blinds a little hurts at first. Then one can stand a little more light, and then more. What you took as yourself begins is to look like a little prison house far away in the valley beneath you. Amwell, 15.12.51 Further commentary on consciousness, and a preliminary consideration of the meaning of the soul. At first, let us continue to expand the teaching on consciousness. In this respect, as we have seen, the work says we live in comparative darkness, as it were by the light of a solitary candle, among complex instruments, the uses of which we do not rightly comprehend. These instruments are our ordinary centers and parts of centers, each having its own uses. A complete man would be therefore the embodiment of all these uses. We can see, then, that a complete man is far from us. We can see this, at least, provided we are not lamentably self-complacent and ignorant of our innumerable insufficiencies. Ignorance, by the way, is cited in esoteric literature as one of the most death-dealing vices. Neither men nor women should ever be satisfied with themselves. I am speaking here of psychological death, far more to be feared, and the death of the body. The work says we meet the dead everywhere walking in the streets, sitting in houses, in offices, in courts, in cinemas, in clubs, in churches, in fact, everywhere the living dead. The scandalous state of affairs is not revealed until we begin to glimpse it in ourselves. Looking in the glass are we sure we are not looking at the dead or, at least, the dying? A strange question. The death of the body is necessary. It is destined. But psychological death is not, and it is to this kind of death that I am referring. Now the increasing of consciousness will prevent it. 
struggling with one's ignorance by efforts helps. But increasing the consciousness of oneself helps still more, and this requires another sort of effort. The broader the consciousness of oneself, the more is the power of reception. A narrow prejudiced oneself takes in little. This makes overcoming ignorance by efforts, say, of study, nearly impossible. The person is not interested. There is no room in him. But of course there is plenty of room. His oneself has no room. But if he increases the consciousness of himself and thereby loses his previous feeling of himself, his power of reception will be also increased. Can it be said that we always knew this? I do not think so. It requires some considerable reflection to grasp its meaning. Now the work says that as we are we do not hear the continual messages sent out as high-level vibrations from higher mental and higher emotional centers. When it is said that we do not hear them what is meant is that our ordinary, that is, our lower centers do not pick them up. The term higher centers implies the existence of lower centers. The latter are not receptive of the former. Owing to the state of our three lower centers, our powers of reception are limited. It is for this reason that the work says that our task is to prepare the lower centers for the reception of the vibrations from the higher centers. We therefore have to study by self-observation the state of our low centers, and this is called the first line of work namely, work on ourselves. Work on ourselves means work on our lower centers on their state, their condition, their wrong working. With only one candle of light we cannot see them. Self-observation lets in more and more light. So the work begins with self-observation. Now the condition of our lower centers not only renders them non-receptive to higher centers, but is such that it would be dangerous to receive them. The state of the emotional center, for example, saturated with the emotion of identifying, and negative emotions, and self-emotions, is so bad that were the vibrations coming from higher centers to play on it directly it would cause us terrible damage. Only through its gradual purification can traces of the action of higher centers be received more or less directly. Even then a transformer must needs come in between and step down the high voltages that belong to the higher centers so that the lower centers are not fused. Now a negative emotion will conduct wrong meaning just as a lie necessarily will. Thinking wrongly from wrong ideas and illusions demands metanoia, a steady and resolute changing of the mind by means of new ideas. Feeling wrongly through negative emotions, identifying, and the self-love require much observation, constant personal work, and intelligent decision. There is nothing easier than to be negative. This leads to the possibility of these centers being able to bear higher voltages. You may be certain they will receive them once they have been prepared, if you like, on the principle that nature abhors a vacuum. And so the process will continue stage by stage. There is and must be a transformer in the three-story house of our being. Although it will alter its ratio, as we can receive more, I fancy we shall never be able to endure direct the high voltages of the influxes from the higher centers. In any case, all life depends on reception, for everything is reception. All nature is reception. But we are created to receive far more than the vibrations of light from the sun now if all that this oneself in us does not include is gradually brought into consciousness. Our reception is correspondingly increased. The one self that each person is clinging to at this moment, without quite realizing it, gives place to a wider self which eventually becomes the self. The narrow, oversensitive bundle of pride, prejudice, vanity, illusions, and wrong attitudes which make up the one self disappears. The self emerges as a picture that has been restored by cleaning. The capacity of reception is then greatly increased that is, much more influx from higher centers is received. But the former feeling of oneself is, of course, lost, for one is no longer the same artificial person that one clung to and suffered from as one's true self. Not only this, the previous oneself now has no power over you. Do you notice the process by not minding everything so much? This means the sensitive bundle of things you thought was yourself is merging into the rest of yourself and losing its outline. Now the work teaches that we have a soul, but that it is small and must be developed so that it includes far more than it does. As the undeveloped soul is, we are taught, it is nothing more than a shifting point of the most intense and violent identification. In a word, where you are most identified, there is your soul. The development of the soul is by a widening of it. 
you will at once see a connection here with the widening of this one self which possesses us as we are, but ceases to do so when it fades into the total self. We can therefore take it that the phrase in patience ye shall possess your souls has nothing to do with the meaning usually attributed to it. People think it means that we must possess our souls in patience. It means nothing of the kind and is merely one example of the degradation of meaning of every esoteric remark in the New Testament. Its point is that as we are we do not possess our souls, but our souls possess us and only through long patient work can we possess them, and the nature of that patient work is what we have been studying namely, the increasing of the consciousness of oneself which leads to the emergence of the broad self as distinguished from the narrow oneself or pseudo-self. Later we will make further reflections on the identity of the developed soul and the self and the resulting increase of reception of the vibrations from higher centers. Amwell, Christmas 1951. Note on temptation. At a small meeting here last Wednesday, the question of what temptation is was discussed, arising out of a remark made recently that it is only in regard to the work that we can be said to be tempted, and that other temptations are not really temptations, because their result is a foregone conclusion. Now temptation is necessary in the work. If people feel that they are never tempted in regard to the work, they are not allowing it to join issue with themselves. It may be they work in a dream and so merely dream they are working. Or perhaps they make no connection between the work and their life, keeping them in two separate compartments. Or they may only sound due in the octave of the work, holding it in some degree of valuation, but not sounding re, and therefore may be incapable of sounding me, for without the application of the work to oneself, which is re, how is it possible ever to come to the realization of personal difficulties in the work, which is me? In such a case one will not experience the meaning of being tempted in regard to the work. Now let us provisionally define temptation, as a state in which a struggle is taking place, in you, as to what will take control. Put in terms of eyes, it is a struggle between different eyes. Put in terms of desires, it is a struggle between different desires. The outcome is what you do. You call this your will or your deliberate choice, and so on, if you are liable to automatic self-deception and self-justifying, and so of course your psychological fiber. And once you do whatever you do according to the outcome, the temptation ceases. But if you are of finer material, you inwardly and secretly are aware that you did not really decide anything, and it was all decided for you. In other words, there was no temptation. There may have been some anxiety, but not temptation. Now put in terms of a struggle between different ties, the outcome was really a compromise between the eyes, just as happens in politics between different parties. Put in terms of different desires, the outcome was really the resultant of these desires, like the resultant of forces acting in different directions in mechanics. In short, the thing was a foregone conclusion. It was not decision, but compromise, or resultant. In other words, it was mechanical. As said, there may have been some anxiety, or even perhaps doubts, and the transient apparition of some ghostly resolutions, but the matter was eventually settled for you mechanically. Now you cannot attribute to a machine any power of being tempted. How can a machine possibly be tempted? You cannot say when your motor car strips a gear, that it was tempted to do so if you do. You are using the wrong language. I will ask you now to consider the case of man. The work says that man is sleep is a machine. How then can he be tempted? You are using the wrong language surely if you say so. But if you are speaking of a man who is awakening from sleep, the matter is different. Such a man can be truly tempted. In fact, he is tempted, for otherwise he cannot continue to awaken. Now a man awakening is not entirely a machine. A machine has no psychology, but a man awakening begins to have a psychology, and so can be tempted. In this connection, on one occasion, when G was asked a question about a man's psychology, he replied, a man such as you are speaking of has no psychology. He is a machine. In order to study a machine, you do not speak of psychology. With him it is a question of mechanics, and nothing more. Study him as a machine and you then will know exactly how he will behave in different circumstances. That is what she said, in so many words. It shows one the reason why he so often said, which kind of man. When people spoke of anyone. We forget the seven categories of man, 
and think too easily of man, in the abstract instead of which man. Now in speaking of what is good and bad for the work it is taught, that whatever puts you to sleep is bad. It is only possible to observe what puts you to sleep when you begin to have a point in the work within yourself that is, when you have some eyes, in you, that wish to work and are not much interested in the sort of things on sale in life. These eyes group themselves on the level of observing eye, and only gradually increase in number. Slightly below them are the crowd of life eyes upon which the power of detachment inherent in that inner sense called observing eye enables us to look at first only dimly. Many of these eyes are not really life eyes, and should be lifted out of that sea. They will be if the heat of the work in you begins to equal the heat of life, as one ancient writer puts it. Heat means love. You will see that I am describing the state of a man awakening, a man who begins to have a psychology and not merely a machinery. This man has some choice. The choice is between two levels. Two levels are beginning to form in him the work level and the life level. Two sorts of eyes are now being rightly arranged in him work eyes and life eyes. In place of disorder, order is being established in him. This is due to the power behind the work, and, be it noted, the power of the work in him depends solely on his own private secret valuation of the work. Life will not and cannot bring about this order in him. That is why the work has always existed, in one or another form, suited to the age. Now the strength of life and its very clever but very simple ways of hypnotizing people and keeping mankind asleep continually distracts us so that we forget to do the work. But we can do the work. It is the one thing we can do. So we have choice. And so we can be really tempted, just because we have these two levels instead of only one and can act from one or from the other. So, for many years, we are tempted in this fashion and mainly yield to life. After a long time we begin to yield more to the work, but all that comes later. Amwell, New Year, 5.1.52 On sounding re. Note on starting to work. Often people who have listened to the teaching of the work even for years do not understand what it means to work on themselves. They listen with their ears but do not hear anything with their minds. On many occasions O said that people listened only to the words that he was saying, but did not try to hear their meaning. He said they were wasting their time. In everyday talk, however, we scarcely listen to the words another person uses but to their meaning. We hear meaning, meaning speaks to meaning, not words. Now meaning is on a higher level than words. This is shown by the fact that the same meaning can be expressed in different words and also in the words of any foreign language. The words will be totally different. But the meaning will be the same. Meaning, then, stands at a higher level, and words, and so is prior to words. Now in order to make communication more practical, we learn a special language called the language of the work. The work uses special words with special meanings, such as identifying, internal considering, self-remembering, negative emotions, self-observation, sleep, wrong feeling of I, waking, death, rebirth, real I, mechanicalness, chief feature false personality, being, essence, multiplicity, levels, octaves, scale, and many others. All these words mean something definite. As words, they can be registered and remembered. But this is not the purpose of this special language. To hear two people, not exactly friends, talking to one another, using work words without understanding them, and each trying to silence the other, is something to be avoided. It can tempt one to think the work must be all sheer nonsense. But of course it is only turned into nonsense by such talk. It is indeed taking the name of the work in vain. Now this expression when used of God namely, thou shalt not take the name of God in vain does not refer to the word itself, but to the meaning. To profane the name of God is to degrade the quality of the meaning of God, and so to cheapen what is highest in yourself, and therefore to injure yourself, for wrong attitudes injure ourselves. Esoterically. The name represents the quality, and the higher the quality, the greater the meaning. Now the quality of work words is very degraded, when they are used anyhow, now one, now another, without any true appreciation of the special meaning of each. Understand that to juggle them around and have pot shots with them in order to answer a question is not thinking. There is a great density of special meaning concealed in each work word. It is because of this density, that, as one grows in understanding, their meaning grows, and accompanies you. They come to mean more and more, 
just as the Gospels come to mean more and more as one's understanding of the work increases, thus proving that this work is truly esoteric Christianity. But here is what you have got to realize and realize again, and again namely, that the meaning of work words can never begin to be understood unless you start to work on something definite in yourself, whether you are a man, or a woman. It is the same for us all. Now since so many do not comprehend what is meant by working on oneself, let it be repeated, that there is no such thing. This has been said many times, before. I mean, that to tell me you are working on yourself means nothing to me, but if you tell me that you are working on something quite definite that you have observed clearly in yourself, then I will be glad to hear it. Maybe I will have noticed it already for myself. For it is not difficult to see when a person is working on something definite. The look is different. The eyes and the expression of the face, and the voice alter. The whole atmosphere of the person changes. It is not necessary to tell me, or anyone what the quite definite thing is that you have observed in yourself, and are working on. It is best to keep it in stillness, in silence. I mean, it is best not to talk in yourself about it, and so not to let your life eyes know about it and start arguing, but to let only your work eyes know what it is. For then the work itself will reward you secretly. This is what is meant by verses 3, and 4 in Matthew vi. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee. For some extraordinary reason the last line is rendered, thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. There is no mention of openly either in the Greek text, or the Latin text of the Vulgate. When you do anything for the sake of the work i.e. through work eyes in you you receive your reward in secret, which may take the form of flashes of self-remembering or flashes of positive emotion, and certain states of inner peace. To be rewarded openly would mean at once that it goes into the self-merit, and so into the personality. Amwell, 12.1.52 Magnetic Center It was said recently that once you have valuation of the work you do not need magnetic center. It is necessary to understand that a thing may be useful in one place, but useless, or even a hindrance in another place. Nothing is valuable just in itself, but only in its relation to other things. Now can you think of anything that is valuable in itself? Think for a moment. Now think of a thing that is useful in one place, but useless, or even a hindrance in another. We are taught that magnetic center is valuable in its place. If strong enough it can lead us from life into the work. M. R. Ouspensky developed a strong magnetic center, and, to use his language, he went in search of the miraculous. He did not find what he wanted in India. On returning he found this work. Now magnetic center is the power to distinguish to quite different kinds of influences which one can meet with in life. They are called A and B influences. A influences are created in life. They are in the interests of business, of politics, of war, of sport, of rank, of power, of intrigue, of scandal, of innumerable forms, of gambling, and of other interests such as food, drink, money, clothes, publicity, and so on. We are dominated by one or another or more of these influences through our attitudes. It is our attitudes that connect us with them as by invisible threads. Reflect on this, and notice your interests. These influences, created in life, and called influences in the work, keep the pot boiling. That is, they keep humanity on the move. They keep people going round and round, always thinking they are going somewhere, towards some goal. Until we ourselves wake up a little, we think the same, we suppose life is taking us somewhere, we imagine we are going towards some goal. We certainly are, but not to the one we expect. So we do not see our real situation, we do not appreciate its dangers, we do not see we are living in what the work calls the hall of mirrors, and are going in no direction whatever, and are going nowhere. The mirrors are so arranged, that it seems as though one were going straight ahead. Actually one is going nowhere, one is just going round and round. This is a simple but very clever illusion. But it only has any power as long as one does not observe oneself, and in life nobody does. It is unnecessary for life in fact, nobody wishes to observe himself. This is due to a number of simple little illusions also all very clever such as oh, I know myself through and through or it would make a chap introspective morbid, do you know or I'm far too busy for anything like that. 
I'm a practical person. They form an interesting collection. They are worth studying, I mean, in yourself. If you do not observe them, that is, if you do not make them conscious to yourself, they will do a lot of harm by keeping you asleep in different ways, which of course is their object. Like much else, they only have power over you if you cannot let them into the light of consciousness by means of self-observation. If you can let them into this light, then you must look at them quite simply just as you might look at an orange on your plate. This is more important than I can say. However, you will probably begin identifying and self-justifying long before this happens, and everything will slip back into your crowded darkness again, and everything will be as before. You see, illusions are lies, and no one ever cares to admit to either illusions or lies. And there is always the master illusion, namely, that one has no illusions. This lulls one to sleep. Is it not all very clever? Enumerate to yourselves the great illusions of which the work speaks. See for yourselves, in yourselves, how simply and cleverly everyone is kept asleep, and realize how it was unnecessary to build those fences round the sheep. Now a man with a strong magnetic center already sees some of all this. You have often heard it said that this work begins at the level of good householder. It is not for freaks or abnormal people, or useless people. It is necessary to be a responsible person, an educated person, a person of some good, and if possible a person who is or is becoming good at something. Please understand that for a person to be a good householder in the work sense, it does not mean he must possess a house of his own. A man is his own house. It refers to what is in that house. If all three stories have something in them, it helps. Now the work adds a few interesting things about good householder. It says that he does not believe in life. You will see that these are connected. The stronger is his magnetic center, the fewer illusions about life he will have, so the less he will believe in it. You may not have noticed this connection before. Now to return to magnetic center, it was said that once dew is sounded, magnetic center has done its work. It is also said that while it can bring you to the work, it cannot keep you in it. I will try to indicate to you briefly how. Indeed, it may become a hindrance, unless it is let go. Early in the work I was told by M. Margaret Jeef to put aside all my books and read no more. Now I had already studied at different times in the past the Gnostic literature, the Neoplatonists, the Alchemists, some of the Indian scriptures, the Hermetic writers, the Sufi literature, the Bible, the Chinese mystics, the writings of Eckhart, Bum, Blake, Swedenborg, and others, and had been a pupil of Jung for some years. I say all this on purpose to show you how surprised I was to learn I had to put these studies aside. But it did not mean that my studies had been useless. It meant that now, having met the work itself, they were no longer useful. They had played their part in forming a magnetic center. But they now enabled me to see how strong and clear and connected the work was by comparison. What I had to do now was to study the ideas and the methods of the work. Anything useful gained from the past would then fall into its place. Often I feel it is a pity that so few have made their magnetic center stronger by the previous study of B influences. The magnetic center, whatever its origin, can be made strong by thought and study. That is the main point. The stronger the magnetic center, the greater is the evaluation of the work. By those who have not done this the value of the work and its unique formulations is not instantly seen. They have little or nothing to compare it with. In that case, they need to study esoteric literature sometime later after they have heard and practiced the work in order to widen their minds. The esoteric parts of the New Testament, such as the parables, are very valuable in this respect and continue to be all through one's development. In fact, I doubt if anyone can understand these without the work. Notes for the reader, 1. The older education which gave a background of classical legend, and an approach to Greek philosophy tended to form magnetic center. The modern scientific textbooks do not. 2. The work calls those who are not good householder tramps, lunatics, and has namus. There is the business has namus, the political one, and so on, big and small, Amwell, 18.1.52. Transformation of meaning paper I. We think awkwardly, and personal emotions continually interrupt us we feel resentment, and our thought streaks and breaks up like a picture on a television screen. G said, you always think, think, think. I look. 
Of course, we are not thinking not really. We feel we have to say something instead of looking, say, at the tree. We are unaccustomed to real thought. Our thought is so very awkward, so clumsy and confused, a fitting together of everything wrongly, in triumph, like an idiot child smashing up things with an evil pleasure. Some only have destructive thinking. Some can only disagree, and call this thinking. Some always side with the minority out of a sort of cussedness, and call this thinking. Many never know what they are thinking. Most call association thinking. Then again, one's theory of life may be utterly wrong, and all one's resulting thoughts wrong. For if the ideas of one's thoughts are wrong, one's thinking, which proceeds from one's ideas, will be all wrong. If you think from the ideas of the work, your thinking will begin to be right. To think from the ideas of the work instead of your previous ideas is menoia, that is, change of mind, not repentance, as it is wrongly translated. To drive away your previous ways of thinking cleanses the dirt from the mind, and you begin to catch its beauty. The battle goes a and fro for long. It is not really you who are fighting it. But it seems that you encounter one face of tempting after another or testing, if you prefer. It is one's Armageddon. Always reinforcements from natural thinking from the senses march up and seem to swamp you, and they will if you believe eternally that nature somehow created itself, and that there is no meaning, and only blind forces exist, and all the rest. Your thinking will be upside down. You will then be restless and unhappy, just because you see nothing above nature. Where there is no meaning, you necessarily sicken, and perish. Violence and ugliness and cruelty attract you the lowest meanings. Man lives by meaning. This work transmits more and more meaning in proportion, as the mind is cleansed from the dirt of wrong thinking and feeling, for it opens out. To think upside down is silly. It is to explain the higher by the lower. You then say that matter is first, and the mind somehow arises. The work says mind is first. It says, in so many words, that before the beginning of time, mind is, not was, but is, for was belongs to time. It indicates that mind as the absolute is outside and beyond all time, and so is free from all the imperfections of time experienced by our limited being. It indicates that the higher creates the lower on every successive level in the total scale of being. Nothing creates itself. All created things receive meaning according to their level of being, which determines their receptivity of meaning. All meaning is derived from absolute meaning which is infinite, and so is not in time, and so is not created. To be created is to be limited, and the absolute is under no limited conditions. The descent of meaning, from level to level, from higher to lower successively, never ceases, and is different at each level. Because of this, the transformation of meaning is possible and can be experienced by man, as his level of being changes. Where he has seen one thing obscurely, he then sees a thousand things distinctly. In this work we seek transformation of meaning through self-change. This is possible and can be experienced, but not if we cling to former meanings and indulge unchecked in self-emotions, and negative criticizing and feeling. A definite line of work on our level of being is laid down in the work teaching. If it is genuinely practiced over a sufficient time, we begin to look back with surprise on the former meanings we lived by. This marks the beginning of a change in our level of being owing to some degree of transformation of meaning. As we are raised in being, so is meaning transformed. If we fall back the old meanings return. This up and down motion keeps on until a step is definitely reached. Then it will begin again, so, as to reach the next step. At each step new meanings flow in and old meanings shrink. We begin to think differently. We see the awkward clumsiness of our former thinking, and know it was not thinking at all. We begin to see how wonderfully delicate and silent the movements of real thinking are, how nothing must ever be forced, nothing joined which so clearly does not belong, nothing put in out of order or scale. We see this tragedy of our previous thinking, the wrong connecting of things, the crude violence of it, the cruel muddling up of things. The same insight into our former feelings is also opened. But if the old habits of mind and feeling persist none of all this can take place. Amwell 26.1.52 Crystallized Think and Crystallized Thoughts Form Attitudes If you have continually thought in a certain way all these thoughts crystallize into an attitude. 
Let us suppose you have always thought that you did not get the attention you should have got. You have identified with this thought thousands and thousands of times. Eventually these thousands of similar thoughts form a solid deposit in the mind. This is called crystallization. Such a crystallization of similar thoughts forms an attitude, so you now have in you an attitude towards other people which has been formed out of thinking and thinking time, and again in the same way, that you never get the attention you should get from others. You will agree with me that such a crystallization forming this particular attitude is not uncommon, and can be observed in many people you know. Very good, but how about yourself? Begin with yourself always in this work. Have you observed it silently at work in your own life? It causes a lot of unhappiness both to yourself and others. It is a very powerful constituent of that form of internal considering called making accounts. It can eat one's force up daily and so produce a secret inner sickness of the spirit. It can make one extremely brittle or touchy or changeable, or produce similar manifestations of weakness. But apart from all the evils that its presence can manifest in your psychic life, and also in your somatic or bodily life the greatest evil connected with it is that it remains inaccessible to you, working silently in the darkness beyond your consciousness. Now here lies one out of several difficulties in the first line of work, which is work on oneself, beginning with self-observation. The difficulty is this, you can become aware of and occasionally notice the qualities of some of your thoughts. If later you learn to concentrate, by which I mean become very quiet in yourself, you then stand, as it were motionless in the middle of the merry-go-round, and witness an extraordinary throng, many subhuman and almost grotesque or deformed, or quite evil. These are thoughts which you usually mount. If you identify with any you move from the center, and go around yourself that is, you, and the thought become one, and you now say, I think. But although you can more and more observe the various thoughts, that can come to you, and by this method take the feeling of I out of them more, and more, you cannot observe an attitude. This is the difficulty. Once a system of similar thoughts has become crystallized into an attitude it is not directly observable. It has become part of you and acts invisibly, and automatically without your knowing about it. Now a thought will not necessarily make you act, but an attitude will. In the given example, you will not keep thinking that you do not get the attention you should get, but you will keep on acting, as if this were so, and no matter what is done it will not stop this attitude not only from making you act in certain ways, but from eating your force daily. The secret of its power lies in its situation, that is, it is operating slightly beyond the range of one's direct self-observation. It lies outside the small area of consciousness, that one familiarly in life inhabits. In short, it is inaccessible to you as things are with you that is, as long as you cling to the ordinary feeling of yourself which is the same as remaining, at all costs, in the small area of consciousness that you inhabit internally. But the genuine practice of self-observation gradually draws into consciousness the things lying in the shadows and these in turn drawing things lying in the darkness. If you begin to increase the consciousness of yourself by observation of what is accessible, then after a time, according to your capacity to stand shock, you will find yourself becoming aware of the existence in yourself, your psychic makeup of things you had not attributed to yourself, but only to others. You will recall that we project onto others what we are not conscious of in ourselves, a charming device that we all have, and one that contributes so much to the peace and harmony of human life on this planet. Now, to take another example of crystallized thoughts. Let us suppose you have begun at some early stage to think that people do not like you. You have indulged in this thought freely and quite unchecked. You have had the same thought over and over again, year after year, until it has crystallized out into an attitude. You are now, let us imagine, a most successful person surrounded by loving friends. But there is something wrong, a sad, faraway look, a sigh. Attitude is secretly at work, draining your force, unknown to you. Now there is another curious thing about attitude. As I said, you can observe thoughts, but not attitudes. Also a thought does not necessarily make you act, but an attitude does, without your knowing anything about it. You sigh, you have a sad, far away look, or you act as if you are aggrieved, or you seem surprised when you are given anything, and so on. All this is caused by attitude operating from the background. The hidden attitude makes you act mechanically in short it causes you to sigh, to look unhappy, 
to act as if you were neglected, and so on, although there is absolutely no outer reason why you should. It consumes you. It eats your force as the secret worm eats the rose. But the curious thing is that even though people assure you daily that you are liked, or even though they give you irrefutable evidence that you do really receive attention, yet it makes no real difference, or only a momentary one. The attitude continues to exert its evil power from its dark abode. It is often accompanied by delicious forms of self-pity. It is indeed one of the powers of darkness, and every assurance, every proof will be rejected without your knowing why. This kind of useless suffering is extremely common. It drains enormous quantities of force from humanity which is utilized elsewhere. Amwell 2.2.52 Transformation of Meaning Paper I We spoke in a previous paper on the transformation of meaning and about levels of meaning. There is greater meaning and lesser, or, put differently, there is higher and lower meaning in the total scale of meaning. Our susceptibility to meaning depends on the quality of our being. A low level of being will be susceptible only to a low level of meaning. It will receive inferior meaning. A man belonging to a more developed level of being will be capable of receiving meanings from a higher level. But it does not follow that he will do so. Now our being is multiple in more senses and one. We have many different ties. They are not on the same level. We also have different centers with different parts, lower and higher in function, and therefore not on the same level. The different eyes live in the different parts of centers. Inferior eyes that is, more mechanical eyes, such as those connected with remembering small things, or making small plans live in lower parts. Higher eyes, such as those connected with reflection or weighing evidence, live in the higher divisions of a center. From this brief glance at the teaching on being, one can see that one's being is not all on the same level, but is constructed on different levels. And from what has been so far said about the connection between level of being and level of meaning, we can realize that these different levels in our being will be receptive of different meaning. Like the construction of the universe itself as shown in the ray of creation, a man is in levels. The descent of meaning, from higher to lower, from level to level successively, never ceases. Meaning at a higher level is not comprehended by a lower level. This is what is meant by the statement in the first chapter of John, that the light shone in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The meaning of Christ's teaching was not comprehensible to the sensual, literal thinking of his audience. Sensual thinking, based on the level of meaning that the external organs of sense are receptive of, cannot comprehend psychological thinking. There is a gulf between them. They are discontinuous. We know from the three octaves of radiation derived from the ray of creation, and the table of hydrogens, which is further derived from the triple octave, that the universe is an immense scale or ladder of vibrations which are discontinuous. That is, they do not merge into one another, but are distinct on different levels. This was formulated by the work before the century. Physical science has since found that the observable physical universe, regarded as energy, is a scale of descending vibrations. For example, our organs of sight are receptive of light which is composed roughly of an octave of vibrations whose frequency of waves lies between 750 billion violet light to 400 billion red vibrations a second. But these wave energies are merely one octave of vibrations out of very many. Above and below the wave energy that we see with the eye, say, as violet light, but which in itself is simply a vibration, leave many other vibrations of greater and of lesser frequency and wavelengths. They are discontinuous with one another. For instance, vibrations just above violet light as regards frequencies constitute X-rays. No amount of light will produce X-rays. They are discontinuous. Also we have no external organ of sense for the reception of X-rays. Similarly, we have no given organ for the reception of wireless waves which come far below light vibrations. Now, as regards the reception of meaning, apart from sensual perception, we have several internal organs of reception in ordinary centers and in parts of centers which are given but not necessarily used, and also we have higher centers which our level of being is too low to hear. In the esoteric teaching on rebirth of which fragments are preserved in the Gospels, although mixed up and in the wrong order, as G said, we are taught that everything begins with change of mind metanoia. Except ye change your minds, ye shall all perish Luke XII. 
3, 5. This implies that the way we usually think, which is sensual, will prevent that possible inner development, that leads to rebirth, a new man, the goal of each individual. Other levels of meaning are necessary, therefore, apart from sensual meaning, the mind must be given new ideas from which to think. The ideas of the work are new. To think from them changes the mind. People, however, stick to sensual thinking, and at the same time try to listen to the ideas instead of really beginning to think from them. This is referred to in the Gospels as pouring new wine into old bottles, which is not the best thing to do as both are spoiled. Purely sensual thinking and psychological thinking cannot mingle. They are discontinuous on different levels. Now the thinking of a small child begins simply from the senses from appearances. It thinks from what it sees. Thinking, then, begins at the sensual level and is deeply ingrained. We take ourselves as our bodies. The mechanical or moving divisions of centers are turned to the senses. But the centers have more internal sides in the emotional and intellectual divisions. These can open on higher levels of meaning if they are purified. They can receive the work ideas and think from them if the love and need for them become strong enough. The level of being on which some eyes live or can and should live if we preach the work to them corresponds to the ability to become receptive to higher levels of meaning beyond sensual meanings. As long as the sensual mind grips and chains us, the work will seem meaningless because we have no level to receive its greater meaning. We continue in inferior meanings. We are then like people who are blind, having no receptive organ of sight. Yet if we strive and ask for sight, realizing we are blind, we will receive it and feel vibrations of new meaning. Then our relationship to and understanding of everything will begin to undergo transformation. Our lives will feel different. It is this work deeply pondered and gradually penetrating into our own living of life that raises being so that it sees another level of meaning. New meaning is waiting there already, as are the vibrations from another station that a radio cannot pick up. We do not make the new meaning. We have to tune in the work is about how this is done by psychotransformism. Psychotransformism leads to new meaning. A new level of meaning results from a new level of being. Change of being begins with change of mind. The ideas of the work are new. Change of mind is when you really think in a new way, and it means something. And finally new thinking cannot be poured into the old bottles of the mind on a sensual level. Amwell 9.2.52 Transformation of Meaning Paper III When I see a familiar thing without associations it looks strange. I see it in a new way. Its meaning is altered. If I can look at my friend without associations he seems strange. I see him in a new way. It is not perhaps too much to say that I scarcely recognize him for the moment. In the same way, walking down a corridor with an undetected mirror at the end I may not recognize the person walking towards me. He seems to be a stranger. I see myself without associations for a moment. Ordinarily when looking in a mirror we see ourselves through the veil of associations that we have about our appearance. The point is that when momentarily the veil of associations is stripped away, something happens. What happens? Everything becomes alive. If you can by sufficient practice relax from the personality, which is where the network of associations lies, and from, let me add, the wrong feeling of, I, you find yourself in a different world, a world of another meaning. Actually the world is the same, but your reception of the impressions from it is different and so its meaning is different. When you are relaxed from personality and imaginary, I, things are close to you. They speak to you. You are then truly taking in impressions. Impressions are falling on essence. The level of essence is higher than that of personality. We understand that a higher level receives greater meaning. Now when you are blessed that is, when you are relaxed from the personality you feel the intimacy of everything around you, as if things realized they could go on playing and you would not be angry. If you get angry you cannot relax from the personality. Or it is, as if you and everything around you felt quite suddenly at ease, and something could creep out from each object and show itself alive to you. And then suddenly life slams the personality back into its place, and everything is dead. 
Auspensky describes how the significant meaning of everything changed when he reached a certain level or state into which his experiments brought him. Every object became so filled, so brilliant, with meaning as to be almost unbearable. He writes, I remember one sitting on a sofa smoking and looking at an ashtray. It was an ordinary copper ashtray. Suddenly I felt that I was beginning to understand what the ashtray was, and at the same time, with a certain wonder, and almost with fear, I felt that I had never understood it before and that we do not understand the simplest things around us. The ashtray roused a whirlwind of thoughts and images. It contained such an infinite number of events, it was linked with such an immense number of things. First of all, with everything connected with smoking and tobacco. This at once roused thousands of images, pictures, memories. Then the ashtray itself. How had it come into being? All the materials of which it could have been made. Copper. In this case what was copper? How had people discovered it for the first time? How had they learned to make use of it? How and where was the copper obtained from which this ashtray was made? Through what kind of treatment had it passed, how had it been transported from place to place, how many people had worked on it, or in connection with it? How had the copper been transformed into an ashtray? These and other questions about the history of the ashtray up to the day, when it had appeared on my table. I remember writing a few words on a piece of paper in order to retain something of these thoughts on the following day. And next day I read, a man can go mad from one ashtray. The meaning of all that I felt was that in one ashtray it was possible to know all. By invisible threads the ashtray was connected with everything in the world, not only with the present, but with all the past, and with all the future. To know an ashtray meant to know all. My description does not in the least express the sensation, as it actually was, because the first and principal impression was that the ashtray was alive, that it thought, understood, and told me all about itself. All I learned I learned from the ashtray itself. The second impression was the extraordinary emotional character of all connected with what I had learned about the ashtray. Everything is alive, I said to myself in the midst of these observations, there is nothing dead, it is only we, who are dead. If we become alive for a moment, we shall feel that everything is alive, that all things live, feel, and can speak to us you will notice that Al Spensky says that in our ordinary state we are dead. This was made evident to him from the level to which his experiments brought him. This meaning was open to his reception. We do not at our level realize we are dead. We do not grasp the significance of the remark in scripture, let the dead bury their dead. But if we can relax from the personality we wonder at the antics and capers we were indulging in, and why we were madly pressing, streaming, rushing along, both outwardly and inwardly. Who is this person who takes charge? Who is this person we have to serve, who dictates what we should think, and say, and how we should behave, and what things should mean, the person of whom the more we catch glimpses, the more is seen as stupid, ruthless and tyrannical? Is this person composed only of imagination? Is it possibly the imaginary, I, that causes us so much trouble and vexation, and care, and worry, where there need be none? Does to relax from the personality mean to relax from this imaginary, I, the entirely wrong feeling of, I, that tyrannizes over us and that only the whole armament of the work and its teachings can destroy? Were I freed from the tyranny of imaginary, I, would I see everything differently? Let us see what Auspensky saw about this tyrannous person when he was lifted above its sphere of influence into another level of consciousness. A very great place perhaps the chief place, in all that I had learned was occupied by the idea of, I, that is to say, the feeling or sensation of, I, in some strange way changed within me it is very difficult to express this in words. Ordinarily we do not sufficiently understand that at different moments of our life we feel our, I, differently. In this case, as in many others, I was helped by my earlier experiments and observations of dreams. I knew that in sleep, I, is felt differently not, as it is felt in a waking state, just as differently, but in quite another way. I was felt in these experiences the nearest possible approximation would be, if I were to say that everything which is ordinarily felt as I became, not I, and everything which is felt as not I became, I, but this is far from being an exact statement of what I felt and learned. I think that an exact statement is impossible. 
It is necessary only to note that the new sensation of I during the first experiments, so far as I can remember it, was a very terrifying sensation. I felt that I was disappearing, vanishing, turning into nothing. This was the same terror of infinity of which I have already spoken, but it was reversed, in one case it, it was all that swallowed me up, in the other it was nothing. But this made no difference, because all was equivalent to nothing. But it was remarkable that later, in subsequent experiments, the same sensation of the disappearance of I began to produce in me a feeling of extraordinary calmness and confidence, which nothing can equal in our ordinary sensations. I seemed to understand at that time that all the usual troubles, cares and anxieties are connected with the usual sensation of I result from it, and, at the same time, constitute and sustain it. Therefore, when I disappeared, all troubles, cares and anxieties disappeared. When I felt that I did not exist, everything else became very simple and easy. At these moments I even regarded it as strange that we could take upon ourselves so terrible a responsibility as to bring I into everything and start from I in everything. In the idea of I in a sensation of I such as we ordinarily have, there was something almost abnormal, a kind of fantastic conceit which bordered on blasphemy, as if each one of us called himself God. I felt then that only God could call himself I, that only God was I, but we also call ourselves I, and do not see, and do not notice the irony of it. Amwell, 16.2.52 Man, with one suit, if a man were to be raised suddenly to a level of being above his own he would appear naked, because he would have no garments of truth belonging to that level. Imagine a man having only sensual truth brought into a place, where only psychological truth exists. The senses are not guides to truth. There are far too many known and unknown fallacies of the senses, such as the one that man stands on a motionless earth and the sun and all the hosts of heaven humbly turn round him every twenty-four hours. People were angry when told this was a fallacy of the senses. Why? Because the discovery offends their self-importance. Many still believe it, I fancy, literally, very few ever feel it psychologically, as a truth contradicting sense given truth. Notice how people dress their bodies up like children, and what respect is paid to the body. The sensual life has so very great a power that the mind is dressed in its garments in most people, and in nothing else. It possesses no garments of psychological truth. So if such a man, a man at the level solely of sensual truth, were to be raised to a higher level he would appear naked having no change of clothing for his mind. Now to such a man, with only one suit, the work will be a continual stumbling block. He will be scandalized by it, may be secretly, or may be openly. The Greek word translated offended in the New Testament is as Ada. People were scandalized when Christ taught them psychological truth, such as that to hate is to murder, instead of how often to wash and what not to eat. Now everyone is his or her own truth and his or her own good. This means that a man or a woman taken psychologically is what each holds as good. There is the bodily man or woman and the psychological man or woman. Do not, for heaven's sake, think they are the same. What then, do you personally hold as truth and what do you hold as good? What are you psychologically? It is worth reflecting upon. If truth for you is only what the senses show, then you are in falsity, just as if you think that good entirely consists in having your own way you are in evil. But we are speaking here of the sensual mind, and in particular of a person whose mind has only one suit, that is, the sensual man. Since the senses are severely limited the mind solely based on their evidence will be severely limited. It will think, for example, that when a person is dead and buried, and so no longer evident to the senses, he has not, and cannot possibly have, any further existence. Such a mind will say, but how? Where? I do not see him, or hear, or touch him. That is, relying on the senses only, as the source of all possible truth, he can only conclude that the dead cease to have any further existence, and are annihilated. This is sensual thinking and this by limiting us puts us in prison. A prison is what limits us now the work teaches us that we are in prison, but are not aware of it. What is the nature of the prison? The teaching that we are in prison is an ancient esoteric teaching. Pythagoras taught it some 2600 years ago. Now if we believe that our senses show us all that is real, and so, 
that they show us all reality, and that no other realities exist, we keep ourselves in the prison of the senses. Reading some notes made years ago I came on this passage, we should fear not to remember ourselves. We should fear to be under the power of the world. We should turn round from the moving shadows on the wall in front of us and behold the light. We should move out of the cave. It is true that we are in chains, and can scarcely turn our heads round. But the work can gradually release our chains. Eventually it can free us. Now from what has been said we can see that we must be very much under the power of the world, if we possess nothing but sensual thinking based on the world, as it appears to the senses, and have no other part of the mind awake than that sensual part. We can see that such a sensual mind will make a very strong chain, fastening us in such a position, that we can only see the shadows in front of us and remain in ignorance of anything behind us phenomena that is, appearances will seem to cause and move themselves, and truth and reality will seem to be centered in these appearances themselves. It will be just like the cinema which reproduces the situation. The darkened hall is the cave, the moving figures on the screen are the shadows cast on the wall, the film, and the light that cause everything are behind us and are ignored. We gaze fascinated in front of us, hypnotized by the shadows, as completely tricked as we are by the trickery of life, or perhaps I should say, doubly so reflecting on the narrow slit of the senses we have, one wonders what sensual reality would be like if we were granted a new sense, say, one, that opened the thought of another person to us, so making all deception impossible. Imagine the extension of reality resulting. If we all had this new sense our lives would become impossible at our level of being, no one could pretend. No one could say any one thing, and mean another. Apart from what would obviously happen to certain professions, I still speculate about the medical profession. This certainly makes one think that had we been given more senses, the resulting sensual mind, the mind founded on these senses new and old senses would be a very different thing from what it is now. Sensual reality the reality common to all would then be on a far higher level, embracing far more of truth, far more of reality, and so far less falsity, far fewer fallacies, and illusions. Now the internal senses open on realities other than to the external senses. This should make us pause and think. We know the work teaches that we have more internal senses, and external. On what realities do they open? If our present external senses show us only a small part, could the internal senses, if they were working, show us additional and greater parts of what is real? We could not look to even a complete development of our knowledge, and being ever revealing anything like the totality, the grandeur, and the fullness of all reality. To think so is merely one example of the state of continual blasphemy that we live in, quite unperturbed, and as trite, as when we say, I, as if we had won a form of blasphemy a little child avoids as long as possible people believe they could understand anything if it were only explained. Now the sensual mind as at present is blasphemy by itself. It is a heavy chain round the neck that almost prevents a man even turning round enough to observe himself, for the sensual scarcely can observe themselves. Do not mistake it for a necklace of pearls. Do not pride yourself on your plain, straightforward, matter-of-fact and sensible approach to life. If you do, you will never get those inner unused senses to work that are so delicate and open you onto such new ranges of meaning as the false personality weakens its grip on you. Your suffocating opinions of yourself and your bad smelling self meritoriousness, being false emotions, will drench and douse their interior light. You will have a wet soul as the ancients called it. A dry soul, they said, is better than a wet one because it can hear and see more. A lot of work on oneself is necessary to begin with to dry these unused senses out and to get them to work faintly. That is why we study and do this system for so long. The sensual mind, with its sensual thinking, has to undergo great changes. This only begins by thinking more and more from the idea of the work, by constant accessions of thoughts born of the ideas taught in the work, if possible daily accessions, which accumulate until metanoia is reached definitely, and the sensual mind becomes only a part of the new mind. Do not trust the sensual mind. It is a useful servant. Do not let it be your master. Remember, that the senses only work in the present moment. They do not show you the past which lies in another dimension as does the whole world. Do not trust the sensual mind. Amwell 23.2.52
Note uncertain eyes what you read and listen with. When you read a book alone you may use chiefly the intellectual center, or the emotional center, or the moving center. If it is difficult to grasp, you read it chiefly with the intellectual center, and it will be necessary to use directed attention. You will remember it with difficulty, or find you have scarcely understood anything, and must reread it. As a rule we don't reread it, and so we learn nothing new, unfortunately. If you read with the emotional center the book will have to be exciting or romantic, and you will read it with drawn attention. Your attention will be attracted, not directed, to the characters and the story, and you will only need to use directed attention at moments where you do not quite follow the plot or the meaning of a sentence. You will remember it surprisingly easily often years later. But if the story demands too much directed attention you will throw it aside. This is because it falls between centers. If you are preoccupied with some domestic event and open a book to distract you, you will probably read it with moving center which requires zero attention. Some people read large pieces of books with moving center only, especially if upset or if they think drearily that they ought to read. In that case, nothing is registered. You will have no memory of it. Zero attention gives no memory. Finally, a great many people do not read at all. Now let me leave the question of centers themselves and come to eyes and centers for I wish today to speak in more detail not only of how one reads when alone but how one listens to a person for reading as a form of listening but different. I mean that different eyes are used. The question is which I is reading or which I is listening at any moment? And this will bring us once more to the question of the eyes in general and to the whole doctrine of eyes which is of such importance in understanding and doing the work practically. The work teaches astonishingly that none of our thoughts or feelings is our own. It says that they are induced in us by different ties. But we take all of them as ourselves and think of them as our thoughts and our feelings and say I think. This is an illusion. They are not our thoughts and feelings and moods and emotions and desires and sensations but those of different eyes speaking through us that is, they are the thoughts and feelings of, in my case, people, who are not me, but whom I take, without question, as myself. The extraordinary thing is that I never discovered that this is so, until I began to realize that I had been living all these years with this state of affairs open and plain to me if I had looked. Yes, but not open and plain to my external sight, or any of the external senses. I had never discovered it before because I had never used an internal sense namely, internalized sight. I never observed myself. Yet I was given the power of insight, but never used it. As a result these people, these eyes, hitherto had played with my life as they pleased and I suspected nothing. Now I have come to know several eyes in myself, whose approach and presence I can detect by various signs and symptoms. To take an example. One of them begins usually by affecting me physically first of all and then leads on to arousing certain feelings accompanied by certain trains of thought, many now familiar but all not, yet completely so that is, I still think that I am thinking some of the thoughts it induces in me, because I agree with them. I can observe the other thoughts it offers me as not being mine. This means I am not yet able fully to observe this, I, since I take part of it as me that is, I say, I, to that part so I cannot separate completely from it. This means that this I is not yet thoroughly objective to me I cannot see it as entirely distinct from me as not being me at all, but another person in me who wants me to take it as me now sometimes I listen with this I and suffer much afterwards. This happens when certain conversations take place and this I slips in and speaks suddenly out of my mouth. It manages this through what I think is true. Some of the things it says I can observe are clearly not true. They are lies, and so are not me, but as I said, some seem to be true, and that is how it gets and I fail to see that the whole seven is a bad person who seeks to do me evil, for when I listen with this, I, it distorts what I am listening to, and tires, and disturbs me after it has eaten enough of me to satisfy itself for the time being. I cannot see yet that it uses bits of truth for its own purpose of overpowering me, or again, when I am reading alone I may become aware that it is there reading for me then I know there was something in the book similar to what it always wants me to think, and, turning a page, or two back, I will probably find what it was, and when this, I, seize the opportunity to slip in without my noticing, and start up its diabolical hypnotism. 
I speak gravely here because negative eyes have to be taken with increasing gravity as one works. Some conceal their entry in innocent guise. But remember that all negative eyes only wish to do evil and destroy your work. They seek to drag you deeper into prison. The trouble is that we continually strengthen these eyes by listening by means of the man believing them and do so little from our other eyes. Now I am reading quite alone and not expecting anyone. The eyes that read are not the same as when other people are around or I expect to be interrupted. I mean that if I am deeply interested in the book, the eye that is reading it and the eyes that are listening do not include in their circle the eye that I have been trying to describe above. You must do your own observation about this. I will now leave this example quite aware that it is not adequately described partly because of the difficulty in language. We have then slowly and painfully to come to the realization that as we are at our level we have nothing that we can call it is pure imagination to speak as if we have. So we have only imaginary I that is we imagine we have a real permanent unchanging I but we have not. It is a terrible blow to one's pride to begin to see the psychological truth which our external senses contradict. Some ignore the very ideal as preposterous. Try, therefore, to observe your eyes. Try to see that it is eyes thinking and feeling that are inducing these recurring moods and thoughts from which you suffer. The work will look after your good eyes. But, as regards your bad eyes, the way of releases and stripping and skinning them, in tearing from them the precious feeling of I, that you have been so foolishly squandering, allowing them to steal it from you all this time, and without which they would be formless. But incomplete observation will not free you. Gradually your observation must become complete observation so that all the feeling of I is withdrawn from them. Then they vanish. You are released from possession by them. Amwell, 1.3.52 The Work and the Wrong Love the work must become a reality to you. Unless it becomes real to you, it cannot help you. You must make room for the work. If you remain full of yourself, the work has no place to enter. If you give up nothing, it will give you nothing. It will give you nothing, because it cannot. If you give up nothing for its sake, it will never believe you, and if it never believes you, you will never will it. If you never will the work, you will never do the work. You will never believe it if you never acknowledge it, and you will never will it if you never believe it. If you never believe it you will remain in your present beliefs, which are no beliefs, if they are beliefs of the senses or opinions. If you do not believe the work it will not believe you. It will not come into you and converse with you and show you what you might possibly do, and where you might possibly go. You will never know the extraordinary pleasure of these conversations which in my case were at first external and are now internal the pleasure of knowing that the work is yours, not as a thing in the world that can be stolen, nor as your own jealous, exclusive property, but as something permitted you. I do not collect and dwell on these thoughts, whose patterns are formed by such emotions as jealousy, envy, and hatred, because these come from the self-love which is exclusive. The pleasure of gratified self-love is no longer pleasure, but rather has a feeling of being suffocated. It is no longer self-love that makes me seek continuance in this work. If it were, I could not continue in it. If your aim in this work is only from the self-love, you will come up against a barrier. How could it be otherwise? If you have no pleasant places in your heart but those of the triumphing self-love, how can you love the work? One is one's love. You may know that already, but that does not mean that you have seen the quality of your love. How can you reach greater meaning if your greatest meaning consists in having your own way, which is what the self-love always wants and seeks? When you reach the barrier due to self-love something has to yield, do you know? Something has to cry, do you know? Yes, but then, after, there is release. You will not resent as you did. Instead of your heart being in self-love, and so always being hurt, there will be something more delicate and lovely. Instead of the self-love leading you, you will begin to be led by the work. You will let something in, that, perhaps, you never realized you were keeping out. You cannot get to supersensual thinking, that is to psychological, or spiritual, thinking through the self-love. Sensual thinking and self-love are conjoined. The eyes that have helped you reach to your position in life will not necessarily help you in the work. You cannot take this work in your life stride or your career rise. 
Some life eyes will be useful, not as leaders, but taking a second place. Your life eyes belong to the parts of centers that life has developed in you the eyes relating to your job. But it is other parts of you that have to become receptive. Do you think of yourself as being fairly successful in life? Then do not imagine those eyes will make you so in the work. The eyes that make or may do successful in life are not adapted to grasp the meaning of the work. They belong to the customary, to what you know, to your main street. The seeds of the work cannot grow there. They grow only at some distance from the wayside out in your countryside. That is why you cannot take the work in your life stride, which puzzles many people. That also is why the work teaches we have to strip off clothing layers formed by life, so as to get to what is more us the seeds of the work sown in the self-love are not rightly rooted. Although they may grow formatorily on the knowledge side, it will not be so on the being side. The work is to open something that was shut before which helps understanding. The self-love will not yield to love. This is always so in all things, and in all directions, for love is at the expense of the self-love. So a barrier is reached that I have seen many reach, and one that I reached, and stayed at until I was hewn the stature of the work, and my own, and something gave way. For long I wanted to be first in the eyes of my teacher. I wanted this more than I wanted the work. You must understand clearly what I mean here. I wanted my self-love gratified. The self-love always wants to be first somehow, and it can be pretty mean. When this did not take place I sulked, or raged. Do you not see that I had to be treated indifferently, and the reason why? We cannot suppose the work can ever become a reality to any of us if we put other motives, interests, and loves far before it or make it serve them. We cannot then expect it to help in our distress or fear, by turning towards it as a last resort. Its messengers will not hear. Since the self-love cannot think rightly psychologically, or spiritually, because it emits nothing higher than itself, it will keep us chained to the sensual mind. That means that we will give the outer or lower power, and not the inner or higher. It will be our own fault. We will be governed by the senses. But the higher must be established beyond all doubt, for only this reverses us, and makes personality passive so that essence grows. For this turns us the right way up. The self-love turns everything the wrong way round, so one can never grasp what the work is, or why. The literal, which is narrow, exacting, brittle, and without grace, then crucifies daily the psychological. Sense crucifies daily the spirit. The self-love remains intact. Amwell, 6.3.52 Associations, and negative eyes. We see a man yesterday, not today. I will explain what this means. We take in nothing new about him because the impression of him always falls on and stimulates the same associations. In us we are not conscious of him but of our associations with him. We do not see him apart from associations. We are not aware of him objectively, but of what we subjectively associate with him. So the father sees his son as a little boy and the mother sees him as a baby in arms. In the same way the son sees his parents, especially his mother, as they used to be. If he discovers, say, that his mother is not as his associations of her make him think, he may be horrified. He believes, of course, that he thinks of his mother. He does not realize that he does not think at all, but that his thinking is nothing, but a process of mechanical association, that is set working in him, whenever he sees, or is reminded of her. She is never an independent human being outside him, having her own separate existence, nor is he to her. To live only in other people. To feel one's existence only in this way, is a weakness, that seems responsible for much human error and misery. The physical basis for associations, both desirable and undesirable, both useful and useless, is the brain. We have to struggle against some aspects of the mechanical brain. Now some people do not see the difference between impressions and associations. An impression comes to us from outside through our ear cheaply. The associations are within us, recorded, the work teaches, on rolls in centers, like wax phonograph rolls. When we see a familiar object, one or more rolls containing past records associated with that object begin to turn. This is what is meant by the opening sentence, we see a man yesterday, not today. It means simply that we see him through associations belonging to the past, and do not see him now in the present. 
so we see him yesterday and not today. Today we merely recognize him, just as we merely recognize everything else. We do not see things afresh. For this reason we cannot take in anything new. We resemble those savages who, seeing a great sailing ship for the first time, took no notice of it, but stared with interest at the little boat putting into the shore. It was something familiar, something they could take in by association with their own boats. Like ourselves they could not take in anything considerably greater than what they were accustomed to. We do not like anything unfamiliar. For example, we do not like the idea that we are mechanical, or asleep, or not properly conscious, or negative, or a cage full of eyes. We have no preformed associations which can take an unfamiliar and offensive ideas of this kind. So we resist them, and we resent them. Only by observing ourselves, and all that goes on in us in the light of such ideas can we make new recordings on centers through which we can take them in, and see the actual truth of them. These recordings are different from ordinary associations. They are made consciously because internal observation of oneself has to be a conscious act. It cannot take place mechanically. Also the impressions gained from self-observation are not from the outside world through the external senses, but from an internal sense given, but not used, a silent witness, in myself, a spectator of what goes on in me, into which I must put more and more consciousness, more and more my feeling of I, by withdrawing it, tediously, with trouble, from what it observes. A gradual concentration of consciousness, and the feeling of I begins then at this point, which then becomes observing I, in a practical sense, as a practical experience. One has then started on the difficult strange journey to rely which lies above observing I. I wish to call attention now to how our emotional states can affect associations, in us you have noticed that when you feel in a pleasant state you tend to have pleasant associations with a person and smile and be mad him or her, and when you are in an unpleasant state you get connected up with unpleasant associations. In short, the emotional state alters the arrangement of things. But a powerful negative, I cannot merely alter you, but damage you. The ordinary swing of the pendulum emotions, pleasant to unpleasant, and back, do not seem to me like negative emotions, which stick often for a long time. Their characteristic, in fact, is that they persist and run on by themselves. Now negative states can be thought of as the opposite of anything, that could be called positive art, which craves to transmit meaning from a higher level, and so seeks what is from good and what is from truth, and cannot see only the worst in everything. To use a phrase, they transgress the limits of the probable and always in the wrong direction, making for greater falsity, ugliness, distortion, and lying, often beyond belief and remedy. A negative state only makes what is negative more negative, and cannot do otherwise because it is basically evil in intention, leading down from hatred to violence, cruelty, and murder. It can only transform evilly. Any negative state works on the associations recorded on rolls in centers, so as to distort them, if it is not checked grimly. It endeavors to black out anything good recorded in them, and to floodlight anything bad. Every negative emotion is therefore the opposite of any positive art, which is to transgress within the limits of the probable and always in the direction of greater perfection and greater meaning. The tremendous power and the number of negative eyes that seek to do us harm by distorting associations and lying must never be treated lightly. You will have to meet them eventually, when your Armageddon comes, if it does. They truly are legion, as they defy themselves, when Christ asked their name. He said to the evil spirit that was in the man dwelling among the tombs, G-O-M-E, out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Mark V, 8.9, Yes, our negative eyes are many, and the sensual mind is their home, for it is like a tomb to the inner spiritual man. Now negative emotions harm us by many other methods also as by darkening everything like the octopus ejecting ink. And like the octopus or the many-headed hydra of mythology, they seize hold of you now on this side, now on the other, having many arms, fastening on every weak thing in your psychological makeup that you have not worked on or have not brought into the light of consciousness. When you hear the work saying that it is not sex or power that governs the world, but negative emotions, perhaps you do not take this seriously. And possibly even when you are in a negative state, you do not see what is meant. 
This is partly because you do not see quite that you are in a negative state. You see the state you are in as a reasonable state under the circumstances and so not negative. Here lies a difficulty similar to the difficulty of seeing eyes in oneself and one which we will equally resent. To feel you are right when you are negative as one does in life is to strengthen the state. In the work, however, it is necessary to see that one is wrong. Remember that we put ourselves under more laws in the work at first. Release comes later. Amwell 15.3.52 Me 12 If we could act consciously in every situation we would not internally consider. Internal considering sends us to sleep more than anything. It wastes energy. If we could externally consider only it would save energy. If we could act consciously in every situation we would create energy. To act consciously would mean to act without identifying. Identification leads to unconscious action. To act consciously in every situation would be to act without identification. To act without identification is one way to give oneself the first conscious shock. To give oneself the first conscious shock is to create energy. Two new energies are thereby formed in the human machine the energy 24 at the early potential stage denoted by re and energy 12 at denote me these two newly created energies appearing in the machine by reason of the first conscious shock being given strongly affect the working of the emotional and sex centers respectively the energies fa 24 and sol 12 are also created you will notice that their active position is not so potential as re 24 and miles 12 but they also influence the emotional and sex centers altering the quality of their working the hydrogen sheet 12, produced by the mechanical shock of breathing, by its position in the octave has the least potentiality for development, that is, for differentiation. It is old, so to speak, and more fixed. It has the least youth. The creation of these new energies, not present in mechanical and sensual-minded man, has to do with the ultimate transformation of the sex center into the higher emotional center and its very gradual withdrawing from the instinctive center, the identifying, and the negative states and self-emotions that characterize the working of emotional center. All the three energies 12 can become hydrogen 6 under the pulsations of the second conscious shock which makes contact with the higher center gradually possible. But for the second conscious shock to begin to act in you meet 12 must be present in sufficient amounts and retained at the wanted times. Here we miss much by sleep and habit. I mean we are not watching, not sensitive internally. There is a turning wheel of opportunities and some opportunity is not noticed when we are being helped. None of these conditions, of course, will be fulfilled if a person is chronically negative and identified or will not see in sincerity a bad fault or follows appetite and self only and does not, in short, work. In that case, none of the special energy meet 12 will be created and the work will not help. He will see nothing extraordinary in life. He will have no vision of the work. He will not transform any impressions and will continue in the odors of the sensual mind and its dead works. It is quite useless asking me questions about the second conscious shock. I say to you only that it is impossible to understand anything about it until me 12 is present and stored enough in you. In brief, you must give yourself the first conscious shock before you can get to know the nature of the second conscious shock and get to know what it is and all about it in its many aspects and so create me 12 and prevent it falling downwards to the sensual level until it shows you the direction of the second conscious shock. For, like Joseph, it can interpret Pharaoh's dreams. Now to remember yourself in endlessly different situations is good. Also to act more consciously, which can only begin with noticing mechanical reactions after they have taken place, and remembering them, and then acting differently, is very good work indeed. As was said, that would be giving, or seeking to give oneself the first conscious shock. I have watched it being done. But people stay in their dreary outward psychological clothes in their old reactions and cling to them. To remember oneself is surely not to remember these garments. By doing that I fancy not a trace of the presence of me 12 will ever be found in you. That lovely youth will avoid you, like poison. So we have to think about the first conscious shock and its primary importance in the work, for without me 12 there is little change of being. I have said I speak only of the first conscious shock. In this connection I will add that people here must not be satisfied to remain as they are. 
there is far too much self-complacency or indifference. Consider carefully, if you are not, at bottom, satisfied with yourself as you are, and only would like another car. It is not necessary to point out that if you are satisfied any attempt at self-remembering that you make will go to make you still more satisfied with yourself as you are. The adoration of this mess called oneself is the commonest and most binding and limited religion. It is accompanied by often very funny rites. But it is inadvisable to make fun here. We explode, we flush, we pale, we are furious, and we never forgive. What a state we are all in without exception. Yet even so, it is possible to work, and to work afresh, and often at the first conscious shock, and to discover it for ourselves, as we are at our particular stage. Our very violence indeed provides us with material for self-remembering. We surely cannot remain satisfied with ourselves after slowly perceiving these unstable foundations of our ramshackle being, which the least person in the kingdom of heaven could cause to blow up with a trifling remark. Yes, we sorely need to be born anew, and not of blood and flesh this time, but of water and spirit. That would mean another, and quite new foundation, and so a new man. The work is all about this step. Amwell, 22.3.52 On having no middle, everyone, after a certain time, needs to begin to work on the pendulum in himself. A pendulum swings to and fro from one extreme to the other. In the case of the emotions, there is the swing between, say, enthusiasm and its opposite. One is all for, and a little later all against, someone. You feel that at last you have met the friend you have been looking for all your life, a person who really understands your difficult circumstances, and how you have suffered, and in a short time perhaps only a week, or so you feel you have made a great mistake, and you may add another look of resignation to your face. Now the pendulum is the great thief within. I only remind you that you have to find some method of managing it, or else it will take away anything it gives. It is uncomfortable to see a person totally asleep or unguarded, temporarily at one end of the pendulum, full of excitement, terribly happy, looking forward to a new life, and so on. In this state the person is wholly identified with one end of the swing of the emotional pendulum. There is no sign of self-remembering. Notice this point. A few days later the pendulum has swung to the opposite side. The person is now dejected and miserable, but early disappointed, everything seems to have gone wrong, and there is nothing to look forward to. The person is again wholly identified with one end of the swing of the emotional pendulum. Notice that there is again no sign of self-remembering. You will see in what sense the pendulum is a great thief. Also you will realize something of what was meant when it was said that we must work on the swing of the pendulum in ourselves, and find some way or ways of managing it a little, after we have been connected with the work for some time. Otherwise whatever you get will tend to be taken away, and you will stick. At one time you will be for the work, at another time against it, and so the swing of the pendulum will go on, with you its victim clinging fast to it, not seeing that you need not. Now as many of you must have often heard before. It is necessary to draw force from both the opposites, that is, from both ends of the pendulum. You will find by practice that it is not enough, or indeed possible, to draw force from one opposite. The two opposites are connected, like the two sides of a penny, and one in one you must remember the other. If you let yourself identify mechanically with each of the two opposites in turn, that is, with one side, and then the other side of the emotional pendulum, wholly believing each with your whole feeling of, I, you will remain helplessly on the pendulum, swinging to, and fro from excitement to depression, from depression to excitement. Emotionally you will be mechanical. You will not be living consciously in relation to your emotional center, but living mechanically, and becoming every mood at presence. It is important to see this. People remain blind to it. They simply are their states and cannot separate. But if you are learning to draw force both from the excited side and the depressed side by remembering yourself in each, and remembering its opposite, and to some extent practice this in daily and in weekly life, you are beginning to live a little consciously. You must form a weekly memory as well as a daily one. Only you must not show what you are up to, as by sitting motionless, or staring heavily at nothing, no doubt with a beautiful picture of yourself being so steady, or hoping people will notice how calm you are. Anything like that ruins one's personal work on oneself, as I have often witnessed. 
The reason is that it strengthens false personality the very thing that has to be loosened and stripped away, garment by garment, before anything real can be uncovered on which the work can truly found itself. You will have noticed how the eyes composing false personality demand an audience, and how it tempts you to show off, or to show off by not showing off. Very small children seem to me to be able to play a silent absorption without an audience, but adults praise them, and tell them they are clever so that essential phase is soon over. We can understand then that such an important form of personal work as drawing force from the opposites through self-remembering, and remembering is to be approached with internal understanding, and done in silence. Here indeed the significance of not letting the left hand know what the right is doing comes in the external side of a man turned towards life the outer man composed of little eyes, teeming, and talking, in the small parts of centers cannot possibly draw force from both ends of the pendulum swing. These eyes swing with it. They have no anchor that holds. It is only observing eye that does not swing with the pendulum and that has to be strengthened. I explained elsewhere that this means that one's relationship to the observing eye must be strengthened for it is not anchored to the waves. In short, one must practice, and daily at least, the exercise of observing oneself impartially without the soapy foam of self-justifying. As we are talking of the emotional pendulum, and taking it, as one pendulum, for the sake of simplification, it must now be pointed out, that the observation of one's emotional state must not be limited to the emotional state of the moment. M. R. Alspence he used to emphasize that the whole swing of the pendulum must be observed from one state to its opposite, and one of his customary replies to examples given at groups, in this connection was simply incomplete observation people did not grasp sufficiently that you cannot have one emotion without its opposite, which is often a curious one. I speak of the sphere of mechanical emotions, which is under the law of the pendulum, and this law operates in all things temporal, in the events of life as well, as in ourselves. I remind you again of the phrase in Ecclesiasticus, all things are double, one against another, that is, in sequence in time. So you cannot have joy without sorrow, which I doubt, as being opposites any more than you can have positive electricity without negative, or a magnet without opposite poles, or a stick with only one end. But in self-study by means of self-observation we find it very difficult to observe that any particular emotional state is connected with its opposite, or what its opposite is. A particular emotional state appears to be a thing in itself, that has nothing to do with any other state. Now the inability to realize that it has, is one factor, in rendering us so peculiarly helpless in face of our emotional life, and so much under its sway. We are unconscious just where the pendulum, in its return journey, gains momentum, and, passing the midpoint, swings into the sphere of influence of the opposite emotional state apparently, indeed, into another country. We fail to see any connection. There is, in fact, no logical connection. The two countries seem totally dissimilar. That is exactly why the work tells us that we have to observe the whole swing from one extreme to the other in order to discover our particular opposites. This means an increase in consciousness of which we have often spoken before. An increase in consciousness in regard to our emotional life through the making of the opposites conscious by following the swing in time, and so seeing how they are connected, shifts consciousness gradually towards the middle zone of the pendulum, to a third place lying between the opposites which becomes receptive of new emotions not on the pendulum. We acquire a middle. Let me add one thing. If you can observe the pendulum through a full swing you will be sometimes astonished at what the opposite of any particular state turns out to be and so realize why you could not get released. Amwell, 29.3.52 First conscious shock self-remembering, and the sensual mind. Essence comes down from above and clothes itself in a body which it builds out of materials obtained from both parents and limited to them. Through the body essence gets in contact with the world. The body bears in it what is hereditary from the parents. The body itself is in three dimensions. What is hereditary is in the fourth dimension, that is, in time, in the line of ancestors. The essence, though intimately connected with the body, is not the same as the body. The body perishes, but the essence does not. When, through one of the many fallacies of the sensual mind, we take ourselves as our bodies, we get a wrong impression of ourselves. One result of this is that we cannot remember ourselves. This is because we take the visible body as ourself and cannot get any other idea of ourself, 
but a sensual one, because for the sensual mind only what can be apprehended by the external senses exists. For it, therefore, the death of the body is the end of the man, and anything said to the contrary is rubbish. I one sightly began to make a collection of the epithets typically used by sensual folk. Rubbish, fairy stories, poppycock, bunkum, drivel, sheer rot, absolute balderdash, damn fantasies, childish nonsense, and so on. Of course, the idea of essence is nonsense. One cannot see it. One can never see what orders things. Now the sensual mind in us is not able to admit that the three-dimensional natural world definitely depends on and is ordered from a supernatural one in other dimensions. Nor can it grasp that essence enters and leaves by a dimension not accessible to our very limited senses. But the mind that can think psychologically can grasp this. It also enables us to remember ourselves. I have pointed out to you often that the Lord's Prayer begins with self-remembering for any prayer that does not is fraudulent and a pious waste of time. It says, Our Father which art in heaven. It ignores completely the Father who provided half the building material for our bodies. It is speaking of essence which has no Father here. Now when we begin to see all this with our internal understanding, we are beginning to remember ourselves. The sensual mind, based solely on the evidence of the senses, on being told of such matters will deny them and cannot do otherwise. Actually such things should not be told them, save in parables, or in the rather indirect way, that the work uses. Here the following words can be quoted, I speak in parables, because seeing they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And another phrase, used elsewhere, but again referring to the sensual-minded, the world cannot receive the spirit of truth because it seeks not, and knoweth not him. We can realize then how necessary it is to develop psychological thinking, that passes beyond sense, so, as to grasp that we have two sources of origin, or two fathers, one connected with the body, and the other with the essence, which the sensual neither seeks, nor knows. This makes self-remembering possible. Now a man cannot change, cannot undergo psychotransformism, unless his mind changes, and his mind cannot change unless the universe changes for him, and unless his feeling of I changes. Register this carefully, and reflect. To have the same thoughts and the same views of the world, and the same feeling of I, as you always had means that you are just the same as you always were, and if you think otherwise you are deceiving yourself. This we all love to do. Change definitely means change, and in this case change means to change yourself, in every direction. If you change, the universe will change, and your feeling of I will change. Now if you think from the ideas that the work teaches you, you begin to think differently, and that is the starting point of everything else. This work is to teach you to think in a new way, both about what you are, and about what the world is. How many hear that, but do not hear? MRO was told in his experiments on changing the feeling of I temporarily and artificially after he had passed through the zone inhabited by confidence tricksters, that is, by eyes that lie to him and try to entice and fool him, as they do so many that he must think in other categories. This means to think in a new way. He was shown, for example, that he could no longer think of himself as he always had. Another category was necessary. You may remember that when, under the influence of the drug, he had passed what he called the second threshold, he had the feeling that he had come in contact with another person who was himself. He says, I came in contact with myself, with the self that was always with me and always told me something that I could not understand and could not even hear in ordinary states of consciousness. Why? Because in the ordinary state thousands of voices at once are creating what we call our consciousness. Our thoughts, our feelings, our moods, our imagination. These voices drown the sound of that inner voice. He adds that only when the clamor of these eyes is stilled by some means can that other voice be heard. In my case this will be myself, not Nicole. Now the sensual mind in ourselves is very powerful. It often masters us for days. It says, I am Nicole. For it, there can be no other self but the bodily self and the visible brain. There can be no self connected with essence, distinct in origin from the bodily self. The piano and the pianist are the same. To think otherwise would be to think in a non-sensual category about oneself. Yet I know by experience, 
that there is in me another person more essential and real than Nicole. This person, which is myself, does not speak my language. For that reason I find it necessary to try to study his language, which is not national one, and which sometimes is expressed merely by changing feelings, delicate and colored, like flowers, on which Nicole treads with hobnails, and sometimes by things and people seen, as in a play, and sometimes by sudden meanings, without words, that connect things together. What this person, who is myself, communicates to me seems never to be put in clear simple unmistakable terms of yes or no, but presented in a high form of paradox very irritating to the sensual practical mind. Amwell 3.4.52 An exercise in thinking about the pendulum. Through the action of the law of the pendulum the violence that a man does to others returns on himself. History abundantly illustrates this. The saying, therefore, that we should do unto others, as we would that they should do unto us is connected with one aspect, of freeing oneself from this law to which mechanical man is subject. One-sided behavior, characteristic of mechanical man, puts him under the law of the pendulum. It will excite the opposite in the sense of what I do will be done to me this must be the meaning of the saying that those who live by the sword shall perish by the sword. Now we are not to limit the action of the law of the pendulum to a single life. MRO told some of us that, when asked about recurrence, G had replied, it is something like this, the executed becomes the executioner, the execu owner becomes the executed. In short, the situation is reversed. Passive becomes active and active becomes passive. The situation is turned the other way round. Now mentally it is possible to turn things the other way round, only most people obstinately refuse to do so in this respect we are taught as an exercise to increase consciousness, to try sometimes to take consciously the opposite view, to the one we mechanically take. This is including the opposite, but not rejecting the other viewpoint. It is bringing the opposites together towards the middle, by including both sides in consciousness. It is not a conversion into the contrary, but a recognition of it. It is a very useful exercise, if from time to time one really does it. It widens the range of the mind, as an exercise it is related to the practice of external considering. Among many other blessings, to be increasingly conscious of both sides of the pendulum decreases violence. For example, one can be plagued by a sudden attack of violent thinking and feeling. When this occurs one is obviously identified with an extreme position of the pendulum. What, then, is the opposite that one must summon into the consciousness to balance matters, if one wishes to work on this unpleasant state? To call up the conventional opposite, that is, to picture oneself filled with gentleness and tolerance, as one remembers one was, say, yesterday, is not likely to prove the effective opposite that will give release. The effort may simply aggravate the state. Where is the effective opposite to be found? The answer is that it will be found in what you do not include in your feeling of yourself. In a recent paper on the pendulum it was remarked that the opposite is often curious and not at all what one would suppose. For according to the common use of words one would expect a violent man to be in some sense the opposite of a man who is gentle. In the above example taking myself as the victim of a sudden attack of violence I find gentleness is not the effective opposite. If it were it should neutralize the violence through my work memory of gentle states, in myself that is, through my consciously remembering gentler states that I have observed and connected with the memory of observing I but I am supposing that this has had no result, and that I realize I am in danger of descending into some really negative state or other from which I have learned to pray to be delivered. Now, my effort to save myself by making myself conscious in the opposite could not have any result, because in this case the opposite is not gentleness but something that I am not conscious of and so do not include in my estimation of myself. Therefore it is only when I behold in myself what has roused my violence in another person that the storm vanishes, as by magic. The opposites here are between what I am conscious of in another and what I am conscious of in myself. If these two factors in two people were equal, they would cancel each other out and the two people would be at peace with one another but each would have to include far more in their own consciousness of themselves to reach this degree of conscious relationship to one another. The opposites that I am dealing with here are therefore the great ones of light and darkness. For what I am conscious of is in the light, and what I am unconscious of is in the darkness, and these two are mighty powers at variance with one another. 
Throughout ancient history you find myths about this struggle between light and darkness, of the hero as light contending with the dragon of darkness, or being temporarily swallowed by the monster and cutting his way out, and so on. The work teaches that we are not properly conscious. It indicates that the supreme aim is to increase consciousness. As we are, we belong to the people who live in darkness and shun the light. We will not face ourselves. We refuse to see. We change the subject or justify ourselves. Now what lies in your own darkness has a strange power over you. It keeps on influencing you, and however you seem to resist, it overpowers you. At intervals its secret will paralyzes the conscious will. Only the hero, consciousness, can contend with its dragon power. The hero lives, to begin with, in that camera by which we can observe ourselves, and thereby begin to widen and so increase our consciousness of ourselves. One is actually taught that to observe oneself is to let a ray of light into one's inner darkness, that is, into what one is unconscious of and so what one does not include in the customary feeling of oneself. Oh! This accursed artificial thing oneself, this oversensitive bundle, this silly excerpt, that causes so much trouble and which possesses us without our seeing it. Now the more one's consciousness widens, the more it includes, and the fewer will be the opposites, and so the less will one's spiritual existence be at the mercy of swinging pendulums. This oneself is notably exclusive. It is extraordinarily exclusive. It will not include the other side of the penny in consciousness. Certainly, one should hate this oneself, which is a lie. The self-love runs into it. But the self-love should have a far better goal, for this oneself, that gives rise to so many unnecessary opposites, in us by its stubborn refusal, to include anything more than it does in the consciousness, is not the self that we ultimately come into when consciousness is widened sufficiently, and the boundaries of the silly little oneself are swept away. In conclusion I will try to make this exercise, in thinking easier, and will put the matter a little differently. The antithesis really seems to be between, he is a fool I am not a fool. I fabricate this pair of opposites so that the more I conceive myself as not being a fool, the more my violence is kept going against him for being so great a fool. Now the root of the matter is my feeling of superiority. To try to bring up gentleness, or a vision of non-violence will not therefore neutralize my attack of violence. If I become conscious that the fool I behold in him is also in me the antithesis becomes, he is a fool I am also a fool. These are not opposites, so that the antithesis vanishes. Amwell, Easter, 10.4.52 The Connection of Essence with Esotericism In the work it is necessary to think in a new way. It is repeatedly said, that this work is to make us think in a new way. If we do not do so, nothing happens. We remain dead to the action of the work, for if we do not think the work, it cannot think in us to begin to think the work is to begin to think in a new way. It is therefore necessary to begin to think for ourselves about some of the things that the work teaches. This means that one must start thinking quietly and internally about, say, one or two of the ideas that belong to this system of teaching and follow a train of thought about them and make connections between them tentatively people are so busy that very few do this. They are so much in external things. To listen is one thing, to think another. One is external, the other internal. Now the work is made up of many different ideas, some of greater and some of less density of meaning. If one thinks about them, they open out their meaning to the mind. Meaning comes by thinking. These ideas, all of different colors, are blended together to form a single internal light as are the colors of the visible spectrum, to form white light. To change the image, the work can be thought of as something organized from many different parts, as is the body to form an organic whole or unity. The work is a unity. Actually it is a living whole, but it only becomes a living whole when it is taken in by the mind with some degree of grace and gradually connected uprightly by thought and memory and by hearing it taught time after time. Then it becomes a living whole, a light in you. Otherwise it remains something outside you, on the blackboard, and soon becomes jargon. It remains dead as far as you are concerned, for making contact with the work is an internal matter. Now if it is muddled up and wrongly connected, or if only random bits of it are taken in, it cannot do its work in you, save feebly, just as a radio cannot transmit vibrations clearly from a source not visible to sense if parts of it are missing, 
or wrongly connected, or the batteries exhaust themselves by various short circuits, as in our case negative emotions do, amongst other things. The matter, then, is as simple as that. The work is a mental instrument to connect the human race with higher centers. It can be fitted into the mind, and if rightly connected up can transform thinking by changing the powers of reception. Two sanctions, however, are required for this to happen. The first is that a man must be willing to take it in, otherwise it will not be able to enter him. If his mind is shut to everything save the cares and interests of external life, however hard the work knocks at his door, it will not be permitted to enter. The man has freedom of choice here. In a second, if a work has been permitted entry, then, after a time, which varies greatly in different people, the man must begin to will to do it. He must begin to do its truth. The man has freedom of choice here. These two choices depend on a man's inner sanctioning. Now all true esoteric teaching exists because man is asleep and can awaken. That is why the Gospels exist. That is why this work, which is a reformulation, and called sometimes esoteric Christianity, exists. But a man cannot be persuaded or dazzled by miracles, or compelled by force to awaken. He himself can only awaken himself. And this he can only do if he gives the two sanctions mentioned not externally, but internally, not from the outer man, but from the inner man, not from the surface man, the man of false personality, and the imitation man the man of appearances, but from the essential, hidden man. Otherwise the work will only increase the action of personality, and render essence more remote and passive than ever. Only the simplest and, as it were, most innocent, unsophisticated and real side of a man can receive esoteric teaching aright, and this is what is meant by whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God, as a little child shall in no wise enter there in Luke's fifty point one seven. By the little child is meant essence. Esoteric teaching must reach essence. Esoteric teaching is always about the kingdom of God. It is always about inner development possible to man namely, the growth of essence. And essence cannot grow, unless it is fertilized by the word of God. If you still expect some marvelous mystical experience, and that is the reason you attend the work talks, you are working from the wrong love, and you will only neglect what your real work should be in preparing lower centers, and flatter your false personality. When the work penetrates through layer after layer of the acquired personality to the inborn essence, the essence begins to become active. The spermatic word of esotericism impregnates it, and it begins to grow and develop. Essence in us is like the germinal spot in an egg. Personality is comparable to the yolk and the white. If the egg is fertilized the germinal spot grows and eats up the yolk and the white and a living creature results. But if it is not fertilized it remains an egg. So is the case with man. Now let us think in a new way, as we said according to what the work teaches. What has just been spoken of can form a starting point of thinking from one or two of the ideas of the work. We are told that man is an undeveloped organism composed of born essence and acquired personality, and that essence is passive and personality is active, and that it is life, as a neutralizing force, that keeps this relationship going. We are told that if the work becomes neutralizing force the position is reversed namely, essence becomes gradually active and personality gradually passive. If you think for yourself, you will see that this means that a man will live and die unfulfilled like an unfulfilled egg. As long as life only acts on him, for his essence is the germinal spot in him, and only esotericism can stir it into activity and growth. We have already spoken of the man, who takes in and eventually wills, and does the work, through his own choice. In such a man the work has now begun to become the neutralizing force, and the relation between essence and personality has begun to become reversed. If you think for yourself from this work idea, that has such a great density of meaning, that I find it inexhaustible, you will be thinking in a new way. Your mind will begin to move, hesitatingly at first, along new paths, and you will see many things, that you could not see before, when your mind only moved narrowly along its old habitual grooves. It is very good and very refreshing for the mind to think in a new way. It is like stepping off a noisy high road, and wandering into the countryside. If your thinking is very conventional, you may feel quite awkward at first and perhaps even guilty. But after a time, you may meet a small child. Curiously enough, the child may seem to know you. 
Amwell, 19.4.52. Choose in the work part I. Each of you has a different life memory, but you will find that your work memories become much the same. Our experiences in life are various, but our experiences in this work are very similar. We can realize that directions in life are many, but this work points in one direction. It is just because it points in one direction that work experiences tend to be similar, and thus work memories become more or less similar. Let us reflect on this for a moment. In life we are not taught we are asleep. We take it for granted that we are awake and fully conscious and that we act consciously. In the work we hear of a quite new and startling idea. We are, in fact, told a mystery. We are taught that we are asleep and do not know it. We are not properly conscious. We act mechanically. In the light of this mystery our life memories are the memories of sleeping persons, of people wandering in the dark, of sleepwalkers. But when we begin to follow and later obey the work, our memories become those of people beginning to awaken. Another memory has formed a work memory. These work memories are not like our very different life memories. They are similar simply because the successive stages of awakening are similar, like in stationed along a common road to road which leads eventually to an uncommon sea. This is the reason why we find in writers of all ages records of similar experiences. But when what I have called the uncommon sea is reached and embarked upon, a man disappears from human range. If he has left any records behind him, they are only about the journey as far as the shore. But once he embarks if he does nothing after his or can be recorded. Now let us suppose he leaves some record, in his own language and symbolism, concerning the journey to the sea. For example, he might leave instructions saying it was necessary, first of all, to find a shop where real leather can be bought, out of which he must then devise shoes with which to walk on this journey, and that he must never let any mud on them touch his eyes for it will endanger his sight, and also he must procure a musical instrument on which he must patiently learn to make and invent various harmonies, and often play them in different ways, and never forget them, especially when he is tired. Now let us leave any discussion of the significance of each of these instructions for the moment in order to recall that in connection with the successive stages of awakening, the work teaches that we are in prison, and that as long as we remain asleep we remain in prison. It says that there are some who have found the way out and left behind instructions in code for others who desire to follow them. This idea is not peculiar to the work. It is a very ancient image of man's situation on earth. Now people do not see that they are in prison, just as they do not see that they are asleep. So they do not know that they have a prison psychology and are sleepwalkers, though later they may come to see it. People may attend talks about the work year in and year out and never realize the living truth of either of these two statements, partly because they do not observe themselves and partly because they take them sensually. They see the discomforts of their lives, the lack of money, the shortcomings of others, and so on, but do not realize that the work means that all people, high and low, whatever they possess and whoever they may be, are in prison and are asleep and that this is why life goes as it does, like a tale told by an idiot. Not seeing any literal walls, or hearing snores, the very sensual-minded think the ideas are far-fetched. They cannot see their psychological meaning. They go on in their habitual ways, being upset and worried and negative, and following illusory schemes and ambitions, and worshipping endless varieties of false values, never seeing that these things form their prison walls, and that certain eyes are their jailers. The sense-based mind blinds them and, as usual, sensual meaning crucifies psychological meaning. So they assert they are not asleep, nor in prison. Nevertheless everyone is. Let us now take the shoes mentioned in the instructions left by the man, who reached the sea actually, and not in a dream. If the image of a man getting out of prison had been used, the language or symbolism would have been different, but the meaning the same. First, what are the shoes? Of course, literal shoes are not meant, or literal leather. Psychological shoes are meant not to be worn on the literal feet, but the feet of the psychological man. The psychological feet are where the psychological man touches life. In this work we have to walk in life differently from the way we once walked. We are taught how to use the daily events of life as the means of work on oneself. For instance, we are told not to identify now it is obvious that a man practicing non-identifying is walking through life in a different way from a man 
who is mechanically identified with everything. This can be expressed by using the sense image of a man walking in self-made shoes of special leather. Like all parables, this will not appeal to the sensual mind. But the meaning is not sensual but psychological, and it is just here that the holy sensual person fails to jump up to the psychological meaning. Now we are told that we gradually have to insulate ourselves more and more from the influences of life otherwise we continually lose force. To awaken we must conserve force. We must always be working on one center, or on another, or on another. A man without force cannot awaken. Life can completely exhaust us daily if we do not walk more consciously through it. In this connection, in addition to holding oneself away from the powerful attraction of states of being identified and not letting things constantly reach the blood, the work teaches self-observation, which leads to increasing knowledge of our being, diminishing, and stopping internal considering, and finally, self-remembering, which is above all the rest. All these help to insulate us if we do these things we walk through life in new shoes in work shoes, not life shoes. I repeat, if we do them. The first requisite then is to find where the right leather is sold. The second requisite is to make for oneself shoes of this leather, and begin to walk in life wearing them not an easy job. Try to grasp what these shoes mean. What I may term a code word is being used here. Grasp that nothing literal is meant. Abstract from the sense meaning. If this is never done, one will stick in the work. Psychological thinking is necessary for this work as saw. If it is kept at the level of the sensual mind it cannot become live in you. Both the Old and the New Testaments shout this aloud. When it is said, for example, that the horses of Egypt are flesh, not spirit, even if we are told that horse is a code word for the intellect, we do not quite see what is meant. Next time we will discuss the remaining instructions. Amwell 26.4.52 Shoes in the work part type mud, in the eye. Being by the bias of our senses sensually minded, we accept the idea of the psychological man with the greatest difficulty. But the organized psychological man is a possibility as well as the given organized physical man, but quite distinct from it. We can admit that what a man is psychologically is distinct from what a man is physically, and that in this work it is necessary to look at the psychological man or the psychological woman, even though there may be little enough to look at save a set of habits, conventions, clichés, and gramophone records. But when I speak of the psychological man I mean a person organized psychologically. Everyone has some kind of psychology, but not an organized one. Now the organization of the physical man or woman is given free. Men and women are presented with their bodies, with their rather different and complex machineries, and their 15 billion brain cells, and all the rest ready-made. At first they are open to the senses, and so the sensual level begins to be formed. The sensual level as it were forms the feet or basis of the subsequent mind. It is made of psychological matters, distinct from the matters of the physical body, but unorganized. It is formed where the dawning of consciousness touches the strange foreign, never grasped thing called the external world, and is filled with the emotion of wonder. As the sensual mind grows, it relates the person more and more to external life. The child learns to get about, take things more and more for granted, and gives up wondering. In this manner the eventual thinking tends to become based mostly on the senses, and, stripped of wonder, the seen world becomes the real, commonplace world. The sensual-minded man results the man influenced by life influences, by the evidence of the senses, by influences, who has no window opening on to be influences. Having sensual thinking and no psychological thinking he is not balanced. He can never become number four man. He is unbalanced. Physically he is a man. Psychologically he is not a man. This is the man-machine the work speaks of who has no real psychology. How? asked G. Can a machine have a psychology? A balanced man, in the work sense, must have both sensual and psychological thinking. Also he must try to perfect both as far as is possible to him. Throughout his life he must move in both these directions. Unless he does he will become one-sided in either one way, or the other way. Put briefly, one relates him to the world, the other to higher centers. What we now have to understand is that sensual thinking does not and cannot relate us to higher centers or lead to the organization of the psychological man. 
we cannot remember ourselves aright if we have only sensual thinking, and so cannot transform impressions by seeing things differently in another light than sunlight. Nor can we have any other aim, and life aim, such as power, possessions, adoration, fame, and so on. Notice, in passing, that in the first recorded temptation of Christ, power, and possessions are mentioned. Life and life aims are personified, as the devil, who says after showing him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will. I give it. If thou wilt therefore worship me, all shall be thine. Luke IV. 6, 7. This work is to teach us psychological thinking, and work aims, and eventually, if live, to organize the psychological man in us whom life does not organize. When we begin to assimilate some of the ideas of the work, and think from them about life we begin to transform the meaning of life by seeing it through the mental eyesight of greater mind instead of the sight of our sensual mind. We have to imitate the thinking of conscious man. Last time we spoke of the necessity of making shoes for ourselves out of the special leather this work sells. For example, if we are shod with the idea of inner separating from identifying, we will begin to walk through the day's events in a psychological way, and not sensually only. The ideas of self-observation, non-identifying, non-considering, and so on, belong to psychological, not sensual, thinking. They are additions to and different from sense thinking, and put us on another level. But we are also beginning to form the basis or feet of the psychological man in ourselves to do nothing towards insulating ourselves from mechanical reactions to life, to react to every object of the senses, and every situation, makes the organization of the second man the man not given to us ready-made that is, the psychological man impossible. The sensual man will win every time. Psychological shoes must be made to protect us from life. The work ideas and teaching form the leather one must bite. The thinking and the living of them form the shoes, this can only be done by you. I cannot make your shoes. I can sell you leather. But to some extent I can tell you if you are making shoes wrongly, stitching them stupidly, or if you have not yet attempted to make any shoes at all, not having taken anything and even after years. Now since sensual thinking and psychological thinking are on different levels, one must not mix them. This is what that instruction meant, given in the previous paper that we must not let any mud on our shoes touch our eyes. Realize, please, that the sensual mind is at enmity with the psychological mind. Life seen materially seeks to injure and destroy life seen spiritually. So later we become tempted by the evidence of things seen, by the obvious, in short, by life only, which seeks to hold us imprisoned in the sensual mind. We then begin to know what effort really means and where it lies. That the senses will always war against the spirit is indicated in the allegory given in Genesis. It is said that God cursed the serpent, after he had beguiled the woman, and said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis III.15 The serpent doomed to crawl on his belly symbolizes the sensual mind separated now from all else. It bites the heel or lowest level of the psychological man and he bruises its head, the intellect based only on the senses. Now when I gradually develop my psychological thinking through the ideas of the work, I see life in a manner quite different from what my sensual thinking led me to suppose. I see life as a thing to work on. I see it as a means to Anand I had never realized. I no longer see it as Anand in itself. The question, then, at any particular time, is, can I take this or that experience? without being overwhelmed, totally identified, even broken. Or can I take it as work? Is the psychological man in me yet strong enough? He will become so if you hold on to the rope, for then he will be given strength. But this needs effort and again effort. Only in the slight shed by the work can everything have present or future meaning for you, and all that happens to you will be the shock you need just then, and you will see this on looking back years later, what we cannot see with the sensual mind is that if we work, then something begins to work continually and closely on us, and often very drastically, for the issue is a great one, and nothing trivial to be treated as of little account. Amwell 3.5.52 Psychological Thinking and the Kingdom of Heaven
Contemplating the idea of psychological thinking as distinct from sensual thinking, we can see that the interpretations of the senses must not smear, as with mud the understanding of what is not a matter of the senses. For example, we do not see God. His existence is not evident to any of our outer senses. I cannot see him with my eyesight, or hear him with my ears, or touch him with my hand. Since God is not an object of the senses, my sensual mind will deny his existence, because sensual thinking is based on the evidence of the senses, and none of my senses shows me that God exists. I will admit the existence of the sun, because I can see it, but not the existence of a creator, for I see no creator anywhere even with a telescope, so I can't think in terms of the existence of the sun, and the stars for I see them plainly, but the idea of their being created strikes me as nonsense. The existence of God, however, can be understood even though it is not seen. This is where psychological thinking comes in it is another level. It is distinct from sensual thinking. In this example, to mix them is like smearing mud on the eyes. Now what does the mud mean and what do the eyes mean here? Not literal mud nor literal eyes are meant. Christ indicated to his disciples that for them it was only necessary to wash the feet and this was enacted for them. Notice this carefully. Their actual feet, visible to sense, were washed with actual water visible to sense. So a person might continue performing the ceremony for the rest of his life, thinking thereby to reach paradise in the end. While I think, from experience elsewhere, that washing the feet literally is an excellent and neighborly practice, I do not think that it leads to the kingdom of God. Nor do I think that any other religious ceremonial is of the slightest value, in this respect, if it is taken sensually and not psychologically. Christ, who taught psychological thinking as the key to the kingdom, and showed that the Baptist had not attained it, had a good deal to say about this matter, and said it sometimes in words of withering sarcasm. He also dumbfounded the sneering masses of surrounding sensualists, rigid in self-pride, by telling them that the kingdom of heaven was within them and not a visible thing. He said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here, or, Lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Luke XVII.20.21 It was a state, not a place. Now if the kingdom is within a man, the fulfillment of a man's development, which is the attainment of the conscious circle of humanity, is in an inward direction. That is, it is in a psychological direction. It follows, therefore, that sensual thinking will not discover it, and that only psychological thinking will. Therefore to begin with I shall have to ascertain what kind of man I am, psychologically, and not what kind of man I appear to be physically, or socially. I will have to study what psychological things are in me that will prevent me from any development, in the right direction, and for this I will need instructions often repeated, for they seem curiously difficult to remember and occasionally expert advice. Whoever I am, I will be taught that what life has made me will not render me thereby acceptable to the conscious circle of humanity, because, for one reason, life will have made me one-sided. Now when, and if I begin to make sincerely a psychological approach to myself, and slowly very slowly make an inventory of various psychological things, in myself such as self-love, self-vanity, and self-pride, which are three very cruel lords, that true in one's peace of mind I will realize very slowly that they may hinder my development, and with the aid of the repeated instructions and repeated teaching of the work may even see why this will be the case. I am then thinking psychologically. I am thinking psychologically about this thing called myself that I have taken for granted hitherto. I am even beginning to understand something of the meaning of the words, the kingdom of God is within you. Now I will find that whenever I allow my previous sensual thinking about myself to mix up with my psychological thinking of myself which is being formed in me, it will swamp the latter. I must keep them separate, or else there will be, as it were, a flood, and if one has not attempted to build an ark, it may lead to one's psychological death. If the ark that the work eventually constructs with your help is not seaworthy, there will be a period of danger. One tires of the work, especially when one is not tired. One has no time. It is all too vague, as if it ever were. The upper mill grinds more and more slowly that is, one psychological thinking slows, and almost ceases. It is unnecessary to play one's musical instrument, and strike one or two chords that make harmony, and remove dissonance. 
for it is a long time before the psychological mind is stronger than the sensual mind, and the evidence of things not seen stronger than the evidence of things seen. But this reversal is possible. In regard to the musical chords that set the psychological thinking going again I will only say here that there are things that one can remember and things that one can forget and things that one can read and re-read and things one must simply hold on to until the life thinking temptation leaves one for a season. The temptation is, of course, intelligent and necessary. In dealing with Saul, whom you can perhaps recognize, David used a harp not once but on many occasions. Orpheus stained animals with his lute. Also, I understand that the angels often play on musical instruments and very beautifully. But I doubt if these instruments are to be understood sensually any more than our work shoes that I have spoken about. They are not literal musical instruments nor are they literal leather shoes. As was once said, the devil is also necessary. The devil is the sensual mind. When you see the intention of the work in tempting you, and realize that it is necessary, you strike a chord on your musical instrument, which of course must have more than one string. Amwell, 10.5.52 Psychological Space? Man is both in time and out of time. Now the sensual mind is based on time and space, but not the psychological mind. We can say that only partial truth is accessible to the sensual mind. Truth is comparable to an inexhaustible sack of silver from which a few coins have escaped, while the rest is guarded. As we shall see, this is only another way of saying that the sensual thinking cannot grasp what only the psychological thinking can. The more a man's thought can expand beyond the senses and their evidence, the more truth he gets from the sack. Now a word as to truth whose quality is intimately connected with the good in a man. We can change good, such as charity, into truth, that is, esoterically expressed, gold into silver so good householder is the necessary starting point for the work. We cannot change evil, such as hatred, into truth. It breeds lies only. Now truth is only changed into gold by willing it, and therefore loving it, and, and therefore living it for we do what we love to do and will what we love. We have, therefore, to make work shoes so that we will and love and live the work in daily life as simply as possible. I must say here in parenthesis that the level of good householder, in a practical sense may not yet have been sufficiently attained, in which case a person's work will be in adapting better to life through training the sensual mind with effort where it is lacking to a handicapping extent. This will be his or her work for the time being. An important point to grasp here is that if the necessity of such an effort is personally observed, realized, clearly understood and accepted, results will very soon appear. This is partly because it is willed individually and therefore is not done from outer compulsion or from fear or with a sense of grievance and partly because the work will find a way to help if there is sufficient valuation of it. For when you do a thing from and for the work it will be present with you in what you do, but not otherwise. From valuation comes affection, and affection attracts presence. Cold-heartedness and cold-mindedness can only repel the work. This is obvious enough on reflection. Now, to return to truth. There is psychological, and there is sensual truth. They overlap, but are not one and the same. We shall have to discuss these elsewhere, but it can be said here that it is psychological truth chiefly that can change our being, and not sensual truth. Sensual truth is conceived in terms of time and of three-dimensional space, because the senses only register in the present moment of time and space. I cannot see you yesterday in your room. I can only remember a little. I cannot hear what you said upstairs a little while ago. I can only remember a little. I cannot touch you a moment ago when you were sitting in that chair, for you have gone out now. I can touch the chair, which is still in the present moment of space for me, but not for you. Both time and space separate us, when I go out the street is now in the present moment of space and I see you again. We are now both in another part of space, and in another part of time. Thus do my external senses work always in the flipping present moment of time, and in three-dimensional space, common to us all? All this requires thinking about often, for it is very strange although people do not notice it. Now since I love you, you are always near or present to me yes, but in some other world, some other space, not common to us all, quite distinct from the common external world registered by sense, but somehow quite, or even more real. 
Now in which, or in what, dimension does this other world lie, in which you continue to exist psychologically for me, so that I seem sometimes even to be able to speak to you? Or how is it that I can dream quite clearly that we are walking, or speaking together in the morning on a hillside? In what time and in what space does this happen? Certainly not in the time and space, on which our outer senses open. Now let us shift the line of argument. I will ask you in what dimension is your memory. Again I will ask how many dimensions has your thought? Has it length, breadth, and height? Can you speak of a long thought or a broad one, or a high one? Is it three-dimensional as your body is, and the chair you are sitting on? Yet your thought is real to you. You may be plunged in thought without being aware of either time or space. Where are you then? Your consciousness is undoubtedly somewhere. Certainly your body remains in the dimension of time and space common to us all. It is visible and tangible to sense. But your thought is invisible and intangible to sense, and yet it exists, and is real. We conclude therefore, that dimensions exist, and are open to us inwardly apart from the dimensions on which our senses open outwardly, and in which our bodies, and the world exist. Each person has a private space. Now in this inner or private space, which each person has, thought and feeling, and not muscles bring about movement. For example, affection brings about presence or nearness in this inner space. Dislike will do the reverse. Affection is a state. Love is a state. Dislike is a state. Hate is a state. To feel affection, or to love is to be in a particular state, and the particular state you are in will be in this inner or private space of yours, and not an outer or public space. That is why I said above that valuation and affection make the work present. Indifference or dislike removes it to a distance. Yes, but to a distance in this inner private space of yours, not in external space. For you may be sitting at a meeting, disliking it all, and yet present in space. Now as long as I feel affection for a person I am in a certain state, that continues, and the person is present or near an inner space. Externally, to my senses, the person may be present at one time, and absent at another time, but not so internally. It would seem therefore, that in this inner space, that is private to me, there is no time, as we understand it sensually. In place of ever changing, and ever passing time there is state. We get, therefore, a glimpse of something in us that is outside time namely, state, and inner space. That is why it was said at the beginning of the paper that we are both in time and out of time. If nothing is transformed beyond the sense-based level, we are mainly in time. How much of us is outside time will depend how much we are governed by outer time and space, and the external senses and sensual mind, and how much we can enter and organize inner space by good states and keep and feel this place separate and distinct from the jarring of everyday things. I will only add here that this inner, private space is sometimes represented by a room that we never discovered or knew to exist. We have, therefore, to distinguish by observation, thought, feeling, and inner taste the two spaces. Amwell 17.5.52 Self-glory? We speak today of self-glorifying. For example, some use their sex for self-glorification. This increases their inner uneasiness, and so makes them restless or tired. For this is always the result when every action is mixed with too much self-glory. When what one does is quite secondary to the satisfaction of self-glory one's life is uneasy. If you observe this feature enough in yourself, you will see it in others. Sometimes it looks like a bubble filled with a transparent blue in which the person is moving without noticing what he is and sometimes it appears as a top hay house being built on sand close to the sea or on a cliffside. There are very many sensual images that are used to represent the psychological or inner state of doing everything mainly for the glorification of oneself. This is natural enough, because it is the commonest psychological state on earth. On the reverse side, accompanying self-glorification, are a great number and variety of pictures which stimulate us to the pursuit of self-glory. Do you see that gallant little ship beating up against the furious gale swept by enormous seas with the crew too terrified to come on deck? Do you see who is at the wheel? Well, that's me, or again, do you see that handsome officer strolling about in no man's land, stretching, and yawning, and looking bored, and then turning back to his trench, coolly lighting a cigarette on the way, amid a hail of bullets? Well, that's me too. 
Both these pictures are exhibited in the same gallery. If you say you have outgrown these pictures, I will ask you in what gallery are you now standing, in the Great Earthly Academy of Pictures. I should doubt you if you told me you had left the building. For example, you might without realizing it be standing before pictures of the loveliest or most witty or most fashionable woman, or even of the handsomest or of the best dressed man, or of a great statesman or aristocrat, or famous politician, or a millionaire. Of course, we are not speaking literally, for millionaires and politicians are not attractive to look at usually. But, in any case, you are almost certainly gazing at some picture in your mind, and it is a good thing to get to work and make it conscious by means of candid self-observation. Why is it a good thing to make it conscious through candid self-observation? It is a good thing because if it is left in the shadows, in what is unconscious to you, in that region, that you do not acknowledge and include in your inventory and conception of yourself, it will be constantly at work, in you all the same and, being possessed of the uncontrollable power that unconsciousness gives anything in you that is, all you will not face it may complicate your life, to the point of tragedy. Please do not make the elementary mistake, of thinking that because you are not conscious of a thing it cannot possibly be in you. That is a really childish mistake in this work, but some continue to make it, and so get nowhere. They have, however, the consolation of retaining their own conceit of themselves and so of going out as they came in. Now when self-glory is the main object, the quality of whatever work is performed will be second-rate. This follows because much of the energy that should be employed in the task will pass into grandiose self-imaginings, and only a part into the task on hand. A painter or writer, for instance, who works in the midst of fantasies of becoming famous, dissipates his energy, and his work will suffer, and its quality will reflect the being of the originator. Bear in mind that every psychic act takes force from you. Fantasies absorb a lot of force they drain away force and exhaust people. Fantasies of being great, or having unusual powers, or unusual charms, are commonplace. They are usually compensatory to commonplaceness, and they take a lot of force and use it up quite uselessly. They sap you. For this reason they often prevent a person from attaining what he or she could well attain if he or she could approach things in a simpler or more direct and real way and make conscious and separate from all such grandiose imaginings. I have seen so much unhappiness and misuse arising from such fantasies. They arise from eyes in us which use fantasies to gain power over us so that they can absorb that is, eat our force, and thus live like vermin on us. Some are far more dangerous than others. The only way to escape their power is to observe and observe and observe them more and more clearly, for by this means, by making them conscious, you will eventually separate from them, and once you are separated, by the thickness of a knife blade, they begin to die, like a cut plant. Consciousness is often represented as a knife in ancient symbolism, because it cuts you clear of what is fastened onto you, and draining your force. This image of the true action of consciousness is apt one should reflect humbly at times on the depth of ancient understanding, and the poverty of one's own. It gives right emotions, not complacent self-emotions. Now whatever is done from the basis of self-glory is curious. It is also unclean. It is dishwater, not the clean water of truth but the dirty water of lies. All that you have done from self-glory counts for nothing. It is not real. It cannot raise your level of being. You may have apparently sacrificed yourself, visited and tended the sick from a picture. You have leapt into torrents, rushed into burning houses to save people, bared your arm for a trial injection that may kill you all from a picture. It counts for nothing. It is all founded on pictures and resulting self-glory. Understand again here that consciousness is our only remedy. It cuts away what is clinging to you. You are, unconsciously, acting from a picture without knowing it. You are unconscious of the fact. Let us reflect on pictures again. Many different pictures are in the galleries of the Earthly Academy pictures of great and small heroes, and of martyrs and saints, a gallery devoted to pictures of those whose glory it is to be misunderstood, many pictures of hard-working grim people whose glory it is to hold the home together, upsetting everyone in the process, many pictures, that are rather similar, as of people toiling, and slaving far into the night quite unnecessarily, many of people being so busy, and rushed that you can scarcely see them, and thousands of other pictures, some unpleasant, some criminal. 
Each of these pictures appeals to different people's self-glory. You know criminals glory in their crimes. In every case the person is unconscious that it is a picture that controls him or her. As said, a thing in you that you are unconscious of has great power over you like an invisible magnet. I repeat that the remedy is the light of consciousness. This work is based on increasing the light of consciousness. It is about our becoming more conscious we who live in darkness by self-observation and long work on ourselves. With the strength of the work behind you you will gradually be able to make the secret and often dangerous picture conscious. Like a knife cutting a stem, consciousness will cut you away from that picture. You will be released at last from its power. When dragged into consciousness painfully, at the expense of your self-conceit it loses its power. You gain the force it was eating. Only as long as it is hidden in unconsciousness has it power. Legend says that fairies lose their power when their names are guessed. Try to see your picture and the forms your self-glory takes. Do both together over a long period. What do you glory in? What is your picture this hidden picture you have been serving so long that has misled you and made you unhappy? Note this paper is about 1. Self-glory, which arises from 2. Pictures, from which only 3. Consciousness can release us. Amwell 24.5.52 The Middle Laboratory Because this work does not consist in having one's own way in any center, it becomes repugnant to the self-love and creates difficulties for everyone. Difficulties may appear at the start or emerge later. Since the mechanical divisions of all centers resent the work, the mechanical man, made up of various habitual connections within and between these parts of centers, struggles to maintain his existence so as to prevent the formation of a new man that would replace him. To express the situation more correctly, one should rather say that many eyes in different centers whose power is threatened will resent the work and so create difficulties by objecting, arguing, or flat denial. Now a man by his life, may have such a great number of strong, self-loving and world-seeking resistant eyes, that any eyes, in him, that may possibly want the work have little chance of forming a group and growing stronger in that man. This means simply that the mechanical man will murder any manifestation of the new man. Others, a little better situated psychologically, through having doubted life, and reflected, and wondered occasionally about its meaning, may take in the work to some extent at first, so that a minute new living thing begins in them. This is the beginning of a new way, of thinking and feeling. Then difficulties arise. Three things may then happen. Either the minute new living thing, which is the beginning of the new man, withers because it has no depth of soil, or the mechanical man murders it by violence as Herod murdered the new babies, hoping to destroy Christ, or, thirdly, the man revalues the work and starts again. Now let us speak of the three laboratories in man, and particularly of the middle laboratory, where the murderer can enter and work destruction unless you are watching. He will choose, like a thief, a moment when you are not awake. I do not here mean literal sleep. We know from the diagram of the three foods of man, and their transformation, that there are three transforming laboratories in us. These transform gross into finer matters. You will understand that if you eat a beef steak it cannot pass, say, into your brain as such. It has to be transformed into finer matters. Now usually the middle laboratory only is spoken of. This is because it is this one that is most liable to damage. But all can be damaged. The first transformation of food, symbolized by the figure 768 changing into 384, is carried out in the lower laboratory. The figure 768 denotes all substances that the human stomach and intestines can digest. We must recall here that the table of hydrogens is a table of uses. Things are classified and arranged in a vertical scale according to their uses. For example, anything that is of use for that form of food that man digests in his stomach and intestines is termed 768. Thus substances of the most diverse sorts and kinds are brought into an at first sight amazing relation through this esoteric method of classifying a thing by the use of that thing. I may add here that we also are classified in a similar way. So one should ask, of what use am I? Now if something is wrong in the first laboratory, and let us take only that part of it called the stomach, as, for instance, wrong food, too much food, too much or little hydrochloric acid, weak, or missing ferments, or dullness, 
or a hundred and one other factors than the transformation of 768 into 384 is interfered with. The whole food octave starting from passive due 768 and proceeding mechanically by successive transformations to she 12 will be to some extent affected. But in this connection we are told that we can accustom ourselves to far less food than we eat and that we have artificial appetite and that feeling hungry is largely a matter of habit which does not reflect the real needs of the instinctive center. When practicing starving, the falling away of this artificial appetite on the second day or so can be clearly experienced. I will not speak further here about disturbances in the lower laboratory, except to say that both in the first phase of digestion, in the acid stomach, and perhaps more particularly nowadays in the second phase of digestion carried out in the duodenum and an alkaline medium, persisting emotions of anxiety and fear, so typical of modern man, may cause the digestive juices to digest the living walls that contain them, and even eat through them, causing perforation. In other words, gripped by these negative emotions, a man begins to eat himself. Now to come to the middle laboratory, with which we are mainly concerned. The work carried on here is of a subtler kind. The matters dealt with in this laboratory are far finer, and of a far higher order, and so are capable of greater uses, and of greater abuses. This middle laboratory, which we can suppose, by rough analogy, to be full of the most delicate and intricate chemical, and electrical apparatus demands, as it were, a constant temperature, complete freedom from damp and absence of noise and vibration, in order to carry out its work. Notice that it receives substances for further transformation from the lower laboratory, and also receives substances for further transformation from the upper laboratory. It has, therefore, most complicated tasks to carry out of the greatest importance to the food octave, also the atmospheric food 192 called air enters here, and is transformed into 96, passing on to the upper laboratory. Since it is situated in the second story of the three-story house, that is man, it is intimately connected with the emotional center, which has its situation here. Therefore the quality of the work of transformation in the second laboratory will depend on the state of the emotional center. If the state of the emotional center is good, the middle laboratory will work well, the most damaging thing that can happen to it is an attack of violence. Violence acts like an explosion. In extreme cases it may be so intense as to damage the middle laboratory permanently. Owing to its repercussions on the upper laboratory it may affect the reason. Now we are taught that all negative emotions are based on violence and lead down to violence. We know also that violence only breeds violence. Nothing is settled by violence as witness the world. Many other things have been pointed out, which can all be observed in oneself, concerning violence. One has, of course, first of all, to become conscious of one's own violence. We have many lesser recurrent attacks of violence. They must be circumvented eventually if we seek to prevent any new life in us from being murdered. All have to work on their violence for all have it though they deny it. These lesser attacks of violence arise from letting things touch your blood. From this you get bad blood against one another. It is due to identifying. Try to observe in yourself what angers you in another person so much that you completely identify with that person and cannot stand him or her. The seeing the same thing in yourself cancels out the violence just as plus one and minus one cancel out. This is the true meaning of the Greek word translated forgive as in forgive one another. There is no trace of forgiving in cancelling. Nothing pseudo is meant. It is all cancelled out as by an electric spark passing between two oppositely charged bodies. The more conceited you are the less you can forgive by seeing the same thing in yourself so you will be more inclined to violence for conceit prevents self-observation. You will be your own punishment, as we all are. Now an attack of violence always disturbs the health. It is a wrong shock in the wrong place. The shock often works out days after an illness or physical trouble. It upsets the working of the middle laboratory, disturbing, among other things, the formation of the matter symbolized by the figure 96 whose use has to do with the balance and protection of what I will call the cushion of health between the psychic and physical life. Diminution of this fine matter lowers physiological resistance, while the identifying lowers psychological resistance. Both states let things in which should be kept out. The consequences are thus psychosomatic. Now remember that violence arises from identifying. 
If we could remember ourselves that is, draw our consciousness out of life things at will we would not identify, and so would not be violent. Amwell, Whitson, 31.5.52 Internal Accounts and Forgiving If we are told anything by the work, we can be certain that the reason is connected with inner self-development. Everything taught by the work has reference to the inner self-development that man is capable of by creation. But for the development to begin and continue, a man and a woman must study and restudy, again and again, what the work teaches. At first nothing is really taken and certain phrases are heard, and certain words. They are scattered over the surface of the mind. But they do not take root and cannot do so unless the emotional factor of valuation becomes added. Otherwise they are not treasured, which is the same as saying they are not valued, and so the heart, which gives the necessary depth of soil, is not taking any part. Where a man's treasure is, there is his heart. If the emotional center is not eventually in the work, nothing will happen. There will be no change in the person. People will remain just the same as they were. There will be no psychotransformism. Their hearts will be elsewhere. That is, their valuation will be in other things. They may give lip service to the work, but no valuation. For this reason, the work octave is said to begin with valuation. Notice that the work octave is said. Much preliminary to and fro business, much starting and stopping, much argument, much struggling between yes and no, is necessary before a person comes into the path that is the octave of the work. Some who have gained insight prefer to avoid the work octave, and some, even wishing to avoid it, are made to go into the work octave through the influence of the awakening emotional center, the seat of buried conscience, which knows the work already, and recognizes it. But such recognition is impossible if the phrases and words of the teaching are scattered over the surface of the mind, and lay there without soil to take root and everything in the work is germinal the ideas, the instructions, the phrases, the words, that is, they are seeds. Now take a phrase like making internal accounts. Have you studied and restudied again and again what this phrase means? Can you say that you really do understand what making internal accounts means? Can you say with sincerity that you know very well what forms making account stakes in your life? Have you observed them today? Against whom do you make them? Against God, or fate, or luck, or man or woman, or government, or your superiors or inferiors? You always personify what you blame. You don't make accounts against your damp house itself, but against the architect or builder, or the man who sold it to you, and of course your doctor who told you to live in the country. One can always blame one's doctor if no one else is at hand. Now you have heard it said that a person may know the work but not understand it. To know is one thing. To understand is another. The intellectual center can know the work and repeat it by heart, but it needs the cooperation of the intellectual and the emotional center to understand the work. You may know it is necessary to cease making internal accounts, but do you understand why? Have you reflected not merely once but a hundred times why you have to give up internal accounting? If not, then you understand nothing about this particular bit of teaching that the work offers us you hear it, but do not understand it. Why? You do not connect it with yourself. You do not connect it through the first line of work, which is work on yourself, in the light of the knowledge that the work teaches. Listen to this conversation. Some newcomer says, what's all this about making internal accounts? The self-styled old hand replies, oh, it's very important. You'll hear the phrase often. By the way, do you know Atkinson, don't you? That man, I hear, actually said I was stupid. I've just written him a proper letter about it. Have you? But surely I've often heard you say Atkinson is a conceited fool. So he is. He turned down the job I offered him, thought it wasn't good enough. But hasn't this got something to do with making accounts? My dear fellow, it has got absolutely nothing to do with it. Don't, for heaven's sake, start making wrong connections in your mind. I'm a seasoned veteran, very experienced in this work, so I know what I'm talking about. Do you imagine I am going to allow anyone to call me stupid? No, certainly not. I'll see he doesn't forget it, I assure you. Well, now, I will not go so far as to say I overheard this actual conversation, but I have heard several similar ones. If you say, how can this be? I reply, the answer is simple. 
it is just this kind of thing a person says who has never understood what the work is about, even though knowing some tiling of the phrases and words used in a special language and so giving a superficial impression of understanding it. He has never connected it with his own psychology. Now I have been asked whether ceasing to make internal accounts has anything to do with what was spoken of last week when the paper on violence was given. Well, of course it has. Last week the dangers of violence were explained in relation to the delicate work of transformation carried out especially in the middle laboratory. Violence injures new thoughts and feelings being formed by the work and thus it injures the new man. It was said that if one could see what made one violent with another person, and if one could find by observation the same thing, in oneself, the violence would vanish. It would cancel out, as two plus one, and minus one, which add up to exactly nothing. Blaming another, making internal accounts against him, precipitates violence. Now it amounts to this namely, if I become conscious of all and everything in myself, I could not be violent about any unpleasant manifestation in another, for I would see it also in myself. I would see myself in others and others in myself. I would reach this degree of objective consciousness. It was mentioned that the Greek word translated, as forgive means to cancel a debt, to remate, to write off in one's account book what another owes. It has no sentimental meaning. To say one forgives another an injury or insult is not merely self-deception, but also spiritual arrogance. It is as if one thought one could do. No, the only way is through a slow development of consciousness of what is in one by long self-observation, which will shatter one's pet idea of oneself, but will release one and others whom one had imprisoned in one's hate and violence. Now, in the original Greek, it is not said, forgive us our sins, in the Lord's Prayer, but cancel what we owe, in proportion, as we cancel what others owe us notice that emphasis not on what we have done, but on what we have not done. This means that if, say, I never remember myself, I owe my Father, who is in heaven, and continue to owe more and more as my life, of being asleep goes by I may worry intermittently about some things I have done, but this is quite different from reflecting on things I have not done. If you consider the work from this point of view you will discover several interesting things. Amwell 7.6.52 Revenge and Cancelling You all know that something thirsts for revenge under insult and cares not to rap for cancelling. For it, cancelling is killing the other and not seeing the same thing in oneself. When you thirst for revenge, you are being led by wrong eyes. They suggest this and that. If you can watch them, you will learn something about what is in you. But if not, you will identify with them. It is much easier to do so taking a short view of things. It gives you far more satisfaction. Revenge is sweet. Work is not. To go against oneself is never sweet. When you identify in this manner instead of separating, each of these eyes will suggest that you say this or that, or right, or behave in this, or that way. But it will seem to you that it is you yourself thinking all this. It will appear to you as, I think I will say, or write this. I think I will write that, or I think I will do this. No, I think I will do that. What is happening to you is that certain eyes which live in you in negative parts of centers have got hold of you. You have simply allowed them to get hold of you. You are asleep and enjoying negative emotions. You are thus moving into the slum area of the great city of yourself. You are already in the hands of pretty unpleasant people. These eyes are unscrupulous and nasty. But you do not see them. By a trick and what a trick they seem to be you you thinking and you feeling. You take them as you so they infuse you with their thoughts and feelings. You identify with them. You say I to them. Whatever you say I to you take as the in you and with that you are identified. You make it the same as you. Whatever you make the same as you, you make one with yourself. This is identifying. The process is not deliberate. It happens automatically and instantaneously. It is bound to happen automatically and instantaneously to everyone who takes everything that goes on within him or her as himself or herself. This mystery is not realized. I called it a trick a moment ago. The majority cannot see it. Some never can see it. If you begin to see it, you see to your amazement that it is a trick. It is indeed a trick. 
It is one of several quite simple and quite successful tricks that keep up the central mystery that man is asleep but can awaken and yet knows neither. Now being already through identifying in the hands of some eyes belonging to the less desirable streets of the psychological city in you, if you continue to identify like the silly blind sheep that one is in regard to what goes on within, you will get into the hands of a rougher and tougher and nastier crowd of eyes. They think nothing of blackmail, incriminating others, and using minor violence. They, in turn, can hand you on to the lowest, murdering, and most evil eyes. All this can, and does result from unchecked identifying with negative eyes, when you wish to retaliate and seek revenge. Now they only wish one thing, from you. These eyes wish to overpower you, and take your force. Their method is to make you identify with them so that your consciousness does not distinguish between you and them. But I will remind you here that it can be trained to do so the work desires you to do this so that you do not keep on losing the small amount of consciousness you have. Now this identifying with an I is as if a man in the street suddenly became you. It is as if he vanished into you and you never noticed anything. Of course, this can only happen when you are unconscious of all that goes on in yourself. The only remedy is to let a ray of the light of consciousness into yourself. This means to observe yourself, and to observe means to see things in yourself, and to see eventually that many different eyes live in you, and use your name and voice. When you reach this stage of self-observation it is like being able to see many different people, in a street, where it has seemed that only you are. Now our relationship to the external world is such that when we see a person in the street we do not take him as our self. We do not say, I am this person, this person is me, nor can this person approach us and say, you are me and I am you. Such behavior would be embarrassing. Indeed, we would be furious at such an attempt to take possession of us yet our relationship to the internal world of oneself is such that this is continually happening and it does not embarrass or upset us in the least. The trick works beautifully, and silently, and practically no one is ever aware of it. It is in use all over the world at this moment. The work tries to make us aware of it, to open our understanding to it. But even with the help of the work, and all that it teaches people can remain unaware of the trick. Of course, if we already possessed inwardly that state of consciousness called self-awareness which the work strongly recommends us to attain for our own good, we would at once be aware that some trick was being attempted when any I approached us internally and said, you are me and I am you and then tried to vanish into us we would be aware both of the approach of the I and of its intention to seize control of us by turning us into it. Like the prince in the fairy stories being turned into a frog or Circe turning the sailors of Ulysses into swine. But magic of this sort is still being done, and all the time people are being turned into what they are not. Surely Circe's island is this world. Now like Ulysses we are given a remedy from above, a divine counter spell. It is the third state of consciousness. It is self-remembering, self-awareness and self-consciousness. However we do not use this remedy. Because we are not forced to the necessity to do so the work is not actual and not serious enough to us, and we do not yet see clearly what is happening to us we have plenty of buffers within to smooth things over. As regards the work, we can go about in a daze and a haze and a maze day after day. We just drift. We may not see, for instance, that we are really being controlled by a majority of eyes that are hostile or indifferent to this work and to the whole teaching of esotericism by eyes that either only some kind of a more appropriate us prevents from taking their logical course, or that are so cleverly concealing themselves that the real danger of our inner situation is not consciously realized. We have eyes that are as antagonistic to the work as some narrow harsh people actually can be in life. Such eyes can quietly poison us they can hide behind a picture of virtue. If any I does so, be sure that it secretly is your enemy. We little suspect how many eyes in us are our enemies and only desire to retain their power over us. Now when we come to the necessity of self-remembering it is like carrying in both hands a cup that is brimful of wine. So among other things it is then necessary to notice where one is walking in oneself. In the slums you certainly will be in danger of having the cup knocked completely out of your hands. One will, therefore, be under the sheer necessity of finding some other way of dealing with insult, banned by mechanical retaliation and revenge, or only being offended. For all the latter can easily make you negative, and bring you into your slums. 
so you will miss an opportunity of work on yourself and spill some wine unless you find some way to deal with yourself. It is here that cancelling can come in the cases different with those who have not yet reached the necessity of self-remembering. They carry no cup as yet. They are not cup-bearers. They can still try remembering themselves occasionally when they have time and there is nothing important to do. Amwell 14.6.52 Belief in the Work In this work we are told that nothing can change in a man unless he begins to think in a new way. It is also said that this work is to make us think in a new way. Let us consider these two statements so that something of their meaning emerges and administers one or two slaps in the face. You will see that from these statements it follows that the mind must believe the work. That is the first slap in the face. If there is no belief in the work, nothing can happen. That is the second slap. The man or woman will continue to think as they always have and everything will remain the same. It is possible to remain in the work, as the phrase goes, for year after year, and not believe it and so remain unchanged in one's way of thinking. This may, at first sight, seem impossible. But if a person has no belief in the work and its authority and its teaching, that person will not undergo any change of mind, and if anyone's ways of thinking remain unaltered, the work cannot act on him or her. That is the point and that is the meaning of the two statements. Consider the matter more closely, so that it engages your deeper attention, and brings you face to face to some extent with where you are mentally as regards the work. You can see that if a person has no eyes with any attraction for or real belief in the work, that person will not be occupied genuinely with what it teaches. One does not seriously occupy one's mind with what one does not believe in. On the other hand, if one believes that a thing is true, one thinks about it, particularly if it closely concerns oneself. Now this work closely concerns oneself. I cannot indeed think of anything that concerns men or women more closely than the teaching of this work. But if they do not believe it you imagine they will have their minds miraculously changed by it and begin to think in a new way. I should have said not in a new way, but in an entirely new way. Can you see? Then, that since nothing can change in us unless we begin to think in a new way, and since this work is to make us eventually think in an entirely new way, unless we believe what it teaches it can have absolutely no effect on us. Being mind stuck we will remain just as we always were. There will be no change of being because there is no change in thinking. Without change of thought there can be no change of being. A man will remain the same man. The mind with its former attitudes and habits of thinking will remain unaltered, and so the rest of the person will remain unaltered. The knowledge taught by the work will not enter the thinking and transform it. The man or woman will not even try to think from the new ideas that the work teaches and see life and themselves in a new way. They will not try to think from the ideas of the work simply because they do not believe them. They will hear that they have many eyes but not believe it and so with the other ideas for instance, they will hear that new knowledge, new being, and new understanding are all connected, and that one cannot have new understanding without the other two. But they will not believe it. Now reflect on this carefully. Notice if you have taken in what it means. Do you believe your understanding will remain at its present level if your knowledge does not change, and that your being will not change unless your knowledge changes? I doubt it. But to continue. I may be given the new knowledge contained in the work and often listen to it, but never really believe it. In that case I will not apply the new knowledge to the study of my being. I will make no attempt whatsoever to view the kind of man I am psychologically from the angle of the new knowledge. I will just go on chasing about as usual, pursuing my usual daily interests, running after my fantasies, satisfying my appetites, and voicing my usual daily imbecilities with the utmost complacency. I will not, of course, see anything mechanical in all this. Privately I will laugh the idea to scorn that I am a mechanical man, and fast asleep in mind and heart. Now the work is about a possible change inherent in man by creation. You find this difficult to believe? No doubt you do. Well, this change is called psychotransformism. Mal psychotransformism begins with transformation of the mind. It begins with metanoia, to use a word in the New Testament, which means change of mind, and not repentance. 
a person, therefore, who does not really believe in the work will experience no transformation of mind, and so will not move internally into a position where changes can be performed by means of the influences of the work. The work will not be received. These influences act first on the mind so as to change the thinking. Otherwise there can be no psychotransformism, no ultimate transformation of the person's whole psychology. There cannot be, simply, because when it comes down to brass tacks the person does not believe in the work, or derides or mocks it secretly. There will be no change in the mind, and therefore no change can result in the level of being and therefore no change in the level of understanding. The person may see mixed early to change a little. This may be due to example, atmosphere, and imitation, or vanity or motives of self-interest. But there will be no internal change, no genuine transformation, nothing so real and intimate that a man, turned and twisted in every direction, time after time, will remain always pointing to the work. The mind, not being awakened by the work, will not awaken the emotional center. The underlying disbelief in the intellectual center will be reflected as dislike and disbelief in the emotional center. That is, self-emotions and not work emotions will remain dominant. Now a man may know this work and not believe it. To know is not to believe. Again, he may teach this work and not believe it. That is quite possible for certain types. He does not deceive himself, but deceives others. He may profess to believe, but very many profess Christianity, for instance, and do not believe it. That is why one has at times to observe oneself and check how much of one believes the work and what the quality of one's belief is and how many eyes fight against it. For according to the quality of your belief, so will the work respond and act on you. A man may believe he believes this work and find, by candid uncritical self-observation, that he does not. He sees that he has been deceiving himself. This gives him a good chance to go on. It is a useful shock as are all moments of sincerity with oneself. It clears away false eyes that are like parasitic charmers in the mind. A man, a woman, are so very much their inner sincerity in this work. Now I will add only one thing. To believe is to have confidence. To believe in the work is to have confidence in something more than in yourself. To believe in the work is to believe in something greater than oneself. It is to believe in greater mind that is, in mind greater than your mind. Now mind is invisible. Greater mind is invisible. Your mind is invisible. To believe in greater mind is therefore for one invisible to believe in a greater invisible. You will see that we are now speaking on the psychological level. Amwell 28.6.52 False Personality and Happiness In what does happiness consist? Take your own case. Let us suppose you believe that there is an afterlife and that you will go to heaven and be perfectly happy. How do you conceive of this happiness? Have you thought about it? Some imagine themselves in a state of great magnificence, living in palaces, served by slaves, adored, admired and praised by everyone. They feel that this would make them supremely happy. Now this idea of happiness has to be completely eradicated. It must be torn out of the heart. The crudity and vulgarity of this widespread fantasy was commented on by Christ when the disciples were quarreling about who was greatest. He said that in the kingdom of heaven the person who served most was the greatest. This transvaluation of world values must have been a shock to them, as indeed the whole of Christ's life was. Another crude idea regards happiness as consisting in a continual gratification of one or other of the bodily appetites. This is entirely of self, and for self, and serves nothing but self. But I will pass on to the connection of the idea of happiness with the false personality. Consider for a moment people, whose happiness is mainly to satisfy their false personality. It cannot be said, that they are made deeply happy by doing so on the other hand, they avoid being made unhappy. By administering to the requirements of the false personality they have their reward, Indeed, as we shall see, they are spoken of as having already had their reward in the very act of obeying their false personality. This is interesting. The reward does not come later, as it does, say, when a man works on himself over a considerable period, and suddenly, apparently without any cause, something opens, and in the flash of positive emotion he sees what truth is. He may not have been, and probably was not, expecting any reward, he was not working for a result. 
I mean, that he was not making internal accounts against the deity, such, as, here, I've been keeping my temper in for over five minutes. When do I get a reward? It must be said that some seem to expect a remarkably high rate of interest for making any work effort, and some take a queer view of their importance. The quality of effort in the work is poor when it is mixed with inner accounting, and too much self-admiration. Since the nature of the false personality is connected with instant reward, it will not gladly endure the work, where rewards come by no means instantly. Let us take as examples something said about false personality and reward in Matthew V.I. When you pray, be not as the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the street so as to be seen of men. Verily, I say unto you, they have received their reward. Or again, do not practice your religious obligations before men in order to be seen. Do not sound a trumpet before you in the streets, as the hypocrites to win the give alms so as to have glory of men. Verily, I say unto you, they have received their reward. Now you will notice that in these examples the reward is instant. No sooner have they sounded the trumpet and given money in public, and they have received their reward. What have they done? you will realize that they have satisfied the false personality, and by so doing have had a moment of happiness. I mean, that they have had a moment of that particular quality of happiness. Do you know its taste? It is a happiness connected with what other people think of you. It is derived from outside, not from within. In this sense it is external. I mean that its origin is from the world. It arises from audience. It demands an audience. This is due to the character of the false personality. When you do a thing from false personality, you expect at least praise of some kind. Even the wagging of your dog's tail may be sufficient. But if you have done the thing, without a trace of love of doing it, or love of doing it for someone else which latter is serving them you will begin drawing up a long internal account, if you get no acknowledgement. Yes, it is very difficult to make effort without getting any acknowledgement. Yet so much of the work depends just on this. Why? Because, don't you see? Otherwise it would increase false personality. Now the quality of happiness, that comes from being first, or having most, or looking best, and so on, is not a genuine or deep happiness, since it depends uneasily on what people think, and needs continual re-stimulation, being over so quickly, as is indicated in the words, they have received their reward. So, you see. They want it again, and that makes them restless. But there is another quality of happiness which is independent of external things. It belongs to one's inner being. For that reason the false personality, which belongs to one's outer being, cannot know it. One of its definite effects is to replace restlessness, and its kindred anxiety and fear by peace. This peace cannot be shaken by external events, if you keep awake. But it cannot be reached as long as consciousness is centered in false personality, and the latter as the active ruler within. That is why the successive layers of false personality have to be stripped off, like skins. A stripping is painful to vanity, pride, conceit, and self-liking, so it takes time, sometimes more, sometimes less. To get one skin off is wonderful. It does not kill you, for those skins are not you. It is the skins that are killing you. Stripping releases you from them, from what makes up the false personality which is not you. It is a psychological prison. Every generation has its own kind. Observe its action in others, in intonation, in expression, in posture, in movement. Try to do so in yourself, and finally, observe it in life, in novels, in history, in the newspapers, in photographs, especially of yourself in the past, and also in the present. These are three powerfully interacting lines of work. Amwell 5.7.52 What is a new will? Let us begin by trying to understand something about what will is. In the first place, to will and to think are two different things, but we confuse them. It is necessary to observe clearly in oneself that we do not distinguish between them. They have different tastes. Willing is connected with the emotional side of us while thinking belongs to the intellectual center. Now these two sides of a person do not work harmoniously together. You cannot say that you always will what you think, nor can you say that you think what you will. A man may think he should smoke less. But that does not mean he wills and does it. 
if we could see in a vision of expanded consciousness all our thinking throughout life, and then in a second vision all that we have willed, we should be amazed at the difference. Actually these two records exist interiorly in every person. It can be added here that the level of a man's being, or a woman's being is much more connected with what they have willed than with what they have thought. But since we confuse thinking, and willing we do not observe and study the action of will in our life as distinct from thinking. So we do not see our life as will. Since the work of each center and part of a center in us has a different inner taste, we should really be able to do so we can do so if we try. The result however is not flattering but very interesting. But if we cannot give up thinking how wonderful we are, we had better not try, but continue our life of illusion and vexation. But today I only wish to speak of what new will can, and does mean. Will is connected both with what we like and what we love. What a man loves he wills and what he wills he does, either openly or secretly. If restrained, he does it in imagination, which spiritually that is, psychologically is the same. I mean, that there is no new will formed. The dog will return to his vomit when occasion arises. A new will would mean to go in a new direction. But as you cease to like or love something such as yourself you will less and less will it. Now by observation you may come to dislike a part of yourself, something in yourself. Then you will not will it, as you did when you did not clearly see it. But as long as your self-love remains the undetected, unexplored, prehistoric jungle that it is, you unknowingly let it will all of you, being ignorant of the enemies, the evil eyes, it conceals, not being conscious of what is in the jungle. Amongst other dialings, that will mean that you openly or secretly always want your own way. This is will from self-love. This is undiscriminating willing, and really means that all things in this jungle, all calling themselves by your name even man feed their own wills. Some scream with rage if prevented. By the way, there are screaming parrots in everyone's jungle, that talk, and talk, and contribute much to bad daily human relationship, if not destroyed. Now if one could through self-observation and self-study cease to love oneself quite so much, one would not so much wish to have one's own way. That would liberate energy. By seeing more what we are like we would not love ourselves so much. We would not be so critical, and overriding, openly, or secretly, of others. Self-love is the head love and draws in loads of energy at all times. Being more tolerant, through many private self-humiliations during the work on oneself and on self-love, we would also have some force release to give some attention to what others want in place of what we want. In short, we would have a little new will like a small child gained from diminishing the self-love. Now if a man continues to love the same things, he will continue to will and do them. In that case there can be no new will. His energies are fully used up in the circle of his interests. He will continue to go always in the same direction. For example, he will not be able to do anything new, being bound to the circle of his loves from which he wills. But if he works against mechanicalness which is easier for those who observe externally, or against self-love which is easier for those who have inner observation or works against both, and both are difficult, then he may free enough energy to do something he would have thought impossible. I mean, he might go in a direction for which he had never developed any adapted function, or of which he had not seen the use as long, as he remained the machine he never suspected he was. I offer again an example in the following dream I once had, which was given some time ago. In this dream I was shown quite simply a direction and state of will that at the time seemed impossible for Mick to follow or ever reach. I was shown it only after crossing a certain barrier clearly connected with what might be called the savage man of self-love, the prehistoric man, or woman, in oneself. This barrier, representing something psychological that is, in one's being was represented pictorially by a narrow deep abyss, difficult to cross and filled with ancient bones. Please understand that literal abyss, literal bones, etc. are not meant. It is an allegory, intended to show me something. The dream is as follows, someone pushes me up the grass slope, there is a ditch. It is not wide but difficult to cross. The difficult to cross ditch at the top of the slope is full of the bones of prehistoric animals the remains of violent things, of beasts of prey, of monsters, of snakes. They go far down into this abyss. 
There is a plank to cross by, but the air seems full of restraining power, like the invisible influence of some powerful magnet, and this, with the fear of crossing this depth, although the width is not great, holds me back. I cannot say for how long, for there is no ordinary time in all this. Then I find myself across on the other side. What wonderful vision do I now behold? I see someone teaching, or drilling some recruits. That is all. At first sight there seems nothing marvelous. He smiles. He indicates somehow that he does not necessarily expect to get any results from what he is doing. He does not seem to mind. He does not show any signs of impatience when they are rude to him. The lesson is nearly over, but this will not make any difference to him. It is as if he said, well, this has to be done. One cannot expect much. One must give them help, though they don't want it. It is his invulnerableness that strikes me he is not hurt or angered by their sneers or lack of discipline. He has some curious power, but hardly uses it. I pass on marveling that he could do it. I could not take on such a thankless task. Eventually I come to a place, perhaps a shop, where boats are stored. Beyond is the sea. When I wake up I think of this man. To do what he is doing is so utterly contrary to anything I would do. I would need a new will to do it. It would mean that I would have to go in a direction I never went and I thought much about this direction. How could I define it to myself? I would have been violent to these recruits. Yes, that was it. He showed no violence. He had not a will of violence. He seemed purified from all violence. That was the secret. That was the cause of the curious power I detected in him. A man without violence. And then I reflected that to reach him I had had to get across to the other side of the deep gulf full of the bones of prehistoric beasts, full of the remains of violent creatures. This had been done for me somehow and I found myself in the borders of another country, only at the edge of it, but beyond the prehistoric beasts. Here this non-violent man lived and taught. It was the country of the non-violent, where recruits were being taught. They seemed to be an indifferent lot, but perhaps they represented people that could learn something eventually. He had nearly finished his lesson. Beyond was the sea, and there were boats toward near it. No doubt when he had finished the course he was going on somewhere beyond the land. I had been given only a glance into the meaning of a new will a will not based on violence or on having your own way. I repeat only a glance. For I knew I had not, save in spirit, really crossed that deep gulf yet, filled with the bones of the violent past, and left it behind finally. There were no recruits for me, or were these recruits different eyes in myself that he was trying to teach? Certainly none of the waiting boats was mine. But from this glance I knew more practically what going in a new direction is, and what new will purified from violence means. I know also that the possibilities of following this new will and new direction lie in every moment of one's life, and that I continually forget. Amwell, 12.7.52 Definite, topical and concrete self-observation. Let us try to get some of the energy contained in the idea that man is asleep, and make some reflections by means of it. It is said often in these commentaries that we should not remain unconscious of our psychology. One reason is that what we are unconscious of in ourselves we tend to see only in others. I mean, that we will tend to see, let us say, meanness, as outside of ourselves, when it is possibly inside ourselves. If we are constantly seeing meanness in others we may be pretty sure that it is something we are blind to in ourselves. Now this tendency is one particular part of our general state of sleep. If we reflect on this particular part of our sleep we see that it gives rise to an incalculable amount of unhappiness in the world. We accuse and condemn another for what we also do and are. This is a failure or lack in consciousness due to the general level of our consciousness. It characterizes the second or so-called waking state which we believe until we wake enough to it to be a state of full consciousness. The work calls it a state of sleep. I ask in parenthesis here, do you? even after long, on critical self-observation, truly begin to realize that you are not properly conscious. Perhaps one has not thought of oneself in this way. Now let us imagine a person who says, this idea that man is asleep cannot seriously apply to me I am far from being asleep. I agree others are. 
but I am unusually lively, and always on the spot, and, by the way, I simply cannot stand that fellow X who is always showing off and making out he's different from other people. Everyone makes remarks of this kind. It is due to a lack of consciousness. They are unaware that so often they are just what they are so critical of in others. They are unconscious of their own psychology. The consequence is that they see what is in them projected outside them like a magic lantern slide onto another person. The imaginary person mentioned above does not see that it is he himself who is always boasting and making out that he is different from other people. Because he does not see it in himself, he is overcritical of it in others. If he saw it in himself, he would not be. Now the point that I wish to emphasize in this connection is that in the work people do not practice self-observation in relation to something as definite as noticing the same thing in themselves as they are critical of in others. There is no doubt that there is such a thing as abstract, retrospective or remote self-observation. It can take more than one useful and necessary form provided it does not pass into useless unnecessary retrospective regret and negative brooding. One form is connected with taking time photographs of oneself. But what I am speaking of here is definite, topical and concrete self-observation. It consists in observing in yourself what definitely irritates you in another person. It is definite because it is about what you definitely notice in another. It is topical because it has to do with what is going on more or less at the time, and it is concrete because it demands that you get down to the concrete job of finding in yourself what you find so irritating in the other person. For that reason I will call this commentary, definite, topical and concrete self-observation. We can all admit that there is far too much bland, woolly, insincere self-observation, and too many never observe themselves. They open more roads into themselves and see no reason to do so all within themselves therefore remains unknown, and in darkness, and the work remains a conundrum. But the work ranks self-observation as a prime necessity. Why? First, how can a man change himself unless he gets to know what lies in him? And second, by letting light into inner darkness, that is, the light of consciousness certain changes take place through its influence. Unpleasant things grow in the absence of light. It is the darkness of unconsciousness that is a danger. We have heard time and again that the work is to increase our consciousness. The darkness of ignorance and unconsciousness is to be dispelled by the light of consciousness. Yes, that sounds very fine. Such language appeals to romantic, pseudo-spiritual folk. Light. They exclaim, looking upwards, how wonderful. Unfortunately this light is very painful in the way it operates. They find the letting of light into themselves not at all pleasant. They have to see what fools they are. It is just that that is an increase of consciousness. But in every case, whoever it is, it is a very tough business to increase the consciousness of oneself and not at all to oneself liking. Far from it. An increase of consciousness of oneself is always at the expense of one's imagination of oneself, of one's vanity, at the expense of imaginary, I, at the expense of all the pictures treasured by the false personality. For this light of consciousness, which illuminates things in us, seeks eventually to bring about the collapse of everything fictitious and unreal so that a new person can develop. Now to see one's own foolishness is an increase of consciousness, if one hitherto regarded oneself as wise. I mean, that an increase of consciousness extends one's knowledge of oneself. It is about something. It is not empty. To know more about oneself is to become more conscious of things in oneself. It destroys the former feeling. This brings us back to the rinding in oneself of the very thing that irritates us in another, of which we had been unconscious. When this is done, when we turn things the other way round, our irritation is dissipated. It vanishes. Now through being roused and irritated by things in others, by how they behave, what they say, and so on, we lose energy by being made rather negative, and are in danger of plunging into a fit of negative emotion. All negative states cause energy loss. The work says that we should act as mirrors to one another instead of disliking one another. That is, we can come to see ourselves in others and others in ourselves. The dog at the Institute in France was called K.A.K. Vass. Like you. I was often irritated by its idle pretentious ways. The Gospels speak of seeing the beam in one's own eye as well as the mote in one's brother's eye. 
let us recollect that the work was defined as esoteric Christianity and look for a moment into this matter of beam and mode. The phrases, Why beholdest thou the mode that is in thy brother's eye, but consider it not the beam that is in thine own eye? Matt, VII.3, Considerist A.T.A. In the Greek the word used for the mode is simply C. That is easy to do. But the word used for the beam in oneself is interesting. It means to take notice of, to detect, to acquire knowledge of, to take in a fact about, to learn, to observe, to understand. Obviously something far more difficult is meant than merely seeing another's faults. To turn round is not easy. But the work expects it. If you study what Christ said, you discover that nearly everything referred to what is within you. The work also is about what is within. That is why it begins with self-observation and self-noticing. Amwell, 19.7.52. The work, as a special form of photography, we cannot admit the possibility of continuous observation. Just as it is impossible to observe any outer object continuously, so is it impossible to observe any inner object in ourselves continuously. There is one advantage, however, as regards self-observation, namely, that we carry ourselves about with us so that we can observe ourselves at any moment, if it occurs to us to do so yet even so we do not really observe ourselves afresh, but in a stale way, by associations. We observe what we always observe a dull process without light. If we practiced observing each center, a little light would enter and if we observe in ourselves what we see in another, much more light enters. In that case, it certainly ceases to be associative self-observation which of course is not observation, but a mechanical process. All self-observation of any use to us is conscious. These conscious self-observations are, as was said, not continuous observations. They are to be regarded as discrete, discontinuous events of a very special kind, that ordinarily people rarely experience. These discrete by which I mean separate discontinuous events, however, undergo definite arrangement. They are put in order and form a special memory to which I have called your attention, before and which I have termed work memory. Without it, personal work is at a minimum. This ordering of conscious observations of oneself is the work of centers themselves, and must be left to them, because any interference by the formatory part of intellectual center can spoil their right arrangement. Many observations are emotionally, or sensationally connected, for example, that formatorily we would not believe possible. The result of all this inner hidden work of arranging is that we may come to have whole plate photographs of ourselves say one, or perhaps two, after many years. Nothing more valuable can come into our possession than one of these full-size photographs. By the possession of one of these photographs, pieced together by the work of centers from hundreds of brief but conscious snapshot self-observations, we are saved from the unconscious power of everything represented in that photograph. We know that the object of self-observation is to let the light of consciousness into what lies in darkness within us. We are unconscious of all that lies in darkness and us unconsciousness is darkness, and darkness is unconsciousness. The only remedy is consciousness, which is light. Light overcomes darkness. For a long time we do not understand what this means, hearing the words with our ears and not with the mind. We know that whatever we bring into the light of consciousness loses the power it has over us if it remains unconscious that is, in our inner, unexplored darkness. Operating from our darkness it can have very great power and extraordinary fascination. What would be the object of conscious self-observation so that it is dragged into the light if it were not so? Yet, as I said, people do not see what is meant. They cannot connect light with consciousness because the words are different and for that reason they do not comprehend self-observation, or what it is for. They do not grasp that, unless we let the light of consciousness increasingly into ourselves, we cannot change. All that we are unconscious of within, all that lies in the darkness of unconsciousness, in us, remains unchanged and as active as ever. Now all the work is based on consciousness, on the power of consciousness to balance, and so heal us for once a thing that we were unaware of is made properly conscious, and is seen in relation to other things, that are conscious already, it becomes its right size, and fits into its proper place, or is seen as ridiculous and so robbed of power. This is balanced through consciousness. It no longer can play the role of some violent or evil bandit waging a guerrilla war, in the hinterland of consciousness. These bandits often turn out to be naughty little boys dressed up. 
Exposed to full light they look silly. It is the same with the action of buffers which prevent full consciousness, and so real conscience. Some of you must know by now that you have inner contradictions in you, that are eventually bound to lead to a fall, like the house divided against itself, which cannot stand. The two sides of the contradictions must be brought together often into the light of consciousness. There is no other remedy. The remedy is precisely simultaneous light not light on one, and then on the other. Now to return to the most valuable thing we can possess this whole plate photograph. It was said that we are saved from the unconscious power of everything represented in it. This is because whatever is represented in it we have, at one time or another, made conscious by a momentary beam of observation. That is, consciousness over many years has touched every part of it. Yes, but the organization of all these snapshot observations, these discontinuous personal events, into a full-size photograph is not one's own work. We did not see the connections of our observations. But something in us did, and finally presented us with the photograph. This, it says, is one aspect of your life that can no longer imprison you. We did not see all the relations between one part and another that we can now trace in the big photograph. For the big photograph is the fitting together of all these separate and apparently unrelated snapshots into a living whole. That which had power over us and which we had to serve as long as it remained in the darkness of unconsciousness has become objective. A living time photograph of this kind is beyond any powers of description in words, because, like everything else coming from higher centers, it has a double significance and a double use. It is enough to say that what was subjective has been made objective and what one was unconscious of has now become conscious. From this point of view it can be said that this work teaches a special kind of photography. I know that if one became possessed of even one of these full-sized photographs one could never undergo an absolute recurrence of the life. With one photograph to study one could never be as before and objective consciousness would not be far away. Now let me point out a few things that apply to everyone. If we were fully conscious we would not need this work. It would not exist on this planet. But we are not fully conscious. If we were, we would be fully conscious of our neighbors, and of us we would then see ourselves in others and others in ourselves and hatred and wars would cease, among other things. You must each reach, and are expected to reach the state of insight into seeing that there is very much in you, that takes charge of you and that you are unconscious of. If you cannot see this probably you will feel mutinous and resist the work openly or silently, as some do. Try to realize your need of the work. Try to realize, even theoretically, that there are many people in you that you are not conscious of and so know nothing about who continually overpower you and make you do and say just what they wish so that you cannot call your life your own. Never believe you are a well-balanced person. That belief makes you stiff and slow. You are one-sided, and the more one-sided you are the more will you think you are balanced. Remember, that a balanced man is many-sided and flexible. Notice you do not behave consciously all the time by any manner of means. If you believe you do, you are simply a fool, and fast asleep. You are not what you think you are. But you are many things that you do not think you are, and are not yet in the least conscious of. It does not require much increase of consciousness through self-observation for you to begin to suspect this actually is the case. One should suspect oneself, not others. Now it is useless holding out against these few general statements taken from the work. To do so may point merely to offended dignity, which is commonplace, or to something more serious. The work, of course, is the reverse of flattering to you, or me, or anyone else. Let me remind you finally that she said. We must move our brains every day, apart from other things. He also said that this work is to make us think in a new way both about ourselves and life on this planet. We tend to sit in the semi-fetid atmosphere of our small minds with every window shut, clasping an appallingly hideous imaginary I that is continually squealing or grabbing at something that does not belong to it. This is the extent of our consciousness. This is man in the second state of consciousness. Amwell 26.7.52 Self-love. It is little use being on this disciplinary planet resenting everything. Like other negative states resentment makes bad chemistry. The negative psychology fitted onto a healthy body poisons it. Here you have at least to remember two things. 
The first is that your being attracts your life. In short, there is something wrong with the way you take things. The other is that since creation comes from the interaction of three forces, a trinity composed of active, passive, and neutralizing powers, there will always be a passive, second, or resisting force, to oppose you in the very nature of things. It is not just someone else's fault. Also, it is useless personifying second force as the devil. These two factors, one inside, the other outside, we ignore. We don't really listen. Our self-love is deaf. We prefer to take things personally. At the Institute, although we were told that personality had scarcely any right to exist there, no one grasped quite what it meant. I fancy we did not even know we had personalities to separate from. It takes so long to see. I did not realize that one meaning of this remark was that I must not take everything personally. If I had known and practiced absence from resentment instead of a sort of tolerant, weary, British patience concealing my resentments, I would have understood some practical things earlier. Instead I made a point of shaving, however unearthly the hour we had to be up at, because, of course, one had to keep up appearances. I was not separating myself from personality, but the reverse. That is the worst of ideals. I was following pictures. Putting the matter in another way, I was following my self-love, not diminishing it. Moreover, at that time I was seeking the work mainly from self-love, expecting to become a magician with supernormal powers. Now I am not speaking of resentment, that one does not show, but of the practice of absence from resentment, which is another matter. Politely concealing resentment does not change the underlying love of self. The practice of absence from resentment does. The work, with all its teachings, ideas, and diagrams, seeks to transform the self-love. It is not enough to love oneself. One has got to love the work also. What on earth is this self-love? What is it like? How does it act? It is indeed difficult to grasp that as mechanical men and women we are based upon it. Let us try to find illustrations, approximations, and definitions. We can say of it that it has endless disguises. It is a wolf in many sheep's clothing. In itself it resents injury. It hates being laughed at it cannot laugh at itself. It would like every event to reflect merit on itself and everyone who admired and if possible bow down to it. In the latter case it disguises itself as extreme modesty and is very humble. But if stung by something overheard it speaks with a voice like a wasp in a tree jar. It is at bottom quite callous save to those who enhance its merit. To these it may disguise itself as kindness which becomes hard-faced if a criticism or mistake is made. One may be sure that whatever the self-love does it has its own interests in view, however you exclaim you cannot believe it. Public buildings, munificent gifts, free libraries, benefit others, but enhance the donor's repute, which is the real object. What the motive appears to be, and what it is, is not the same just as it is with each of us we should know all this in ourselves. One writer speaks of the self-love in these words, what is more restless at heart, more easily provoked, more violently enraged, and the love of self, and it is as often as it is not honored according to the vanity of its heart, or when anything does not succeed according to its pleasure and desire. Now no one can see his self-love directly. It is only possible to see the results of it. Resentment, restlessness, being very easily provoked or violently enraged are results that one can perchance observe. One prefers not to, or rather, the self-love will not permit it. Again, all negative emotions are results of self-love, injured or dissatisfied. Do you know all negative emotions lead down to violence to the prehistoric man, the prehistoric woman? What we want lies on the other side of all that. Now some transformation of the love of self would mean some release from violence, and so something of a new will, that is not self-will. Will springs from what we love. Self-love and self-will are twin. I described in a recent commentary a man with a new will, whom I met beyond the gulf of prehistoric bones, beyond violence. He showed more resentment. His self-love must have been transformed perhaps into love of God a more appropriate into a more dei or love of neighbor. But you can't have the latter, without the former, it so happens. In any case, the point is that the basis of self-love makes us all unhappy.
We all have this basis, and it is useless looking down on another, and saying thank God I have no self-love like that for it is simply your self-love speaking once more in a thin disguise. Self-love, self-will, self-righteousness such as I keep all the commandments these three make an ugly trio. Another kind of righteousness altogether is spoken of in the Gospels and in the work. It has nothing to do with the righteousness of the false personality, with meritoriousness, with reputation, with outward appearances, with audience which have all to do with the love of self. Do you yet realize that you may do good, and speak truth, and practice sincerity, and behave justly all from the love of self, and all for the sake of reputation, appearance, honor, or gain, and in yourself who will nothing good, and think absolutely nothing of truth? It is the person in yourself that the work seeks to change. This concealed inner man or woman is the subject for transformation, so that if all social and police fears and all external restraints were removed, it would not rush into every sort of evil that comes out of the self-love. Now life education is, or should be, an education of the self-love. One gets prizes. What else is there for schoolmasters to work on? It is both desirable and necessary. It is preferable to be among people who have an educated self-love and among boors. But, speaking paradoxically, although it is desirable and necessary, it stands in the way of the work. The work may find no point of entry, and the inner perception of its truth may never be experienced. Given force from another, it may enter the person, but the underlying self-love will keep on casting it out and the deputy steward will scarcely be formed. The deputy steward deposes the self-love. The steward himself makes war on it. Now one way to attack the self-love is through self-observation. One or two of the stupid inventions of the self-love about oneself may be noticed. They may be brought gradually into the light of consciousness. Self-observation lets in light. Light illumines ridiculousness. One laughs at oneself and thus begins to injure one's own self-love. It shows a considerable step forward to be able to laugh sincerely at part of one's self-love. What is conscious that is, the light meets what was operating unconsciously, in the darkness. The white and black meet, in however small a way at first. But each time it happens thus, self-love is diminished, and consciousness increases, at its expense. It is wonderful to catch a glimpse of your self-love, and be able to laugh at it. One loses the former highly explosive oversensitive feeling of, I, more and more. That means more balance. That means becoming softer. You may by observing one clear aspect of your self-love over a long period be given a full-sized photograph of it as it has run through your time body. But we have spoken of all that already. One word more. The untransformed self-love, as I indicated, prevents change in the level of being. In one of the epistles Paul speaks of the difficulty he has with people in his groups who do not really care for what he is teaching in itself, but come for other reasons. He says they all seek their own fill. I point to one. In another place, item. I, I, I point seven, where he is speaking openly of lovers of self he says they are ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. He means that having only self-love, and no love for his teaching they cannot raise their level enough to perceive internally the truth of what he taught, and know it for themselves. Note the subject of self-love is so immense that only a few sides of it are mentioned in this paper. All life is based on self-love. Everywhere people are seeking to gratify their self-love in one way, or another, or seeking revenge for what they imagine are injuries against their self-love. One or two things can be mentioned. One of the great dangers that threaten humanity is organized self-love. This is done by giving people a certain ideal, and drilling the young in it, but I am not going to speak of that any further. You can think about it for yourselves. Do you agree that the following is a simple universal illustration of self-love? Smith despises Brown and laughs at him. Brown despises Smith and laughs at him. But Smith cannot laugh at Smith nor can Brown laugh at Brown. That is the trouble with us all. That is why the work tells us to separate from personality. I have to work on Nicole and be able to laugh at him. It is quite easy for others to laugh at him. But that is not what is meant. Amwell 31.7.52 Self-love and the universe. If a man changes himself, his view of the universe in which he lives changes also. The one cannot change without the other. 
Just as what he was becomes something different, so what he lives in becomes something different. He no longer feels himself in the same way, as he once did, and he no longer feels the world in the same way, as he did. What is your view of the universe in which you live? Perhaps you have taken it for granted just as you have taken yourself for granted. That is to say, you have not thought much about either. In my case, I could regard the universe simply as a vast machine, so vast that a ray of light which travels at 186,000 miles per second would take millions of years to cross it. It contains billions of stars, far more than we can see with the naked eye. These stars are arranged in great masses called galaxies. Our Sun is a star in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Our galaxy is shaped like a disk. As we are in the disk, looking upwards we see a thick band of stars overhead. There are about 100,000 million stars, like suns, in our galaxy. The 100 telescope at Mount Wilson in America has discovered that there are some 100 million of these galaxies within the limits of its range, which penetrates to a distance of 1 billion light years. Start try to conceive for yourself the distance that light will travel in a single year going at a speed of 186,000 miles per second, which is a light year, and then try to conceive a distance of 1 billion light years. It is inconceivable to us, although it may not be to some greater mind. A ray of light starting from the second nearest star to us in our own galaxy the Sun is the nearest star to us takes more than four years. To reach us this means that we see it, where it was four years ago. We see the Sun, however, where it was eight minutes ago. None of the stars, owing to their distances, and the limited speed of light which crawls through interstellar space, is where it seems to be. In this universe, vast beyond belief, of incredible depths, the Earth swims, as a minute speck illuminated on one side. On this half-dark, half-light speck, you and I, full of self-love and self-importance, exist as two still more infinitesimally minute specks. This is our situation in the visible universe in terms of physical magnitude, extended in a space of three dimensions. As regards the fourth or time dimension, it has a peculiar relationship to our present moment of time, because we do not see where the stars are, but where they were in the past. We see the universe in the past, as it was. It would be awkward if the same thing happened to the objects in our room. We would see them, but not touch them. Now what is the effect of all this on the self-love? Does it make men walk more humbly before God, as the phrase goes, does it diminish man's exalted idea of his own importance? It did once, but not now. Some centuries ago when Galileo asserted that the earth not only rotated but moved around the sun, man's self-love, not being able to adjust to this idea, was seriously offended, so much so that Galileo was had up by the Inquisition, and had to recant in public. That was the occasion on which he muttered, all the same it does movie P.U.R. Shemov. Hither two people had actually thought that the minute speck, our Earth, was the immovable center of the entire universe, with all its myriad stars, which obligingly and humbly revolved round it, together with the Sun, once in twenty-four hours. But there is always a way to reassert one's self-love, if it receives a shock, when faced by anything breathtaking, or stupendous. One can scribble one's name on it. Seeing the Parthenon for the first time, one can at least scribble one's name on one of the pillars. By the spit of cheek the self-love, like an oddy boy, recovers its jauntiness. Some modern astronomers seem, as the discovery of the wider range of the telescope has been made since the author's death it has been thought advisable to amend the figure, to do much the same in regard to the universe. It is a favorite technique of the self-love, to disparage whatever threatens its supremacy. One can always sneer. Science tells us that the universe, however gigantic, is nothing to feel any awe or wonder about. It came into existence accidentally and is meaningless. So that's that. Since self-love hates what is greater or superior to it, one suspects that this hatred, originating in the self-love, is behind the modern scientific negation of purpose and meaning in anything. Everything can be explained away, even the exquisite order. That can be discerned in the structure of the most minute things such as atoms, as well, as in the vast things such as solar systems and galaxies. Nature is viewed as a series of Chinese boxes, one within the other, and the scientists are already saying, we hope quite soon to open the last, smallest, innermost box of all. They do not add that it will certainly be declared empty, whatever they find. 
when Jung said to Freud that many dreams had other interpretations, and those of retrogressive sexual wish fulfillments, and some showed useful prospective directions for personal development, he was told that that kind of thing must not be admitted. Jung refused not to admit it. Today the quarrel with science in general is with its interpretations, some of which are of amazingly poor quality. But many scientists are afraid to say what they think. To declare that there is intelligence behind the universe means ostracism. Now the idea of a mechanical, accidental, meaningless universe will not help man to raise the level of his being. It will have a contrary effect, and naturally does. Feeling neither awe nor wonder, the self-love is not affected. It was said in the previous commentary, that if the self-love remains just the same no one can change in himself, or herself. Although this was not much understood, I will only say, that it is useless to argue about it. It is, of course, always the self-love, that is arguing, being afraid to lose its power over you. Have you not noticed the self-love is very sensitive to attack? The work mentions two giants that walk before us and arrange everything for us beforehand. They are pride and vanity. These two aspects of the self-love are very sensitive to anything that might depose them. They are cruel lords to serve. The work cannot walk before us, as it should in all things, as long as the strength of these two empty mindless and barren giants is not diminished. Long observation of them does weaken them. But look for a moment at this, it is the quality of your love for the work that determines your valuation of it and its power to change you. If this love is distinct from your self-love, then your observation of the giants will begin to weaken them. The work weakens them, but if your love of the work is only another manifestation of your self-love, your observation of the giants will not weaken, but strengthen them. Now we know, from the teaching of the work, that the universe is a creation, and not a dead, inexplicable, accidental and meaningless thing. It is a living thing of systems within systems, each with purpose and meaning, each living and capable of developing or degenerating. We are created in it with purpose and meaning, living and capable of development or degeneration. Humanity on the earth is, in fact, a special experiment in self-evolution. Something more is demanded of us than simply living and making our living. It is the something extra that we study by means of the work teachings. The work is about this something extra. So on the one hand, as I said at the beginning, I can regard the universe as a vast machine, accidental, meaningless and dead, or I can look on it in the light of what the work says about it. Which attitude is likely to diminish my self-love, and so change me? I leave you to answer for me, and for yourself. I mentioned at the beginning, that probably you have not thought much about the universe, and so have no view of it. You take it for granted. Yet it is what you exist in the work emphatically calls attention to it. But people are scarcely aware even that they live in the solar system. It seems strange that they will not extend their consciousness even to this extent. Can you guess the reason? Amwell 9.8.22 Self-love and the inner men. We seek the gift of a new quality of will, which does not mow resentment. Collecting in our minds everything belonging to our personal work memory and all we have understood so far of what the work is saying to us, we will have no difficulty in seeing that this new quality of will cannot be the same as the self-will. The self-will is based on the self-love. The latter continually feels resentment, if not flattered and cosseted. It demands to have its own way, and won't listen to anyone. It can turn into that burning anger that is so difficult to put out without memory, and mental agility, and then into hate, and finally into violent action. The advantages of receiving the gift of a new quality of will from which resentment is absent are so numerous and obvious that it is hardly necessary to mention them. But I will indicate one or two. To have a will characterized by absence from resentment would be to become a new man, that is, another kind of man. Such a man, for instance, would move through the crisscross confusion of jealousies and ambitions and the tangle of human relations in general without losing force. For us, our more conscious energies are soon used up and we plunge into mechanical reaction. For him it would be otherwise. Where we sank, he would continue to walk. I said that he would be another kind of man. Many years ago we used to be asked this question, what do you think a man belonging to the conscious circle of humanity would be like? By what signs would you know him? 
Naturally some thought he would be tall, and an expressively handsome, a commanding figure with beautiful dark penetrating eyes, perfectly dressed, and with perfect manners, and all the rest of it. Some thought he would be very strong with enormous muscles, a jutting jaw, an unbreakable will, and tremendous energy. Some rather naive people thought he would be extremely well connected. Their imagination went no further. Al Spensky pointed out that all these very human suppositions about a conscious man were based on an exaggerated ordinary mechanical man. He said that a conscious man was an other kind of man, a man totally different from an ordinary man. In short, a new man. Now, from what we know and have heard, we might venture to think that a conscious man would not be impressed by any of the manifestations of the self-love so unpleasantly rampant in us. In fact, he might attack them. That would be one sign to know him by. He might tell us to strip all that kind of thing off. A further sign would be absence from resentment, pointing to the possession of a new will. You will see at once that a conscious man could not have a will founded on self-love. A conscious man is a man who has undergone a change of being actually a transformation of being. As it was pointed out to you in recent papers, no change of being is possible as long as the self-love remains unchanged. And as long as the self-love remains the same, the self-will remains just what it was. You will continue to obey yourself. You will not inwardly acknowledge anything above yourself. You will not inwardly obey the work, though you may pretend to it outwardly. You will not refresh your inner man with it because you do not inwardly believe it. I wish now to speak more of the outer and inner man. I adopt these terms partly from a remark of Paul in one of his letters to his group at Corinth. He is speaking of his own faith, though he had, of course, never seen Christ. He writes, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day ICOR. IV.16 It is this renewing, or making fresh again, as the Greek word has it of the inner, ESO, man accompanied at the same time by the perishing or wasting away of the outer, exo, man, that we should pay attention to. It reminds us of the work teaching about making the personality passive and the essence active. Through the gradual wasting of the personality, through withdrawing energy from its mechanical reactions, which makes it passive, the essence develops. That is, the essence can only develop at the expense of the personality. The personality we can relate to the outer, exo or external part of ourselves that surrounds the essence, and the essence to the surrounded inner, ESO, part. Esoteric Christianity refers to the inner meaning of what Christ taught, exoteric Christianity refers to the outer literal meaning and ritual. Now the internal essence and its understanding can only grow through what is genuine. Lies kill it. Truth develops it. It has a high origin. What is false strengthens outer personality, which has life on earth as its origin. Again, what is of the self-love is not genuine and so can only strengthen personality. Paul is talking in his own way about how a genuine faith renews, or stimulates, or makes alive again the inner man, and weakens the outer man, though our outward man perish yet the inner man is renewed day by day. Now the whole of the work may lie in the outer man or personality. You then get a clear result. The work, which does not come from life, but from a high origin, instead of leading to a development of the inner man or essence, which also has a high origin, strengthens the outer man or personality which has a low origin, and comes from life. Such a person may appear to believe all that the work teaches, although he sounds tinny. And since in such a case there can be no renewing of the inner man, day by day, there is no refreshment given him from within. The work remains on the surface of his mind, as mere memory, and not as something working deeply, continually leading to a further perception of truth. When Christ spoke of people who were whited sepulchres it was meant that the outer does not correspond to the inner. Christ said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Matt. We have to look, then, at the quality of the inner man. I spoke of this in the last paper. It is a very necessary and practical exercise, just as is practicing absence from resentment. What would you appear like if the external were stripped off you now, and only the internal remained? What lies behind your polite facade?
If you appeared just the same after it was stripped off you might indeed congratulate yourself on having developed essence. I am afraid that the external show of an average man or woman bears little resemblance to the internal show. Now it is the internal and its state that counts in the work not the facade. Speaking specifically of the relation of the outer and inner side of a person to this work, there are people who may say they believe it and speak well of it and have taught others and so have done good for the sake of the work. Yet if the outer man were stripped off them and they were left only with their inner man exposed the case would appear quite otherwise. More internally it would be seen that they do not believe one jot in the work and what it teaches. They do not think well of it and, in short, have used it to produce some kind of outer impression on others, such as having great knowledge or knowing all about esotericism and so on. The astonishing thing is that they do not observe their contradictions, one of the things which the work tells us to observe. Being incapable of observing what is going on in their interiors, they may believe they believe, or persuade themselves they do, refusing to face themselves by a single glance within. Now as regards this inner man in you, when your consciousness of yourself has increased enough for you to see better what you are like underneath the illusions of the self-love, then, for the first time you may see why Christ so often, and so harshly said, a hypocrite. This had no real meaning to you before. You could not seriously believe you were the hypocrite. You could not without any extra light of consciousness to help you. But when more light came, and the grip of the self-love thereby began to be loosened through some experiences of genuine self-observation without self-justifying or self-pity, an increase of consciousness was gained, and you began no doubt to understand this saying, and probably many others. They meant something to you for the first time. You began no doubt to understand why the work is called esoteric Christianity, that is, the inner meaning of the teaching in the Gospels a thing impossible to attain without work on yourself, beginning with a self-observation, that is without criticism or self-justification or self-pity. A final word, you may say you inwardly believe the work. Perhaps you do. You are your own judge of that. But I would ask you one thing, have you faith in your belief? If you are not faithful to it daily it will not, like a plant, grow. Amwell 16.8.52 Review of Essence and Personality Let us review briefly what we can now understand about essence and personality at this stage of our study of the work. There is first the teaching that man is of two distinct parts called essence and personality. This is, so to speak, the first great mystery about man, the second being that he is asleep. The next thing is that a man is born as essence only, and has no personality. In this condition he is harmless like all very young things. The third thing is that essence only grows a little and becomes surrounded by personality. The next thing is that essence and personality are not under the same number of laws. Essence manifesting itself in the newborn child is under 24 orders of laws and personality manifesting itself in the growing child is under 48 orders of laws. Man therefore has two lives possible to him, one belonging to essence and the other to personality. The fifth thing is that personality becomes active and in consequence essence becomes passive. The personality and its life dominate the essence which remains undeveloped. The sixth thing is that the object of the work is to reverse this state in man and cause essence to become active and personality passive. When this state is attained, the life of essence dominates the life of personality. The man is then from the work point of view developed or complete man, as distinct from an undeveloped or incomplete man. The seventh thing is that life and the world act as neutralizing or third force to keep personality active and essence passive. It is only when the work becomes neutralizing force that a reversal can take place and essence become active and personality passive. Let us content ourselves at present with these seven points or teachings specifically given by the work concerning personality and essence and continue by way of commentaries. I will take, to begin with, the two possible major triads in man just mentioned. Here, let us suppose, is a man having in him the triad made up of personality as active or first force, essence as passive or second force and life as neutralizing or third force. This is his great configuration. Or, put in another way, this determines his relation to life. This configuration or relation is necessary and inevitable for so-called civilized Western man. It happens to us all. 
Now let us suppose the existence of a man in whom the major triad is made up of essence as active, or first force, personality as passive, or second force, and the work, as neutralizing or third force. Such a configuration or relation is not necessary for a man to get along in five, and certainly is not inevitable. It does not happen. It is not mechanically brought about. To attain it at least two things are needed. The first is to find a teaching designed precisely to lead to this state in which a new neutralizing force exists. The second is to find this teaching in oneself and so do all it teaches. Such a teaching will be against life, because life has produced the first triad, and cannot produce the second triad. That is why it is said that the work, not life, must become neutralizing, or third force for the configuration of the second triad to take place. Notice that it will be useless merely to seek to change one's life, by taking up a new profession, or by playing the harpsichord, or living in another country. All that is life. This becomes seen better, as one begins to awaken. It prevents wrong or useless efforts or efforts to avoid real effort. Inner taste, in short, develops. Again, it will be useless merely to give up going about, or going to theaters, or reading novels, or playing on the harpsichord, and so on. No, what is important is to do what you did differently inside, for example, observing what you are like without identifying as you did, without always making accounts against others, or getting so negative, or feeling so resentful. The inner work can lead to change of the life triad eventually. Now people often talk too glibly about the work being a new neutralizing force, without realizing what this means. They see the work triad put up on the blackboard and nod their heads. They have seen that diagram before. Let us consider what it may mean, and begin by considering what it does not mean. If a man or woman continues to live, speak, feel, think, act, and behave as they always have, although they are being given the work teaching, then life remains their neutralizing force, and not the work. They do not really value and so do not obey the work. They value and obey life. There is nothing reprehensible in this. Why shouldn't they? Why begin to strip off their clothes which they believe comfortable on the vague promise of being given new ones that will suit them better? It is true that, remaining based on the self-love, which is a necessary characteristic of the life triad, and therefore always liable to resent anything, and everybody, they often experience distress or anger or unhappiness. But they will not perceive that this is because they wear a cruel hair shirt underneath their surface apparel without knowing it. They cannot perceive it because they do not value self-observation and change. All the familiar life giants that spring from the self-love, the giants of pride, of vanity, and envy, all their innumerable attendant giants of jealousy and power and covetousness and hate, that keep human life, as it is, will prevent them. Such is the power of the first or the life triad. It is something that we, asleep in the apparently soft cocoon of self-love, only begin to see when we stir, and begin to awaken and to emerge from the illusions that we are free and conscious, and can do as we decide. I advise you always to observe self-love in yourselves, and realize what it does to you, whether subtly or crudely. We are riddled with its evil poisons. Let no one tell me they do not have any, or do not know what it is. That is the voice of self-love speaking. But let us leave the matter there, and say a word as to what the work as third force does mean, and why esoteric or inner teaching must exist, as well as life education, in view of the two distinct and discontinuous parts of men namely, personality and essence. Personality is developed by life, and has to be. But life does not develop essence. Why not? This is what the attention must be focused on. Why should not life bring essence to its full development? How is it that a man in whom life has developed a full personality cannot proceed smoothly to a full development of essence? Surely, if life can do the first it can do the second equally easily? Not at all, life cannot. Life can provide the food for the development of personality, but not the food necessary for the development of essence. The secret is that personality and essence need different foods for their respective development. They need different kinds of truths. For example, the education of personality is developed by a knowledge of the truths of science, but essence is not. A knowledge, say, of the world markets and the political situation develops personality, but essence is not developed by knowing truths of this kind. 
essence, before it is manifested in a human body, derived from the parents on earth, comes from a much higher level, and the planetary world, under 24 orders of laws. It is said, that it comes from the stars. Our sun is a star in our galaxy of stars called the Milky Way. Whether you say it comes from the level of the sun, or from outside our solar system does not matter for the moment. The point is that it has a very high origin, in vertical scale. By comparison, personality has a very low origin, whatever one's ancestry in the past in horizontal time. Now essence ceases to grow because it has not the right food from life to grow by. But if a man, imbued with the knowledge of this work, whose origin is the conscious circle of humanity, which in the Gospels is called the Kingdom of Heaven, continually steeps his mind in its truths, and thinks, and thinks again from them and perceives their depth, and acknowledges them, and applies them to his in her states, essence will begin to grow. He is giving it the right food, that the business of life does not supply. His energies will cease to flow only downwards into his personal reactions, but begin to flow upwards, like the mythical Jordan, to another level, where essence lies. For essence and personality are on different levels. We are also. One is under fewer laws than the other. This means it is on a higher level. Only the kind of truth that the work teaches develops essence. If a man loves it, he eventually wills it, and if he wills it, he does it. It is this willing to do this truth of the work, that forms the new will in a man of which we have spoken recently. It is this willing to do the truth of the work, that develops essence. This is its right food, which it came down to receive. Essence is deathless. When the body of flesh and bones is laid aside it returns to the place from which it came, taking what it has received. This willing of the work is not from the self-will, which comes from the self-love. The will of the personality takes second place to this will. The will of the outer personality obeys the will of the inner essence. It is content to say, not my will, but thine be done. Having made the personality passive, through the developed essence becoming active, by the power, that comes from doing the truth of the work, which is stronger than life, the man has now attained the secret and, and hidden meaning of his creation. From being the semi-man that life made him he is now a complete man. Amwell 23.8.52 essence, and a return journey? The following quotation is of some interest in view of the subject of recent papers. It is as follows, I dwell in the high and holy place with him, who is of a contrite and humble spirit. Isa. LVII.15, whatever this means, it suggests that a man filled with the love of himself, who never questions his own importance, is not likely to be able to ascend in the scale of being to any higher level of development. Presumably the speaker in the above quotation is on a high level, because he says that he dwells in the high and holy place. To ascend to his level, a person must apparently be humble and contrite. We know, that there are ascending, and descending lives in this world, and no doubt in any other world also. But we know specifically that some definite thing is meant by ascent in the work. I mean, that we know that an ascending octave do, re, me proceeds from what is coarser to what is finer, and that it always begins with passive do. Now do you imagine, that the self-love is a passive thing? Would you say, that it is humble and contrite? Obviously self-love and all its children pride, vanity, power, egotism, and the rest, have nothing contrite or humble about them. A man will not ascend by the raid to new being, now, a passive do means that whatever it refers to can be acted on by something above it in scale. It yields to what is higher than itself. On the other hand, an active do means that whatever it is, it acts on something else, and is not acted upon. Consider the food 768 taken into the body. It is acted on by digestive juices. That is to say, it is passive, because it submits to their action which breaks the food into finer, and, therefore, cleverer and more useful matters which pass into the blood, while all that is useless is cast out. This is what the work should do to us psychologically, if we only would allow it to. But the self-love will do all it can to prevent this from happening. In the case of the food octave, the first step consists in passive do 768 which is ordinary food being transformed into the higher matters classified as 384 and so on upward stage by stage to matter 12. If 768 entered, as an active do it could only go downwards, in the scale of matters becoming denser and denser, and, therefore, more stupid and more useless. 
so it is psychologically with anyone whose unregenerate, unfaced and unfought self-love is dominant, for this blocks the way to any ascending octave. Self-love is not passive and it refuses to be acted on. Now since essence descends from a high place and becomes ultimately encased in a body of flesh and bones, an ascending octave must exist in man connected with this descent. The idea here is that essence having descended may be able to reascend that is, to retrace the path of its descent. If essence reascended and the center of gravity of a man's consciousness and being were truly situated in essence instead of in personality, then the reascent of essence would be the ascent of the man also to the level of his origin. It would be the return journey. This idea of the return journey is mentioned in many places in ancient esoteric literature, as in the hymn of the robe of glory in Gnostic writings, and it is obviously referred to in the parable of the prodigal son, in the Gospels, Luke XV, the prodigal son, who was in all probability a man, who had attained all the desires of his self-love, and found that everything tasted like husks, and nothing was real perhaps he has been a multi-millionaire as described as coming to himself. He became aware in some way or other that he was not going in the right direction, and had come to the end of things. Everything had become meaningless, as it does easily when only the gratification of the self-love and its ambitions is the object. So he says, after having come to himself, I will arise, and go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have missed the mark. So he arose, and came to his father. It does not mean his earthly father his father rejoices, and says, Make merry, this my son was dead, and is alive again, he was lost, and is found. You will see some significance in these words dead and lost. When a man turns round and, leaving personality behind, begins to move in the direction of essence, he ceases to be dead, or to be lost. Seeking the development of essence through the internal man and turning away from the falsities and insincerities and shallow professions of the external man, he begins to become alive instead of being dead inwardly, in spirit. He begins to see what he has to do, what is curious in him, what he has to observe and make more and more conscious, and work on, and what he has to strip off and leave behind. So he is no longer lost, aimlessly drifting through the years. He is going somewhere now. He is going on a real journey, it is a long journey, but he will soon begin to feel he is being helped. This is why in the parable it says, But when he was yet a great way off his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran to welcome him. The phrase a great way off indicates that the journey from personality to essence is a long one. Compassion and welcome indicate help. It is, as if the work were speaking, and saying that when a man really comes to himself that is, when he remembers himself, and recognizes himself he knows that he is not the person he is always pretending to be, or has taken himself to be, and that he is going in the wrong direction, in trying to keep it up. It is curious that this parable is called the parable of the prodigal son. What was he prodigal of? Some people seriously think it refers to money. They take it sensually, literally, and imagine it was used by thrifty parents who unknowingly were eating husks themselves. You will notice that the word prodigal does not occur in the parable. It is really a parable about a man who, however successful, finds that life does not give him what he expected, and who, realizing that he must have some other origin and life, which does not make sense taken by itself, and something else to do apart from the business of living, sets out to unlearn all the falsity that life and its fashions have filled him with, and to strip off all the attitudes that his vanity and self-illusions have formed in him. It is really a parable about the return to one's origin not to one's mother but to something beyond and different. The man has discovered his true origin. He has discovered essence. His whole emotional life begins to change. He has caught the rope overhead not by being merely told about it, but by jumping for it himself, by an effort of his very own, by an inner act of his inner man. In connection with the realization of our vertical origin as distinct from our temporal origin and the resulting recognition of oneself, I will give a few quotations. Without comment, Christ said, Call no man your father upon the earth, Matt. point nine. When his mother speaks to him at the miracle of water into wine, he says, Woman, what have I to do with thee? John I.4. Elsewhere he says, Know ye not that ye are all sons of God? I will give a brief extract from the Hermetic literature, Hermetica BK1. 
The writer is speaking of the Creator setting the cycles of birth and death of all living things on earth going, including man. But man is different from all the rest of organic life about which we shall speak in a moment. Man has within him something more than animals, and this he must get to know. He has mind over and above sense. Let man, who has mind in him, recognize he is immortal. He who has recognized himself enters into that good which is above. He adds that those who do not wander in the darkness of the sense world and repeat to dream birth into it. Lastly, there is Jacob's vision of the ladder stretching between heaven and earth with figures ascending and descending, and he Jacob dreamed, and behold a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Genesis 12, you must think for yourselves what these few references must indicate. Now we can see that none of what is said above can be similarly applied to the personality. I mean, that there is no return journey via the personality because it is on the level of life and created by life. There is, therefore, no ascent in the scale of being through the personality. It did not descend into this earth life as essence did but was made by this life. The main problem with personality, eventually, is to make its power almost negligible at will. It can then be used. Now, let us return to the origin of essence. We understand that organic life originated from the level of intelligence represented visibly by the sun. It is simpler just to use the term sun. It became necessary for the sun to create a sensitive living film on the earth capable of receiving influences coming down the ray of creation and passing them on to the terminal point of our particular ray namely, the moon. We will have to speak in terms of allegory. The sun was willing to undertake this task, only it made the condition that it must receive something for itself, as a reward for all the labor of planning, creating, experimenting, and maintaining the sensitive film of organic life on earth. For this purpose, after having made the conditions on earth suitable for his existence, it created man as a self-developing organism. That is, it gave man more than was necessary. The special creation was purely experimental. It may fail. The point was that if a sufficient number of human beings developed themselves beyond what was necessary for mere existence and survival on the earth, they could rise in the scale of being to the level of what is represented as the sun. The sun would then receive something for itself. For this purpose also, a certain kind of teaching, giving directions for the self-development, was sown in suitable places and times on the earth. Owing to the level of man's intelligence it could not be presented except in a difficult and seemingly distorted way. This is what is meant by sea influences coming from the conscious circle of humanity inevitably changing into B influences on the earth. The trouble lies in our ordinary thinking, which cannot embrace the opposites, although our higher centers can. For the rest, organic life was made a kind of pain factory in which everything has to make continual effort or suffer in different ways, and all this birth, pain, death, suffering, and fear, and also negative emotion and anxiety, produces vibrations which are food for the nourishment of the growing moon. Such, very briefly, is our situation in organic life on earth. Paul speaks somewhere about the whole of creation groaning together, awaiting the birth of the sons of God. He says, for the earnest expectation of created nature waiteth for the revelation of the sons of God. For we know, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. Rom. VIII.1922 It is not known in what school Paul was taught, but this phrase seems similar to what the work teaches. You also find similar hints scattered through the Gospels. Man. Therefore, as distinct from other forms of life, has a chance in this difficult world of suffering, pain, and danger, and his position is not hopeless. He has that in him which comes from above, although being asleep he has forgotten his origin, and believes only in his senses. If he develops his relationship to that which comes from above, after first developing his necessary relationship to that which comes from life, he can ascend to the level of his origin. We can suppose that the term sons of God refers to those who have undergone this development and ascended to another level of experience. Both the Gospels and the work give directions about how to begin this ascent. If you ponder on what is said, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, you will become convinced that it is not the self-love and the various crude or subtle forms in which it can manifest itself that point the way to this ascent. Some other love is the starting point. 
Amwell, 30.8.52. The antagonism between the self-love and the work. Can some of you not yet observe and not yet laugh at even one manifestation of your self-love a little? Are you still too proud or smugly self-satisfied or just blind to yourself? Remember that no change in your psychology can take place as long as your love of self remains unchanged. When the body of flesh and bones is laid aside you can take nothing with you except your psychology. You become your psychology. You become the victim of it. If you hate, you find yourself in hatred with all those who similarly hate. You then all hate one another. Hate springs from the self-love that has been offended or slighted or made fun of. The person who is always feeling insulted is full of the love of himself. He hates people. There is an extraordinary amount of hate in the world today. Hate makes people subhuman in behavior, as we have witnessed in recent years. To begin to grasp what you are psychologically, ask yourself frequently what your relation is to the good of the work, to the truths it teaches about ourselves. What is your relation to its good and to its truth? I speak of one's inner that is, one's real relation, not what one's false personality pretends, or displays, or imagines. Your psychological body is rightly organized according to your inner relation to the work. Let us make some reflections on this inner relation. When people secretly feel they are doing a kindness to the work by associating themselves with it, they have no inner relation to the work and actually are in psychological danger. A man or a woman must truly want the work more than the present state of their lives to begin to have an inner relation to it. They must be careful never to patronize it outwardly or inwardly. I have witnessed the ruthless consequences of doing so to connect the work with the personal self-love is to value oneself more than the work. Is that plain? The psychological body is then in disorder and cannot be formed. One sign of this is that these people who at bottom love and value themselves and their present lives before all else never get hold of anything clearly that the work teaches. Everything is muddled and confused and obscure to them. The reason is that the thought has no clear direction. It is as if opposing currents meet in a stream and stir up mud in the swirl. They go around and round. Why? Because the work threatens the self-love. How do you suppose you can think clearly about the work when your self-love secretly detests it or ridicules it? Your thoughts will not take it in in this connection I quote again a remark made by Paul in his second letter to Timothy. He is speaking about what happens when a self-love meets esoteric truth. He is referring especially to the end of the age in which we are now living when everything is cracking little by little as she said. He mentions various signs and symptoms of the general breakup of all good and truth and the rise of evil and falsity. Among other things he says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, effa, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth item. I, I, I point to 7. You should be able to see the reason why they cannot perceive truth for themselves. The self-love fights against the truths of the work. The truths of the work can waken us the self-love seeks to keep the man or woman asleep. Awakening is thus rendered impossible for them. They are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It must be clear to everyone by now that no one can awaken without self-observation. To awaken, a person must see more and more clearly what he or she is like. This is painful. But it gives us courage to die to ourselves and our self-love. When the self-love is strong it prevents all self-observation. A person simply cannot see what is meant when told he is difficult, slow, self-satisfied, lazy, smug, conceited, and so on. The self-love will not accept it. It may get violent. If you cannot see by your own observation, step by step, over long, accumulating time, what you are like, you cannot awaken to what you are like, and so will never desire to die to what you are like. Your consciousness of yourself will not show any increase. And unless you begin to awaken to what you are like, the self-love will continue to have full undisputed power over you. You will think, of course, that you are having power over yourself. You will be grievously, tragically wrong. It will be your pride, your conceit, your vanity, and the annoyance or violence you feel when these are wounded that have power over you. It will be the idea of your own charm and excellence, your self-esteem, self-valuation, self-importance, your polite superiority and contempt of others that will direct you. It will be your inner indifference and downright selfishness and meanness, 
your envy, jealousy, and your desire for power that will control you. All these giants, the offspring of the self-love, have power over you, not you over them. The silly little imaginary, I, this imaginary thing you call, I, makes you imagine that you are marching through life in the multitude of your own cleverness and strength, and that is what is so tragic in us all. No, you are being marched along by these tough, merciless giants. A good subject indeed for a cartoon as are so many things in the work. For example, try to draw your false personality. Yes, these giants are cruel lords. A man much governed, say, by his vanity, suffers often and uselessly from this particular giant. So he is perplexed, often hurt. As I said, recently, it is just as if he wore a hair shirt and did not know it or why he was uncomfortable. All the aspects of the self-love can torment and make us suffer in hundreds and hundreds of ways, all of them useless. They spoil our lives. Therefore we must observe and again observe our self-love and bring it into conscious perception and acknowledge it. This I will call the direct method. Or we must observe time and again what we are really like. This steadily diminishes the love of self. We begin to lose our admiration and love of ourselves as we continue to observe our behavior and what is in us this I will call the indirect method. At points they merge. In both cases, however, you must not justify yourself. Or rather, since this is impossible, you must also observe how you justify yourself. I mean, that you must include in your observation of something in yourself your justifying of it as one complete observation. This we continually forget to do, although we have been taught it often enough. Al Spensky used to emphasize that people's observations of themselves were always incomplete, for one reason, because they did not observe how they criticized or justified themselves afterwards. When you observe also the result on yourself of what you observe you have brought into consciousness what otherwise you would have identified yourself with. Remember, that what you observe distinctly you are not identified with. When you identify with all you say, feel, think, and do, you are not observing it. You are then asleep. Now to continue, let us consider a little more the difficulties of seeing the self-love. Your inner relation to the work, whereby it will nourish you, depends on two things. One is your own perception of the truths it teaches. Some of these truths are that man is asleep and his special task is to awaken from sleep, that one is a multiplicity and not a unity, that one does not remember oneself, that one identifies and internally considers, that one constantly submits to the power of negative emotions, and false personality, that one has only imaginary, I, and makes the fatal mistake of taking it as real I, and so on. These are a few of the truths of the work. I mention this because I was asked recently what I meant by the truths of the work. The second thing that determines your inner relation to the work is doing the work. If you connect yourself by your own inner perception with the truths of the work, and by doing them realize their good, you will receive the two foods necessary for the development of essence. Just as the physical body requires literal food and drink for its nourishment, so does the psychological body require the two psychological foods of good and truth which the work can supply. Now one of the things to do is to observe oneself and realize most thankfully the good of it in process of time. One of the difficulties in self-observation is to bring home to yourself the meaning of the word applied to you. Let us take the word vanity. Someone might say to me, you are vain. Let us suppose the meaning of the word does not come home to me owing to mine ever having observed myself. I might reply, I am not in the least vain and feel vexed. There is a gap here which can only be filled in by oneself. When G told someone years ago that his chief feature was peacock, the person was incredulous. He could not see what was meant, and I believe never did. Yet others could easily see what was meant. This illustrates one of the difficulties of doing the work on the side of observing oneself. You are given a word such as self-love and cannot find any application of it to yourself. On the other hand you may observe at times something you cannot find a word for, and recognize only by inner taste. Perhaps, years later, you realize it is vanity, about which you were incredulous. This is a characteristic experience in the work, and is a sign of the self-love weakening, and letting in some truth about oneself. Now to return to the antagonism between self-love and the work, and the question of the quality of one's inner relation to the work. The matter can be stated simply. 
If your relation to the work is mingled with self-love you will receive nothing real, and the danger is great because the seed of the work may be destroyed. This is the theme of several parables. The seed falling on rocky ground and being destroyed by the heat of the sun is one, and when the sun was risen, it was scorched, and, because it had no root it withered away. Mark IV.6, The sun here is the heat of the self-love. The great parable in this connection is the one dealing with the cleansing of the temple. It means that the inner relation to the work must be cleansed of the element of the self-love and its interests and ambitions. The work is not a business proposition, nor has it to do with life aims. These things cannot develop essence which has come down from another level. The inner relationship to the work, cleansed from the self-love, forms the temple in ourselves. Through this temple communication with the higher level is possible, but not if it is defiled with the self-love and its interests. And Jesus went into the temple of God, and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Matt. XXI.1213 You will notice how harshly the work in the person of Jesus deals with the mingling of the love of self with one's inner relation to it. It is a mixing of two levels which, if not separated in the mind and heart, are mutually antagonistic. It is the psychological meaning of this parable that is important for us today. Amwell 20.9.52 A note on the meaning of faith work introduction. We return for the time being to the necessity of psychological thinking in the work as distinct from sensual thinking. The idea, briefly expressed, is that nobody can develop internally by means of sensual thinking. The kind of thinking based on the senses alone, however logical, carries us only so far. It does not and cannot open the inner mind. Only psychological thinking can do so in this connection we have in the first place the scale the work gives of levels of thinking, greater mind psychological thinking, logical thinking, sense thinking, formatory thinking, illogical thinking, superstition. I will remind you that we were told that unless we believed in the existence of greater mind we could not assimilate the work, that is, take it in so that it becomes a part of us and thus influences us. The ability to reach the level of psychological thinking depends on the conviction of the existence of greater mind. Without psychological thinking we cannot make contact with higher centers. In the second place we have the three primary divisions of the intellectual center, and the emotional center, termed the moving part, the emotional part, and the intellectual part. I will take the intellectual center, and call the moving part the site of the outer or external mind, the emotional part the site of the middle, or intermediary mind, and the intellectual part the site of the inner or internal mind. This latter mind is turned to higher centers. Sensual thinking cannot open it, only psychological thinking can open the inner mind. Now try to notice the points of contact between what has been said above and what follows, which is taken from a chapter in the book being written, provisionally called the Mark. Faith the word translated as faith, pistis, in the New Testament means more than belief. It means another kind of thinking. Let us take an example from the Gospels. In Matthew XVI, 5-12, it is said, And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed, and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is, because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them beware not of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees, and of the Sadducees. In this incident it is clear that the disciples took something said by Christ in its sensual meaning, that is, according to the literal sense of the words. Christ told them that this was a sign, that they had little faith. It is not a question of belief. They may have believed greatly in the seen Christ. Yet they had little faith. What does this mean? It means that faith is something more than belief. In this case, faith means understanding on a level other than literal understanding. Sensual understanding cannot make contact with the meanings contained in Christ's teaching. He was not speaking of literal leaven, but of psychological leaven. Christ was not speaking sensually, but psychologically. 
His words had no sensual meaning, but only psychological meaning. The leaven spoken of was not literal leaven, nor was bread literal bread but falsity infecting good. Sadducees and Pharisees are always within us. The Sadducees can be compared with the scientists of today. They did not believe in any life after death. That is their leaven of falsity. The Pharisees can be compared with people who are in appearances, who, so to speak, think the important thing is to go to church on Sunday to be seen of men. That is their leaven. They were stigmatized as hypocrites, without inner belief. Now Christ here connects the disciples' lack of psychological understanding and consequent inability to see what was meant with littleness of faith. In other words, Christ connects the capacity of psychological understanding with the possession of faith and sensual understanding with littleness of faith, or even elsewhere with blindness, with complete absence of faith and inner death. Faith is necessary to open a part of the mind not opened by the senses. Let us turn now to some other passages concerning faith and its high meanings. Many may have believed in Christ as a visible miracle worker. They believed through what they saw, through the evidence of the senses. But in Hebrews I.1, faith is called a basis for belief in what is not seen. But faith is a basis for things hoped for, a conviction of things unseen. It is not only a conviction of things unseen, but is a basis or plane, on which another world of relations and values can be reached, one, that is above the seen world, and the cause of it. So the unknown writer of Hebrews continues in these words, It is faith that lets us understand how the worlds were fashioned by God's word, how it was that from things unseen all that we see took their origin. The writer goes on to describe how through the possession of faith certain things have been done. Now although it may be true that nowhere in the scriptures is faith exactly defined, but chiefly its effects, certain things are said about it as above to show it has to do with that inner perception of scale. If faith causes a man to perceive in his mind that a world, invisible to sense, lies above the seen world, and is the cause of it, then he perceives things in scale, that is, in terms of higher and lower levels. When the centurion said that he was a man, who was under those above him in authority, while he himself had those who were under him in rank, and added that it must be the same with Christ, he was speaking in terms of scale. He meant that Christ only had to give orders, and his sick servant would be healed. On hearing this Christ exclaimed that never before had he met anyone who understood better what faith meant. It is related that a centurion sent messengers to Christ asking him to heal his servant, and Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say the word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, and having under myself soldiers, and I say unto this one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned and said to the multitude that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole. Luke VII.6-10, to, to return to Hebrews, the writer goes on to say, It is impossible to please God without faith. That is, it is impossible without the basis or foundation of faith, which makes it possible for a man to think beyond the evidence of his senses, and realize the existence of invisible scale, and understand psychological meaning. To realize scale means to realize that there are different levels of meaning, Literal meaning is one thing, psychological or spiritual meaning is another thing, although the words used are the same. For example, we saw that the word yeast used in the incident quoted indicated two levels of meaning. The disciples took it on the lower level and were told it was because their faith was little. Their thinking was sensual. They had difficulty in thinking in a new way on another level. And their psychological thinking was so weak just because they were based on sense and not on faith. Thus sense and faith describe two ways of thinking, not opposites, not antagonistic, but on different levels. For without the perception of scale and levels, things are made to be opposite when they are not so, and man's mind is split into either, or which leads to endless confusions and mental wrangles and miseries. The writer goes on to say, Nobody reaches God's presence until he has learned to believe that God exists and that he rewards those that try to find him. 
it is apparent that if scale is behind all things, if order is scale, and if to set in order is to set in scale, then what is higher, and what is lower must exist. To everything there must be an above and a below. A man who cannot perceive scale, visible or invisible, as did that centurion by means of his psychological understanding due to his great faith, will be shut to the intuitions that only faith opens out to every mind that hitherto has been asleep in the senses, and the limited world revealed by them. Note 1. According to the work diagram, there is an outer, middle and inner mind. Call them what you like, only the outer mind is related to the senses, and the inner mind to higher centers, and their mode of thinking. 2. The inner mind cannot be opened by the love of self for then a man thinks only about himself and always looks to himself in all things, and to nothing higher. 3. If the inner mind is not open the man lives in externals, and has only the senses, and sensual thinking, as his basis of understanding. He has no power of psychological thinking or at least very little, because he is not in touch with higher centers. Amwell, 27.9.52 How Wrong Attitudes Punish Us? The work emphasizes the importance of attitudes. In self-study we are told we must observe our attitudes. It is said that we cannot change unless our attitudes change. A wrong attitude distorts our relationship to things. The work teaches us that we are connected with outer things, as by threads through our attitudes. When you have no attitude towards anything you are not connected with it. If you are completely indifferent, for example, to religion, you may imagine you are very tolerant, but it is really due to your having no attitude to it. The influences that are created in life, such as politics, war, and all its intrigues, riches, social position, business, sport, breaking speed records, drink, gambling, and so on, are called influences. Our attitudes to them connect us with them and hold us to life, not merely, as by threads, but often by ropes. According to your attitudes so are you connected to these life influences. Other influences of a different order are sown into life by the conscious circle of humanity, and they have to do with psychotransformism, that is, with the possible transformation of men through inner development. They are not created by life. These influences in themselves are called C influences, but they become changed by life into B influences. This is because to understand C influences directly we should have to understand the language of higher centers, which think in terms of yes and no we think in terms of yes or no that is, we think formatorily. Formatory thinking has no third door connecting force as have higher centers. Third force relates the two opposing forces, Formatory thinking is like asking whether in riding a bicycle you should turn the front wheel to the right or to the left and insisting on having a definite answer. Now this work primarily comes from sea influences and it can open up higher centers. Our connection with the work depends on our attitude to it and to the idea of greater mind or conscious man. Attitudes can be negative or positive. If you have a negative attitude towards the work, you will not be able to take it and this may happen if a man has no magnetic center, because magnetic center is actually defined as the power of distinguishing between A and B influences. For example, one should be able to distinguish between the influences contained in the financial times and the influences contained in the Gospels. One should be able to see that they are about quite different things. A man seeking to enter this work should study over a considerable period through self-observation what his attitudes are towards it. It is an interesting and necessary part of self-study. Some of his attitudes will be negative and some will be positive. As his study of the work increases through its application to his own being and the seeing and acknowledging the truth of it, his attitudes will then become more positive and less negative. Truth changes him. If, however, he does not study the work in relationship to his being through self-observation and sees no truth in it, his attitudes will not be altered. He will remain the same. Since we are not directly conscious of our attitudes, we must try to discover them by some method, as by noticing the effects they produce. The trouble is that we are at home with our attitudes, but the work will inevitably make or with many of them if we let it and if you do not wish to change and see no reason for it, the great thing will be not to let the work in so that you can continue to remain as you are. I give you this as a profound secret. I must repeat again that people do not know they have attitudes. They just dislike these people 
and like those people, dislike these interests, and like other interests, and so on, without realizing that this is all due to attitudes in them. Very naive people tell you that they have no attitudes, and really believe that they imagine they have open minds. Now by way of commentary I want to speak about how wrong attitudes injure ourselves. We cannot have wrong attitudes, without in some way harming ourselves. As I said, a wrong attitude gives one a wrong relationship to a thing. For example, a wrong attitude towards other people gives us a wrong relationship to ourselves. I will try to explain by taking the attitudes we have towards the opposite sex. There is a woman in a man, and there is a man in a woman. As long as we are one-sided and so unbalanced that is, as long as we are no point one, two, or three people, there is disharmony in the man with the woman in him, or in the woman with the man in her. That is to say, the woman within the man punishes the man, and the man within the woman punishes the woman. In each case, they are at variance with themselves. When the man brings the woman in him into consciousness, or the woman brings the man in her into consciousness, then this inner variant ceases. It is long work, but from it comes peace and acceptance of the sexes. I am, of course, speaking psychologically here. This is what Christ apparently meant when he was asked when his kingdom should come, and answered, when the two shall be one, and that which is without has that which is within, and the male with the female neither male nor female. The saying of Christ is reported in the second epistle of Clement. We can notice here that in the case of a man, that which is without is the man, and that which is within is the woman and vice versa. Now if a man has a bad attitude to woman, then he has a bad attitude to the woman in himself. If a woman has a bad attitude to man, then she has a bad attitude to the man in herself. It is exactly the same with everything. You can have a bad attitude to life, to the world, and to the universe itself, but you are in all these things, and these tilings are in you. In the same way, if you hate your fellow beings you are also hating something in yourself, and some part of you, and in fact a very important part of you, will be dwarfed and crippled. The more one reflects on attitudes, the more one realizes how important they are, and how dangerous wrong attitudes can be. When attitude is right, the fullest connection is made. If we had objective consciousness we should see things as they really are. If we saw things as they really are we would have right attitude to everything. This is far from us at present. If a man became conscious in the woman in him, he would then see things both from the woman's point of view and the man's point of view. This would obviously make him less subjective. But although we do not possess anything like objective consciousness at present, and see everything through our own prejudices or illusions, such a man would certainly have no illusions about women, knowing the woman in himself, and the same would apply to the woman, who knew the man in herself. Meanwhile we can at least work on wrong attitudes, especially wrong attitudes to the work itself and as far as possible on wrong attitudes, to one another in the work. For the latter we require to study the meaning of external considering which must never be neglected in favor of having one's own way. A wrong attitude gives a wrong relation. So a wrong attitude to the work will give a wrong relation to it. Let us take an example. Suppose we hear that the object of the work is to clean and purify lower centers for the reception of higher centers. Suppose also we are taught that higher centers exist in us, fully developed, and always working but we cannot hear them because of the clamor of eyes, of negative states, of internal considering, of identifying, of self-justifying, of fantasy, of vanity, of pride, and all the rest, as well as the silent obstruction of buffers. Let it be supposed that I hear all this thought, but that I cannot for a moment accept the idea that the higher centers are in me already. I believe that I have to search and find something outside me I will then have a wrong attitude to the work. Owing to this wrong attitude, I will never properly grasp what the work is teaching. I will be looking out not in the idea of a conscious circle of humanity being in me will seem extraordinary. When it is said, as it was in the recent paper on faith, that the inner divisions of centers can communicate with the higher centers within us, and the outer divisions can only communicate with the world of the senses outside us, then I will not believe a word of what is said, and shall go on looking for a stone god of some kind outside me I fancy many, owing to this particular wrong attitude, stick in the work. Not accepting higher centers in them, they still worship an external god, in tradition, in social customs and opinion in convention, even in certain people. They then have a wrong attitude to the work. 
Unless there is a change of attitude they will get stuck and remain so beyond a limited point, the work will be unable to grow in them. If the work cannot grow in them, it cannot connect them with higher centers. It helps to compare attitude with bodily posture. Right attitude is like right posture. You cannot pass an arrow load or in a wrong posture with head erect. You will stick. It is the same with wrong attitude. Amwell 4.10.52 Understanding the work to know this work does not mean to understand the work. There is all the difference in the world between knowing and understanding. After Tertium Organum was published, G said to O, If you understood all you have written in your book, I would take off my hat to you. At first sight it seems extraordinary that knowing and understanding are not the same thing. People say of someone with a reputation for learning that he knows a lot. They do not think it necessary to add that he understands a lot also. They think that the one implies the other. Yet it might be perfectly correct to say that he knows a lot and understands nothing. Also it might be correct to say of someone that he knows very little but understands a great deal. If you reflect on this latter example, you will see that he thoroughly understands what little he knows. In life the confusing of knowing and understanding and the mistakes that arise from it does not concern us here. But in the work we have to try more and more to grasp the essential difference between knowing and understanding otherwise a barrier may arise that will bring us to a halt. To know the work is one thing, to understand the work is altogether a different thing. Knowing the work involves a part of a single center. Understanding the work involves the whole man. By the whole man I mean the whole psychological man, the man of thought, the man of emotion and will, and the man of action. All the centers in man have eventually to participate, if anyone aims at a deep understanding of the work. A small part of a single center will not be nearly enough. How can anyone expect to understand a gigantic thing, like the work, with its immense background in time, with a little part of a little used, and possibly badly furnished center? It is like expecting to become a great musician, by learning a few notes on the piano, and not all the notes, mind you, but a few in the middle. Such is our conceit, which must make the gods laugh or weep. For, as G. said, we are like monkeys in the sight of conscious man. And I fancy it does not take long self-observation provided it is sincere, uncritical, and without self-justifying to catch startling glimpses of what he meant. Now a man or woman must know the work before they can begin to understand it. Knowledge comes before understanding in the day by day horizontal passage of time, but in the eternal, vertical scale of values understanding is far higher and so far greater than knowledge. The work says that there is no greater force we can create in ourselves than understanding. It also says that anyone in contact with the work must continually seek to increase his understanding of it. It is the parable of the talents over again. For otherwise the work gets cold and begins to die. I will remind you that the work judges your own work because the work is hidden in you. It is in you in the form of buried conscience. If it were not, no man would work. You are not aware of buried conscience. But it is quite aware of the sincerity or otherwise of all your work efforts and your thoughts and emotions about it. Sincere work begins to bring buried conscience into your consciousness, little by little, as you can bear it. Insincere work buries it more than ever. Now if your knowledge of the work, such as it is, remains only laid up in your memory, like the unused talent, you will never understand it. Indeed, you will never really know what on earth it is all about. You will hear again and again phrases such as self-remembering, internal considering, identifying, self-observation, and be really quite bewildered by the whole thing. It will become so much jargon to you. This is because you do not yet understand any single thing in the work. You have not thought for yourself about it, so you do not understand why it exists, or what it is for, or what it means, or how it can possibly apply to yourself. Meetings will be a strain. You will be glad to escape into the pure air of God's simple world, and have a chat about why the Valentine Osbournes no longer speak in their cramped corner of this colossal universe. Well, in that case, it may be the best thing to do. But let us speak seriously once more. What has to be realized is that no one can do this work without understanding something about it. What is the good of doing anything without understanding? If you try to work without any understanding of the work you can get no result. 
Only when the work becomes emotional can you begin to understand it. The knowledge of it in the intellectual center, and the dawning emotional need for it, and the increasing valuation of it in the emotional center, together with the growing perception of its truth, unite to give the beginning of the understanding of it. The work is then no longer a matter of mere memory, or of words. It is no longer merely knowledge. It becomes a living experience affecting the being of a man, and entering into his will. Thus knowledge and being unite to form understanding. Suppose you attempt to work from memory of what you know of the work, and without any understanding of it. It is quite possible that you could say to me after a time, I observe myself three times a day after meals for one minute. I remember myself before breakfast and after dinner for two minutes, if I remember to. I read the commentaries two pages a day before going to bed. But I do not seem to get any result. I have not had any higher emotional experiences. No, you would not. You will see at once, surely that such a person is not working from any understanding of the work, but by a sort of rule of thumb. Nothing of the emotional center participates. It is just cut and dried stuff, like a daily dozen, of bending and stretching, prescribed by the doctor. Efforts of this kind are useless. Indeed, every effort you make without understanding is useless. Only what you do from your understanding counts. If you cannot understand why you should observe yourself, if you cannot understand you are a mass of contradictory eyes, and have no real will, but many wills, and are nothing. If you cannot understand that you pass most of your life asleep in your inner spirit, and do not remember yourself, but mistake yourself for your personality, if you cannot understand that negative emotions are evil and harmful, and destroy your happiness, if you cannot understand that identifying spoils all the enjoyment of real emotions, and that internal considering makes you weak and self-pitying if all this and more than why, in God's name, do you work, and whatever you do, is it work? Amwell, 11.10.52 Conjunction with the work? No conjunction is possible without reciprocal affection. If the work seeks to enter into a man's understanding, it will be unable to do so if there is nothing reciprocal coming from the man. Real conjunction with the work needs affection for it. Affection is that which opens, while non-affection shuts. There is no real conjunction between a man and a woman if there is not reciprocal affection. He must have affection for her, yes, but she must have affection for him, otherwise there is no conjunction. It is only a true conjunction when mutual affection conjoins. Affection on one side without reciprocal affection on the other affects no conjunction and produces a commonplace human situation. Now, if a man or woman seeks conjunction with the work, but has no affection for it, conjunction is impossible. Unless there is conjunction with the work, it cannot begin its alchemical work of transformation of psychological lead into gold. Only according to one's affection for it can it work its gradual changes in a person's being and understanding. A little affection affects little change. Why? because there will be little conjunction on your part. Adequate conjunction is not possible without adequate reciprocal affection from you. According to the extent of the reciprocal affection so will it make conjunction. Now, in relation to the work, no one can tell straight away the quality of his or her affection. That is to say, it is impossible to know whether your affection is good or bad. But though direct knowledge of the quality of one's affection is not possible there is a sign by which you can judge it. If you remain the same kind of person never quite seeing or caring much what this work is about, then the quality of your affection for the work is bad. By this is meant that the quality of your affection is of such a nature that it is impossible for the work to make any adequate conjunction with you. Your affections and the interests, thoughts, and occupations arising from your affections lead in another direction, and the work. It is not the fault of the work that it cannot make adequate conjunction with you and by adequate is meant sufficient for it to enter you and root itself in the soil of your being. If it did, as it grew so would your understanding grow and you would see more and more the inner meanings of the work which are endless. But if it cannot root itself in your being your understanding will not grow. It is your own fault. You do not really value it. Therefore you give it, and I mean here the living work itself, and the spirit of its meanings, little or no genuine affection. It is common to love oneself. This affection is the most vulgar of all emotions. But it is rare to feel affection for the work, and all that the work implies in its teachings. 
such affection does not belong to the mechanical division of the emotional center in which people live, as a rule. It is not a manifestation of the vulgar, common self-love, which can only hate the work once it clearly perceives where it lives. Conjunction with the work is only possible through emotions of a higher order which belong to the non-mechanical division of the emotional center. These make it eventually possible for the master, that is, your rely, to take charge of you. This is the object of the work. The pathway of the work leads interiorly to rely. It leads away from your name in my case from Nicole. The master cannot draw near anyone unless the many coatings of self-love are stripped off. How? By the method of seeing what one is actually like through uncritical, non-justifying observation in place of what you imagine you are like. A man, a woman, must awaken to what they are like. The cause of self-love is that we are asleep. As we awaken self-love diminishes. The imaginary I and the false personality must give up the ghost. But a man will not try even to observe himself seriously if his affection for himself, like thick glue, adheres far more strongly to him than any attachment he has for the work. The work teaches that there are three lines of work. Now, we are apparently told of three qualities of affection in the Gospels. A man must love God with all his soul and heart and mind, and love his neighbor as himself. There is love of God as the supreme thing, and then love of neighbor, and love of self. I have always thought, and still think, that the second injunction is not easy to understand. I will give the absolutely literal translation of the passages in Matthew XXII.37.39. Thou shalt love Lord the God of thee, in whole the heart of thee, and in whole the soul of thee, and in whole the mind of thee, and thou shalt love the neighbor of thee, as thyself. The last injunction cannot mean that you must love your neighbor in proportion, as you love yourself, for then it would seem to follow that as your love of self diminished, your love for the neighbor would also diminish. The neighbor, however, does not necessarily mean whoever is nearest you in space. Your neighbor is not necessarily the person next door. That would be the sensual meaning. But if we lift the idea of neighbor to its psychological meaning, your neighbor would mean the person who is nearest to you in some altogether different sense. It could mean the person psychologically nearest to you, nearest in understanding or quality of being. Your neighbor could also mean the person with affection similar to your affections. We have seen that reciprocal affections can join. All people having similar affections could then be your neighbors through reciprocal similar affections. Theoretically, the love of God should unite all people. But it obviously does not. Religious sects hate each other. Who can say he loves God? People have different qualities of affection. They love quite different kinds of things. Dissimilar affections do not conjoin. But those with similar affections, who love similar things, form one definite category of people invisibly connected, and capable of conjoining themselves. They are neighbors psychologically. They would love one another more easily. One should find one's neighbor or neighbors, so as to escape solitary confinement, in the lonely and sad prison of self-love which is indeed a cruel lord. The second injunction seems to be usually explained, as if it read thou shalt love thy neighbor. It is the addition of as nigh self which is not quite easy. Paul says, the whole law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as nigh self. But if ye bite, and devour one another, take heed, that ye be not consumed one of another. Gal v.14, 15, But how can the unredeemed self-love stop biting another? I have never noticed it can. Paul leaves out the love of God as the first necessity. After the two injunctions are given in Luke x.29, the lawyer wants his moral duties exactly defined, and precisely labeled. Literally translated, he asks, and who is to me neighboring? The parable of the Good Samaritan follows, in which the priest and the Levite successively pass the man lying on the road wounded by robbers. The third person is a Samaritan who pities him, picks him up, and looks after him at an inn. Christ asks the lawyer, which of them of the three neighboring seems to be. The lawyer replies, he having shown the pity towards him, not using the hated word Samaritan knowing to his extreme attitude to the sect. Christ says briefly, go, and do in like manner. Do what? The parable is taken as meaning chiefly that one must be kind to those in distress. But it seems to mean more, it refers to the necessity of working on wrong attitudes. Why otherwise bring in a Samaritan so hateful to a Jew? 
The parable implies that freeing oneself from fixed prejudice and strong attitude is needed before the stage of development called love of neighbor can be possible. And this means discarding a considerable amount of encrusted self-love. Christ advises the lawyer to go and do justice. The love of self, if it is primary, not only destroys mutual affection, but would, if it had its own way, destroy human society. It wants all power. It does not and cannot love the neighbor, though it apes this role, and many others both bias and sentimental. It cannot form a conjunction with the work. It loves nothing higher than itself and the work is much higher than it. Relay is higher, and behind relay is God. It is generally agreed that one cannot love one's neighbor save by means of a love higher than self-love, and that is why the love of God is put at the head of everything, in the primary position. But this love belongs to the inmost division of the three divisions of the emotional center, and so needs no external idol to worship. It knows God is within the man. Inmost is the same as highest. The self-love can never open this inmost mind. It keeps a man skating uneasily about on the surface of his being. By itself, putting the matter as simply as possible, self-love is hell. Hell is inverted order where things are upside down like the reflection of a tree in water. To put one's self-love in the highest place is to put this commonplace, vulgar, stupid and silly love, where quite other quality of love should be. In my case it would mean putting Nicole, and all he imagines himself to be, first. How, then, could I have affection for the work? How could the work make conjunction with me if nothing reciprocal comes from me? Self-love will not be of any use, for self-love is love of self, and not love of the work. It may be attracted at first through some form of conceit or vanity. But the work will not accept that quality of love for long. It will not root itself in the soil of your being so that its growth is at the same time your own development. Shut up in the love of yourself you will remain little changed. And your understanding of the work will be obscure because the work needs reciprocal affection of a fine quality to conjoin itself to and feed your understanding. Amwell, 18.10.52 Consciousness and love. In the last paper reciprocal affection was spoken of as being necessary for conjunction with the work. If a person has no affection for the work there can be no conjunction with it. If there is no conjunction with it there is no understanding of it. In short, affection for it opens the way to the eventual understanding of the work. Indifference or dislike closes the way to understanding it. If a man values many other things far more than any value he puts on the work in his inner self apart from what he pretends with his outer self it will be unable to make a conjunction with him. He will not resemble that merchant seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it met. XII.46 Notice he had to sell first before he could buy. He sold what was valueless in comparison with the pearl. The merchant is yourself in relation to the work. To shell means, psychologically, to get rid of former interests you have valued by drawing energy out of them through not identifying. The released energies can then go to the pearl which for us is the work and the attaining of consciousness. All this will take very many years. It is a mysterious process, like a seed that grows no man knows how, and it leads to a gradual transvaluation of one's previous valuations. To buy means to appropriate a thing, to make a thing one's very own psychologically. Psychic energy is like money. With little free psychic energy one can buy a little new understanding. Now to want a thing is to value it, realizing one has not got it. Not to want it is not to value it. This is either because you imagine you have got it already, or because you do not care. To want a thing with all one's mind, soul, heart, and strength is to value it supremely and want it with all centers. It is to love it, to feel the most powerful affection and emotion for it, before all other things. But the work says that we cannot love, like this. We are not one but many. Our being is characterized by multiplicity. We have many different eyes, pointing in all directions. One, I wants something, another, I does not. One, I likes, another, I dislikes. One, I has affection, another is indifferent. When a person is in the work all this confused strife of eyes goes on year by year, under the fitful light of self-observation, and within hearing of the work. This is the period when the deputy steward is being formed. 
All those eyes that eventually decide that their lives are silly and that they value the work more than their former pursuits group themselves around observing eye and begin to point more or less in one direction. They form a transmitting medium for influences coming down from above from the steward who is in touch with real eye, but at first this transmitting medium is an imperfect one. Some eyes ought not to be there, and some important ones are still missing. But the man, the woman, feeling only the general mass effect of the deputies to her can then say they value the work and have reciprocal affection for it. They will not say they love it. They might, however, say they are very often conscious of it. The reason is that the work is now in them, and not on the blackboard. The question arises, is love in its true sense consciousness? This brings us again to the injunction thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself Matt. XXII.39, the meaning of which was discussed a little last week. I said then that I had always found it uneasy to understand. Apart from the meaning of neighbor which is difficult enough, what does as thyself mean? Which self? From letters I gather that some find no difficulty in this passage and do not regard it as needing any explanation. One says it means simply that one must love one's neighbor, and anybody knows what that means. Very good. But even so, why add as thyself? Mechanically we are built on self-love which painfully has to be separated from us layer by layer as we awaken to our real condition. Most of what we call love is a veiled extension of the self-love. The only relevant commentaries I can find are those of the early church fathers, who chiefly dwell on the illustrative parable of the Good Samaritan, given in Luke X.29-37 that follows the injunction. They take this as signifying Christ who came from above to be neighbor to those in this world who are spiritually wounded almost to spiritual death. The symbolism is interesting. He gave them oil and wine and paid for them at the inn. Certainly anyone having understanding of this work might be able to help those who are today similarly wounded by this age of materialism. They would then clearly be neighbors, psychologically speaking. Now the work speaks of three kinds of love. There is physical love, emotional love, and conscious love. It says that emotional love easily turns into its opposite. It is love-hate. For this kind, the Greek word F.A. seems to be used in the Gospels. It is a torturing jealous love, and not love at all. For conscious love the word ape seems to be used. It is never used of sexual love. Christ asks Peter which kind of love he has for him. Peter only understands emotional love, John XXI.15-17. This is the word used in the passage under discussion. Suppose we substitute consciousness for love. It would then read, Thou shalt be conscious of thy neighbor as thyself. This could mean thou shalt be conscious of thy neighbor, as thou art conscious of thyself. To me, at least, this rendering would be considerably more understandable in the light of what the work teaches about the need for increasing our consciousness. We are not nearly conscious of ourselves. We behold the mote in another's eye, but do not see the beam in our own eye. We do not put ourselves consciously in the position of another person. We do not do unto others, as we would have them do unto us owing to a general lack of consciousness. Human relations in the world are what they are. As you become more and more conscious of what you are really like, you become less and less critical of what the other person is like. Arrogance, superiority, and intolerance fade because they are seen by you to be ridiculous. The object of this work is to increase consciousness in every direction. Observing, in quiet, the same fault in yourself, as you have heatedly, or but early pointed out in another seems to me to be practical love. For by the work method of finding the same thing in yourself, you eventually see your neighbor as yourself, and yourself as your neighbor. But you must know yourself to begin with. You must begin to be conscious of yourself. This is the most necessary part of conscious love, which is not blind. Amwell 25.10.52 the work, and the love of self. It was said in the previous paper that the external part of the emotional center is the seat of self-love. Why it is so necessary to speak often about the love of self is that as long as this love completely dominates us it cuts us off from the middle and interior parts of the emotional center which the work seeks to awaken. When the work says that its object is to awaken the emotional center eventually, this is what is meant. When the emotion of self-love dominates a person, the emotional center is asleep. It cannot awaken. 
what has to be understood and re-understood is that the external side of a person is dominated by self-love. The psychological side of this self-love is in the external division of the emotional center. As long as a person is dominated and therefore guided by the love of self, he cannot be guided by anything else. That is the first point. The second point is that as long as anyone is dominated by his or her love of self, no development of the inner divisions of the emotional center is possible in that person. It is not merely that the love of self cannot connect a person to the internal side of himself or herself. It is more than that. The love of self actually disjoins the external side of a person from the internal side, that is, from the side of a person which the work seeks to awaken and develop. The work does not seek to develop a love of self. On the contrary, it seeks to diminish it. It seeks to draw energy out of the self-love so that the freed energy can find a new direction. The action of the work on a person is not to make him or her more proud and conceited or selfish or self-centered or negative. It is designed to have the reverse effect, provided the man does it. It is designed to make people feel more and more in proportion to their powers of endurance and in different ways and after different periods of time a process of depersonalization so that they no longer have the same feeling of who or what they are this gradual withdrawal of energy from the customary narrow easily resentful and brittle feeling of I is accompanied by a gradual new and broader feeling of I as if one were living in a large place this gradual new and broader feeling of I is not centered in the love of self it is not situated in the external division of the emotional center. It is internal to the external division. It can hear, feel, value, and understand the work. In short, it can do what the self-love cannot. This new feeling of I is highly desirable. It is like being introduced to a new civilization, to another form of life. But for a long time the old feeling of I reasserts itself temporarily and seeks to resume its dominion. This is where it is possible to speak of temptation, in the esoteric meaning of temptation. If one ceases to keep the work or man viable in oneself, if one lets it get cold too long, punishment comes. It takes the form of a cessation of meaning, of a deadness inside. One is back in life. One starts complaining again, feeling old grievances, making accounts against others, and, in short, singing one's song. This is easy. It is mechanical. It is not work. Of course, there is no one who is punishing you. We punish ourselves by casting ourselves down to a lower level because we allow ourselves to fall asleep. The remedy is to begin to work again seriously. For this, you must sacrifice your suffering. Of course, it is easier to sleep and suffer uselessly and feed the moon. Are you aware that a single sentence uttered by a negative eye and consented to in your inner talking can let in a rush of negative eyes? Just a sentence such as, it's all very well her saying that. Down goes the lift back to your basement, and every devil of the night emerges ready to eat your force, as it did formerly. Now the self-love can imitate affection for others. One cannot, however, help another through imitation affections. They are not cognitive, that is, they give you no knowledge, no insight. Cognitive emotions, that is, emotions which give you knowledge both of yourself and of others belong to the middle and inner divisions of the emotional center, and not to the external division. A man or woman powerfully affected by the love of self will have no love for anything so abstract as knowledge. Why should they? They regard themselves as everything. The self-love always regards itself. It cannot look up. Underlying the love of self there is, inevitably, hatred. This is why mechanical emotional love turns into its opposite when it is affronted. What the self-love really wants in its heart of hearts is to have its own way, and dominate everyone else, and make everyone a slave the whole world even, as history shows. However, it takes many forms. One ought to observe some of the forms it takes for oneself, I mean, in oneself. If you do not have too many false attitudes about yourself and too many buffers, you can occasionally notice a tat work in you, and catch a glimpse of some of its ways of concealing itself, and pretending to be something quite different. Notice, if you can, how everything you do for merit is self-love. Very much of what people call love such as love for their friends is an extension of self-love. If you are nice to those who are nice to you, do not think that the self-love has nothing to do with it. Wait till the other person is not at all nice to you, and then observe your self-love blowing up for a storm. 
the life of self-love is death. People immerse stuff to the neck and it are really dead. They are only external. There is nothing internal. The most dangerous and unhappy form of self-love is to love power for its own sake social, professional, political, local or domestic. The love of ruling seems extraordinarily destructive of any justice or peace of mind, and certainly ruins the work. A mother who loves to rule can harm her children very much, especially her sons. The love pattern is wrong. Also this evil attribute can lay down early bitterness or sadness in the children. I have seen many such examples. When the love of ruling at all costs for its own sake comes first, that person is really a devil inwardly, whatever the outward appearance. You can feel it by experiencing a cessation of everything in you, a drying up of all thought and feeling. Such people may seek to appear as if charming. They worship themselves. A man imprisoned in his self-love regards himself in everything. He is surrounded by himself. His mind is placarded with his own image. Even if he lifts his thoughts to heaven, he sees himself there, and thinks of himself and of how he should comport himself, and what conventional remark he should make such as jolly nice place up here. For how can the self-love raise itself above itself? It would cease to be self-love. How could it cease to care what happened to it? How could it cease always internally considering? You might think self-knowledge for which one lifetime is not enough naturally springs from self-love. If a man is interested only in himself and his own, and always regards himself, will he not necessarily know himself? On the contrary, he will be blind to the kind of person he is. Self-love is not cognitive. It lays down no memory for next time. It makes darkness, not light, within. The man will therefore hate self-observation which is to let a ray of light within. The first commandment of the Decalogue says, Thou shalt not worship other gods. To the sensual, literal mind this means one must not bow down to idols. The psychological meaning is that you must not worship yourself. You can cease to do this only by observing little by little what you are really like. A man who loves himself before all things, adores himself. He, or she, makes himself a god to himself. Now what you love most is your god. Think for a moment. What do you love most? What is your god?